Hey guys, welcome to part 7 of what if Naruto became a one man team, if you enjoy the video then like, share and subscribe and also comment your thoughts as it inspires me to make more such videos and remember to check out my playlist section for other interesting stories. So let's get started. Chapter 20. Sasuke's Fate. Arg. This is hopeless. Sasuke threw yet another scroll to the corner of the room. The growing pile there was only slightly disturbed as the new addition flew in. Why did the Dobie seal up every one of these things with a blood seal? It's like he's trying to keep everything he knows from me, even when he's nearly dead. How did he even survive that stab? Damn it this pisses me off. At least I have my sword now. A rare grin spread across his face as he unsheathed the blade and held it in front of his face. The blade had impressed one of the seven swordsmen so it had to be powerful. Just how powerful he didn't know. Dot yet. Don't worry. Once you tell me your secrets I will get vengeance on the Dobi, then you will help me with my main objective and I will bathe you in my brother's blood. Well I find that a little hard to believe. Sasuke's head shot around as the current avatar of his hatred walked into the room. Nar you too. Rage filled him as he stood up and brandished his new sword in front of him. How dare you come here. I will have you arrested for breaking into the Uchiha compound and defiling its grounds with your presence. Ouch. Don't you think that's a bit harsh? The blonde said as he casually stepped into the room. And it's no more offensive for me to be here than it was for you to steal from me. Add on to that the fact that you stabbed me and I'd say I have every right to be here. P.S.H. You didn't deserve what was given to you, so I took it upon myself as the last remaining member of the military police to ensure balance was restored in Konoha by eliminating the one that would dare to challenge our ways. Sasuke Chan, you are no closer to being one of the military police than I am to being Hokage, so don't think for one second that you have any authority over me. Now about my scrolls and my sword. Naruto took another step forward and Sasuke responded by moving between him and his scrolls while activating his Sharingan and readying the black-bladed katana. You mean my scrolls and my sword. I saved them from your wretched embrace and now all I need is a little of your blood to claim them completely. All I need is for you to walk onto my blade like the stupid lemming you are and we can end this. His hand shook in excitement for the possibility of finally getting something useful from the dobi, but he was forced to stunt those thoughts quickly as he found himself blocking a blood red blade, completely by reflex. H how did he do that? My Sharingan could hardly keep up. Gritting his teeth Sasuke pushed the blonde back and tried to focus more. Meanwhile Naruto was considering his options. If I try to do a jutsu he might figure out the sword's ability and put me on the receiving end, but with his Sharingan he has an advantage of reaction time. At the same time he can still do jutsu on me, but he would have to sheath his sword and risks burning down this house. It was almost a stalemate and he was having trouble thinking of how to turn the fight in his favor. He didn't let such emotions show however. That would have built up the Uchiha's confidence. Not bad Sasuke, but you're definitely no sword master. I'm interested in seeing how long you can keep it up though. Especially against multiple opponents. Feel free to draw all the blood you want as well. It won't do you any good on those seals. A few clones popped up around him as he charged in again. Dodging, blocking, strafing and rolling were all a part of Sasuke's newfound ambition to make it through the fight as he tried desperately to find an opening in any of his attackers' defenses. You can't beat an Uchiha Dobi. And now that I have my Sharingan you have no hope of beating me. Lashing out clumsily he managed to dispel a couple of clones taking the countdown to two on one. They slowly circled him as he tried to keep both in his sight. It was a difficult feat considering they kept trying to get on opposite sides, but every time they moved he moved. Soon he had to make his way outside as the room and house proved to be too small for him to maneuver without risk of being backed into a corner. Well Tem. I hope you like the feel of a blade in your hand and what little freedom you had for the exams, cause I'm going to take you right back to a cell and throw you in it myself if I have to. PFT, now that the council is back out you can't touch me, and with the old man down for the count you also have no one to save you. It's going to be you in that cell for daring to even think of approaching me like this. Then I'll toss the geezer in beside you and lead this village the way he was too incompetent to do. 
The Avenger spat at Naruto's feet and readied his sword again as he watched the blonde bristle at the insulting way he spoke about Sarutobi. Tem. I'll let you toss around my name as much as you want, but if you think I'm going to stand here and let you insult those precious to me. Precious. Oh you mean your little whores. Don't worry they'll be well taken care of, as future baby makers for the Uchiha resurrection. I'll make sure they pump out more than enough brats to fill this place up, and maybe I'll even let you watch me do it. Quote dot 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 quote. What's the matter? Nothing to say Dobie. Finally realizing your pathetic place in the world. Well it's too late now. Die. Sasuke shot forward intent on ending the fight while Naruto was distracted, but to his surprise his wrist was caught as Naruto stepped into the swing, taking the hit before the slice. The black blade was now digging into his collarbone, but he didn't relinquish his grasp as he looked up into Sasuke's Sharingan eyes with his own red, slitted gaze. In a deeper voice than normal he growled out at his opponent. You went too far Uchiha Tem. If you think that I will forgive such an insult then you are sadly mistaken. Those girls are with me out of love and caring, nothing more nothing less and you will respect them as such or you will be punished. He emphasized the last word through gritted teeth only a few inches from Sasuke's face. Bring your punishment Dobi, because you are far from winning this fight. I would never yield to someone as weak as yo. Snap. Dot dot. Ow. Sasuke felt the bones in his wrist pop as Naruto twisted it slightly out of place. Fuck you asshole. I will get my revenge and there is nothing yo. Dot dot. Snap. Another twist and another pop. Die. Crunch he was forced to let go of his weapon as his bones started to fracture, and in the blink of an eye he was let go of and the black blade appeared in Naruto's previously empty hand. Seeing as he no longer had a weapon, Sasuke shot backwards to gain some distance as he rubbed his sore wrist. Working it over a few times he found that he was still able to move it, though it caused him a bit of pain. Fine. You can have the sword, for now. After all what good will a piece of metal do against the might of the Uchiha ninjutsu? Kaden. Gokaku no jutsu. A 15-foot wide fireball launched at Naruto as Sasuke channeled his chakra to maintain it. Naruto however didn't even budge save to alter his stance. From the depths of the pools of hell, rise once more and split the heavens. Hanasu. With one swift motion the red blade shot through the fireball and a valley formed between the two halves. As each half passed he spun on his heel and knocked them away with the black blade, causing them to rebound to the sides and explode in the distance. The Uchiha was furious. How? How can he be so strong? No he's not strong. It's just those swords. I will beat him and take them from him. Flying through more hand seals he called out his next attack. Kaden. Hosenka no Jutsu. Two dozen balls of fire shot out of his mouth and sped towards their target. He watched in horrified fascination as each one was split and tossed in a random direction. It was only then that he realized his mistake. He spun in a slow circle and looked on as half the Uchiha compound was beginning to burn from his reckless attacks and the blonde's seemingly impenetrable defense. Why you bastard? Look what you've done. My home. My home. I'll kill you. In a flash the black marks of Sasuke's seal spread across his skin as his Sharingan blazed once again and another tome appeared. Lightning began to crackle in the palm of his hand as his chakra condensed to form the attack that he knew would kill the Dobi. Locking onto his target he threw all sense out the window as he rushed to meet his prey. Naruto knew the attack, having seen it twice now, and quickly sheathed his mother's blade and threw his other weapon off to the side barely registering the dull thunk as it buried itself in the wood beam of a nearby building. If you think that your fire jutsu was in some way my fault then you can kiss my ass Sasuke. I was only defending myself from you, so don't even try to blame this on me, but since it doesn't seem you're willing to listen to reason then I guess there are other ways to settle this. Holding his hand out they both watched as chakra began to condense and rotate as it formed a glowing blue ball that seemed to hover just above his palm. He didn't try to run or dodge, no, this was a test to see who had the stronger jutsu and they both knew it. At the last second, Sasuke ducked under Naruto's attack, using the Sharingan to his advantage. Chidori. His target had only a fraction of a second to react, but still managed to dodge slightly and avoid a fatal blow. Still the attack tore open the blonde's side and sent numerous jolts of electric current through his body. 
Sasuke never stopped until he was ten feet behind the now falling boy. Naruto gripped his side in pain and gritted his teeth to muffle the scream that would betray him. Instead he opted to turn his head towards the one that wounded him. His Rasengan dissipated soon after he was hit, but that left him far from defenseless, and he wasn't about to be caught by surprise again. That was low, T Tem. Wincing he slowly got back up, readying another ball of swirling chakra. Not that I would expect anything noble from someone like you, but don't count me out yet. You've still got a long way to go if you want to match me. A smile crept across his face as he watched the Uchiha face him. Sasuke turned again to the bane of his existence. Once more the sound of chirping birds filled the burning compound as he charged forward, blinded by his own rage. In seconds he was within range for a perfect thrust and he laughed manically as he waited for the sweet sound of flesh tearing apart. A sound he would hear, but from the wrong place. Taking full advantage of Sasuke's blind rage, Naruto waited until the last second and shot his hand out, catching the Avenger's wrist as the jutsu it held stopped inches from doing any damage. Without giving his opponent time to react, he twisted the wrist breaking the already fractured bones, and lifted the arm up. The opening he created was soon filled as he grabbed his ninjutsu with his free hand and sliced the tendons on Sasuke's trapped arm and the leg on the same side. With his support on one side gone, the boy had no choice but to topple over on his side and scream out in pain. How dare you! You come into my house, assault me! Uhng! Dot and raise my property! I'll see that you never see daylight again! Dot un! Dot you asshole! His threats were rather insubstantial considering he was beginning to cry out from the pain. Add to that the fact that his body was instinctively moving away from the current greatest threat to his life and the scene was all around, pathetic. He was frantically looking around and dragging himself across the street creating a somewhat familiar scene. Naruto calmly walked over to the Uchiha, and with as much ceremony as he had been shown, wrestled the sheath for his other katana free from its bindings. Next time you even think about stealing from me Tem, you'd better have half of Konoha between me and you before I find out about it. At least then you'll have a little time to pray before I find you and make sure you can never touch anyone's possessions ever again. He looked out towards the village over the compound wall and grinned. But then maybe it will never even come to that. Four soft thuds and a group of louder ones announced the arrival of a response team and some of the people he was more than happy to see right now. Shouts of, Naruto-kun. Followed the ninja's arrival as Naruto was bowled to the ground before he could even greet the girls. They nearly smothered him with tearful hugs before finally relenting and allowing him to sit up. This of course brought about shocked gasps from not only them, but some of the response team as they saw the burn marks and blood on his side. With his clothes destroyed in that area his wound was clearly visible to all of them, and it didn't look pretty. Naruto-kun you're hurt. Hanada nearly bawled out as she rushed through her pack to get some ointments. Haku followed her lead as well and they soon had him mostly cleaned and bandaged up before helping him to his feet. I'm fine now, thanks to the both of you. He smiled and kissed each of their foreheads before turning to the other ninja. He knew he would still need to go to the hospital, they may be practicing their medicines and medical techniques, but that didn't make them doctors. The captain of the Anbu unit was already yelling orders. Get these fires out before they spread to the village. Don't worry about damage from your jutsu just make sure they won't flare up again. The squad saluted and quickly got to work on the nearby buildings, showing no qualms with washing whole structures away with their water jutsu to get the job done. Hey. S stop destroying my property. The two most imposing figures of the new arrivals turned to the Uchiha, causing him to shrink back slightly from their glares. Why you are trespassing on you Uchiha grounds? Leave now or I'll be forced to take action. One of the two men formed a rather evil grin at the threat, his black trench coat flailing in the breeze caused by the raging fires as he and his blonde-haired companion walked towards the prone boy. Inoichi was the first to speak as Ibiki grabbed the boy roughly and yanked him up, causing a yelp of pain to escape his captive's throat as his injured appendages were jarred. Uchiha Sasuke. You are under arrest for falsifying a mission report, theft of a Konoha citizen's property, two accounts of attempted murder and willful acceptance of known stolen goods. You will be held in the Anbu prison until the time of your trial and will be privy to all of the pleasures that go along with it. 
You can't do that to me. You have no proof of such allegations. Sasuke yelled as he tried to glare at them through his pain. Actually, Ibiki started. We have witnesses. Naruto-san I'm sure would be more than willing to testify against you. With an eager nod from the blonde he continued. Then there's what Inoichi-san saw in the memories of one Haruno Sakura, whom has already been apprehended. If we need more proof than that to put you away, I'll go to Suna myself and drag their three genin brats back here to testify. You're out of luck Uchiha, so just make it easy on yourself and come quietly. Sasuke grit his teeth and spat in the man's face, earning a none too gentle fist to the stomach. Glaring once more at the boy, Ibiki tossed him blindly over his shoulder into the waiting arms of two more Anbu. Take him to his new palace, and make sure he's comfortable. The Anbu shun shinned away leaving the group of genin to face off against two of the three top interrogators of the village and a handful of Anbu that were reigning in the few remaining fires. You know, Uzumaki-san, that would have been easier if you'd have taken some people with you from the start. Naruto scratched the back of his head and smiled up at the man innocently. Yeah, but then I wouldn't have had so much fun. He looked around at the rubble the fires had left behind looking slightly remorseful at the sight. We definitely made a mess of things here huh? It would have been nice if it never had to come to this, but Sasuke is unstable. He wouldn't have let go of anything that could have given him power, even if he was facing a cage. I had hoped he would have just handed everything back, especially after our differences were proven in the Chunin exams. Naruto sighed. I guess some people are just beyond reason. He limped over to a half-demolished building and pulled his black katana out of the fire-blackened post it had stuck in. After wiping it clean and sheathing it, he sealed both of the long blades into his storage scroll and packed them away just as a few more figures landed. The first was his last bunchen which showed up holding all of his recovered scrolls. The clone had been instructed to gather all of his possessions while he kept the Uchiha occupied then to hide until it was safe to come out and hand over the rescued items. Naruto gladly took them and pocketed them as the next people showed up. Man Gaki, you sure know how to tear a place up. Jiraiya whistled as he took in the scene around him. Kakashi was less thrilled as he saw the home of his deceased friend smoldering in ruin. Naruto, did you really have to go this far? I really didn't mean for all the buildings to catch fire. Sasuke threw fireballs at me and I had to defend. I tried to deflect them away from any buildings that looked important, but there were a lot and I couldn't control them all. If anything important got destroyed I'm really sorry, but if you want to point fingers then the place to aim them would be in the Anbu holding cells. Naruto said as he rubbed his eyes and temples, before stumbling a bit. In an instant he was caught by Haku and Hanada, who had never left his side knowing that with an injury like his along with just getting out of the hospital, he shouldn't have been moving around so much. Naruto-kun you need rest, and we need to get you back to the hospital to get that burn properly checked. Hanada ordered, getting half a nod from Naruto. Hold on girls, I'd like to talk to him first. Jiraiya said as he started over. Four icy glares stopped him in his tracks. Naruto-kun needs to get checked up and rested. You can talk to him tomorrow and no sooner. Haku told him before the group made their way towards the gates of the compound. Naruto looked around at the four girls. Hey where's Tenten at? She had to stay back at the compound. Her dad saw her there from the crowd and held her back. I'm sure she'll catch up with us later. Ino replied. Actually I was just wondering why she was there at all. Well, she is a weapons mistress, and you do have one known powerful sword. Isn't it only natural that she would want to at least talk to you about it? Hanada pointed out what should have been pretty obvious. Ah, well I suppose that's true. I guess that means I'll be seeing her again soon enough. The Sanin looked over at Kakashi. Since when did the Gaki make them so devoted? I don't think Tsunade ever gave me a glare that cold, even after I tried to peek on her in the baths. The masked Jonan just shrugged and started to pull out his book before reconsidering and taking off to help put out some of the fires. Shikaku and Choza were handling things over at Naruto's place along with Anko. They probably had the tougher job since the civilian council was still there when he left, demanding they open the gate to the estate. That of course was impossible since there was only one key and Naruto was back in possession of it. Yes, 
This was proving to be both an exciting and tension-filled day. With any luck Naruto will be out cold for the next year or five so we can have some peace around here. Well at least Sasuke and Sakura are out of the way now. Dot dot. Wait. What am I going to do about a team? Kakashi hung his head, realizing that two of his three students were now locked up, Kiba was in for a world of hurt still from his clan since he still had a week of punishment left and the Hokage was incapacitated. Sighing he turned back to the task at hand by checking to make sure the current building he was working on was sufficiently watered so it wouldn't spark up another fire. He would deal with his team situation later. The civilian council was not happy. The demon brat had killed or injured a large number of Konoha civilians and the ninja side of the council had stood behind him on it. Not only that but one of their number was arrested along with her daughter, and considering who was in the group that shot off after the brat, they were panicking over who else would be meeting the same fate. Aside from that they found that they had no way into the Namikaze property now that the blonde had locked it once more. A few of them had been hoping to get back at the boy for all the trouble he'd been causing them lately, but with him holding the key, and his now infamous traps still in place, there was little else they could do except stand there and gaze in hatred at the blood-streaked yard where the bodies of the victims had been carried out. They still hoped, however, that they could turn this in their favor. Those leftover demanded an immediate council meeting which they would get later, but for now there were just too many important matters to take care of. Thus, they now waited with bated breath to find out exactly what the outcome of this event would be. Once the smoke over the Uchiha district had died down, and the ninja were called back while the clean-up crews were sent in, the council finally convened in their chamber. Tensions were quite obviously high as the civilians tried their best to stare down the ninja. As the last of the council arrived the headache began. Kaharu and Homura stood up and demanded to know what happened at the Uchiha compound. Jiraiya, being a Sanin had an honorary seat in the council as Konoha's lead outside information source, but could only give his input, not actually vote on matters. To put it simply, Naruto got his possessions back and though the items were unharmed, I can't say the same for the Uchiha, or Naruto himself. At some point the two fought and though Naruto disabled Sasuke, he himself was also injured by some sort of jutsu. Sasuke had recklessly used a fire jutsu during the scuffle which started the fires in the district, consuming a handful of buildings before we were able to get things under control. As of now Naruto is in the hospital getting his wound looked at while the Uchiha is in the Anbu prison getting his injuries tended to in his cell. You actually arrested him. Great. Good work. Now there is a good chance he'll leave Konoha, taking the Sharingan with him. Homura spat out. Inoichi had more than enough of these people to last him through the year. Yes he is being detained, just as he should be, and we have no plans of releasing him anytime soon. He is to be guarded until his fate is decided, which we will not do until a proper Hokage is in place. Now I suggest you forget about this matter as we of the ninja council will not budge on this decision. Nods of agreement from his side of the table confirmed the motion, much to the civilian's dismay. Even Hiyashi had agreed as an unstable ninja running around could prove no benefit to any of them. Fine then we motion for a new Hokage to be voted into office immediately. Fumahika shouted. All right. Nominations. I choose Hitaki Kakashi. Sum stated. Nara Shikaku. Choza added. Forget it. I have no desire to become Hokage. The lazy man said. Spoil sport. Fine Morino Ibiki. It seemed time came to a standstill as Choza shifted uncomfortably. What? What about Jiraiya-sama? Homura chimed in. As far as he knew the man was pretty easy to sway, especially with his known, interests. No thanks. I'm flattered, really, but I'm not cut out to be a Hokage. Tsunade would have been a better bet if she were here, but. What an excellent idea Jiraiya-sama. You are going to find her anyway to see about Sandame samas condition, are you not? That would bring her back to the village, it would the perfect time to swear her in. Nods of approval went around the table as people considered the idea. The civilians we considering how to use the legendary medical ninja's known bad habits against her while the ninja half were considering how it would bring another powerful ninja back to the village for defense after the Suna Oto invasion. After giving them a few minutes to think the situation over, Jiraiya motioned them all to give him their attention. 
If there are no objections for Tsunade Haim then we will offer her the position. I'm not going to force it on her though, and if she disagrees then she'll just be coming back to heal Sarutobi Sensei. I hope. I will leave as soon as Naruto is healthy enough to get around. Jiraiya-sama, why take that boy with you? I can think of half a dozen better uses for him. Dinbi grumbled. Aside from the fact that you're still out for his blood. Because I plan on training him while we travel and he's going to help me get Tsunade back. The Sanin said with a dismissive tone. Why take that brat? Uchiha Sam. That traitorous asshole is in jail right where he belongs. Growled Soom. And if he ever gets out I might just kill him myself, consequences be damned. She stared across the table, daring any one of them to challenge her. Even if Sasuke was not in prison, I still wouldn't take him over Naruto. Jiraiya huffed out as he tried to defuse Soom's temper. He has no talent for what I plan to teach and it would only blow up his ego if he thought he was going to get trained by Asani. Naruto on the other hand is humble, well beyond his reputation, and deserves my training for all the shit you people put him through. Now if you'll excuse me, I have a genin to prepare for our trip. We should only be gone a month at most. Some of the council did chibi dances in their heads at this news while for others it brought up concerns. Jiraiya-sama. What about Naruto-san's estate and those living with him? Shibi asked the man. Jiraiya grinned back. Well considering the state of the place, if the girls still want to live there I guess I'll have to teach the gaki how to put a blood seal lock on the gate so they won't need a key. Other than that, I ask that you all look out for them and make sure no harm comes to them. Kami knows what Naruto would do if one of them got hurt. A collective shudder went through the room as even the civilian side feared the images that went through their heads. With nothing left to say to them Jiraiya walked out of the room and headed for the apartment he was staying at. Being as he was hardly ever in the village for very long, he found it rather pointless to buy a house since he wouldn't have time for the upkeep. Instead he just used one of the village funded, donated flats. The following day Naruto was checked out of the hospital. He was still rather sore on his side where Sasuke's Chidori had scraped him. It would seem that whatever chakra went into it, thanks to the Ten no Juin, was somewhat more potent than normal. As such he limped back home with five girls surrounding him, daring anyone to get in their way. Very few were stupid enough to risk their health against the group since word spread of the events from the day before. Some shied away from Naruto, who had killed numerous civilians and severely injured the last Uchiha. Others just watched as he passed, trying to imagine it being him that defeated the Tanuki and not the Uchiha as they had originally been told. It wasn't until they got back to the estate that they met their first real obstacle. Jiraiya stood, leaning against the wall just to the side of the gate to the estate. When he saw the group coming towards him he smiled at them. Naruto. Glad you're finally free. I need to talk to you. He saw the girls huff and pout, but they didn't move to stop him since they had told him he could talk to the boy today. Let's do this inside, I don't really want to have to worry about eavesdroppers. None of them missed the three spots he shifted his eyes to, and with a curt nod from Naruto they made their way inside. So what's this about Aero Senen? The girls laughed at his nickname for the man, but it quickly died down when he gave them a glare. You're never going to stop calling me that are you? Not until you can prove it's not true. Naruto beamed a smile at him. HMPH. Well anyway, I came to tell you that we're going on a mission. It'll be about a month long so pack accordingly. Okay, I'm guessing we'll be traveling a lot. Should we pack for hot or cold? We, yeah, Haku and me. No, this will just be you and me. Jiraiya corrected. Quote dot 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 quote. Quote dot dot dot. But Haku is my teammate. Well I'm sorry but the council will only let me take you along with me, so she'll have to stay here. Don't worry though. The clans will make sure to keep an eye on you friends, so they'll be safe. It might have been a partial lie, but for where they were going and what he planned on teaching the boy, he didn't want an audience around. Quote dot 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 quote. Naruto looked nervously between the girls and his only real sensei to date. They could see that this was one trip he actually wanted to go on, since he would actually be with someone who was willing to teach him. At the same time they could tell he didn't want to leave those he was closer to here, alone. Go on Naruto-kun. 
It's only a month. We'll be fine. Haku tried to reassure him. Yeah Naruto. Beside it's a month with Asani. Most people would kill for that privilege. Tenten spoke from personal experience as she would have done anything just to talk to Tsunade. Naruto Kunai I think you should go too. I think that some time away from here might do you some good. Though she didn't really want him to leave her for that long, Hanada knew it would be selfish to make him stay. Naruto Sama, just think of how much stronger you might get, and how much better you can protect what is most important to you. Kin was probably the most nervous out of all of them since she was probably in the most danger. With the newfound hate for Odogakur and the fact that she had once been one of its ninja, she was already feeling pressure from the general populace. She would never go anywhere in town now without one of the other girls or another trusted escort. Don't worry so much Naruto-kun. Us girls can look out for each other, so go to the mission. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Like the others, Ino didn't want the boy to leave, but she was willing to wait for him if it would make him happy. That was just another part of her that had matured over the past weeks with all that's happened to her. Quote dot 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 quote. Gaki. If it makes you rest easier. I'll show you how to make blood seals to keep your place locked up save for those you want to let in. Jiraiya started bringing out his sealing supplies when. Smack. Everyone looked to see Naruto with his palm on his forehead. I completely forgot about that. Aero Senen. I need you to look over a seal for me. Naruto practically dragged the man back to his office with the curious girls following them. The scene they walked in on was more like a disaster area than the organized office that they were used to seeing. Naruto sighed and created a few clones to start cleaning up. As their audience watched, the clones worked in near mechanical efficiency as they salvaged what they could. Thankfully for Naruto most of the spilled ink landed on empty floor space or unused parchment. Even luckier for him was the fact that the root ninja, who he had his clones move to the backyard while he was taking the civilians out front the day before and were now in the care of Ibiki, had obviously wanted to steal his work. There were a few bags off to the side, away from the mess, that were filled with his notes and pre-made seals. Breathing a sigh of relief he grabbed the bags and took them behind the desk. Taking his time, Naruto emptied the bags one by one and set their contents out on the desk as well as the counter behind him. Anywhere that he ran into some more of the mess, he just pushed it out of the way to make more room knowing the clones would clean up whatever additional mess he made. Jiraiya at this point was already making his way carefully across the room to try and see what the boy was working on. He could tell from a distance that they were seals, but he wanted to know what kind. He'd heard from the Sandame that the boy had talent, but just how much was the question. To his dismay however, the seals would give up none of their secrets. He saw that Naruto had already learned how to mask his abilities with secrecy seals. He could tell just by glance that their real arrays were well hidden and it was unlikely he would get anything from them unless Naruto decided to show him the seals before he masked them. The one thing that did shock him was the number of individual seals he saw. Whether they were actually for different purposes or just had different masks on the same seal he couldn't say. About halfway through the third bag Naruto let out a small cheer, startling everyone present as he broke the silence that had covered the room. Found it. Come here Aero Senen. Naruto shot over to the desk and set out a few pages, an ink bottle, a brush, and a scroll that he was now unrolling in front of him. Had anyone been in this room when its previous owner was present, they would have felt a bit of nostalgia right now. The blonde-haired boy sitting at the desk while the white-haired Sanin looked over his shoulder. The scene was reminiscent of the time when Minato would have Jiraiya over to check out one of his new creations. It wasn't lost on the man, but he hid the pang of sadness he felt with the intrigue he had for the seals that were coming to light in front of him. What is this Naruto? I see everything from chakra draining to cancellation seals, but I'm not sure where you're going with them. Dot dot quote. Jiraiya studied the formulas and theory in front of him as the two men were almost completely oblivious to the outside world. As he went further through the writings of the boy though, his brow would occasionally furrow, then smooth and soon he was grinning like a madman. His though process was broken when Naruto spoke when he almost done with the scroll, the only things left were some minor calculations and notes of the creator, which was just a good practice detail for documentation and filing purposes. 
So, what do you think Aero Senen? Quote dot 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 quote. Quote dot 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 quote. I think you've found your profession Naruto. The Sanin finally replied as a huge grin split his face. You've definitely saved a lot of sore fingers if this works. Oh it works. I've already used it. I just wanted to make sure it was safe for other people to use. It was obvious that he was talking about people without the benefit of having their own personal demon inside. Well, they may be a little sore if they try to open thousands of these in a row, but nothing a good night's sleep shouldn't fix. Think about pricking parts of your body that number of times and then think of how much time a normal person would need to recover. Hell for the same amount they could do with this they'd have to have a tap put in just to keep up. Naruto grinned at finally knowing that one of his seals could be more helpful than one of the more popular seals that was already around. Tell me, Gaki, how did you even think up something like this? Well I got the idea at first when I opened this estate. I figured I might be able to do the same thing, just on a smaller scale. You know, without the barrier since most people wouldn't need to go to that extent. Initially I just used a locking seal on whatever I wanted to keep shut, then another seal that I carried with me to unlock it. Now with this I tried something a little different. With a masking seal I saw that you could layer seals, so I set up the unlocking seal and masked it. Then I set up the locking seal on top of it and masked that too. Both are connected by the chakra absorbing seals and the rest of the array. When the person pushes chakra into the seal the absorption seal redistributes it to the unlocking seal, which is then unmasked. Because the locking seal is on top of the unlocking seal, when the unlocking seal activates it automatically passes over the locking seal and deactivates it. When the flow of chakra stops, everything resets. Naruto explained the seal as best he could, trying to put it into terms everyone present would understand. Jiraiya was perplexed. Not by the complexity of the seal, because all it really was, was a group of fairly basic seals that were all connected. The part that got to him was how so many simple seals arranged in such a way could achieve something so complex, and at the same time he berated himself for not thinking of it before. It was all so simple. Dot too simple. What are the drawbacks? Naruto sighed. This is the part that he thought might kill his project. First. It's kind of like a blood seal in that you have to either have a sample of, or know the properties of someone's chakra. It also has to have that exact matching chakra put into it to activate. So in the case of security it's perfect, since it's extremely difficult for someone to force another person to put their chakra into a seal. Even if you had a Yamanaka possess someone and force their body to push the chakra out, they would still have a little of their residual chakra mixed in. Depending on how specialized the seal is it wouldn't unlock in that case. It's also because of that, that the seal has its flaws. If the person dies then whatever they locked up is pretty much sealed permanently, or at least until someone destroys the container. On the good side though, I can set up another array in it so that multiple people can use the same seal to, say, to use as a house lock for a ninja family. Now Jiraiya knew where he was going with this. You plan on putting this on your own house. Dot and you plan on giving others access to it so only those you can trust can get in. You knew someone would eventually try to steal your key so you started working on this. Naruto nodded at him, confirming his suspicions. Naruto, I won't lie to you. Creating seals like this without training is dangerous. You could have created something so powerful that it would suck your chakra dry and killed you in a heartbeat. Naruto hung his head slightly. But, as far as I can see this seal is perfect. Instantly the room perked up. You got lucky this time, but don't go using seals that you don't have a full understanding of without a fuinjutsu specialist's approval. For this one you have mine, so I'll give you two days to put it up, then we're leaving. Naruto hung his head again at the thought of leaving, but regardless he got to work on the seal. For this one, since it was going to be out in the weather, he brought out some special supplies. A special metal plate made specifically for seals that would be subjected to weather, and two small, palm-sized, semi-domed tiles. Instantly he set to work, once the unlocking seal was in place he called over the girls that lived with him, one by one. Each of them was told to push their chakra into a specific, spiral-shaped seal around the edge of the plate in order for it to recognize them. The only ones that weren't allowed to put their chakra in were Tenton, 
who was completely fine with it since she wasn't planning on living there and had no problems with announcing herself like anyone else would. Kin, who was a little disheartened by the fact but when he explained that he didn't want her going anywhere without an escort because of her origins she reluctantly agreed. Eno, since she didn't actually live there, and Jiraiya, who whined like a baby. Oh come on Gaki, don't you trust me to keep people you don't want in here out. Jiraiya tried his best to make puppy dog eyes as streams of tears flooded his face. Naruto looked at him and replied flatly. I trust that you would use the privilege to peek on the girls when I'm not around. What? I'm not into girls that young brat. Just what do you take me for? I take you for an author of porn and a pervert. Plus, they'll eventually grown up, and I don't need you prowling around my property trying to peek at them when they do. Besides, I don't believe you had access back when your student lived here did you? Reluctantly Jiraiya let it go, but not without mumbling about, damn blonde brats, too smart for their own good. He sighed at the loss of some great potential material for his future books, but there were other matters to take care of. All right, because you're being so selfish, we're leaving tomorrow at noon, so you better work fast or I'm leaving you behind. Sure thing Jiraiya sensei. Naruto grinned mischievously as he walked the main to the gate. After letting the man out, Naruto pulled a stone from the wall beside the portal to the village, showing a neatly cut, square opening to the stunned Sani. Just because I didn't have the seal made yet doesn't mean I wasn't preparing for its use. He slipped the seal into a slot in the hole, causing a small flash as lines inside the hole glowed briefly and connected to the locking mechanism of the gate. That done he slipped the two tiles, which now sported spiral designs on their surfaces, into slots on opposite sides of the block he took out and with a bucket of plaster he sent a clone to prepare on their way to the gate, locked them in place. Using more of the plaster he spread it inside the hole before sliding the block back in place before smoothing the surface on the inside, then moving outside and doing the same there. With the block in place he locked the door with his key before placing his hand on the tile and pushing some chakra into it. They heard an audible click and Naruto pushed the gate open then shut it again. Once it was shut, he tried opening it again, this time without using the seal. Despite his best efforts the gate held. Okay now you girls try it. He instructed. Again, one by one they stepped forward and tested the seal. Hanada and Haku came through easily, but Tenten, Ino and Kin were barred from exiting until Hanada opened the gate for them. Jiraiya also tried getting back in but despite the amount of chakra he tried to overload the array with, he found it to be for naught as the gate didn't budge. He had to admit he was impressed. With the locking seal in place and the various traps set up around the property, Naruto's estate was beginning to push for the title of most secure property in Konoha. It was definitely up there with the Hokage Tower and Anbu headquarters for ease of entry anyway. Well now that you've successfully locked Asanin out of your place, you better start getting ready to go. We're leaving first thing in the morning. Hey, I thought you said noon. Naruto grimaced. Yeah, but I was planning on being nice and giving you time to get that seal put in. Since it's already done we don't need to wait, and trust me we'll need all the time we can get for our mission. Naruto just sniffed at him and went back into his estate followed by the group of females who glared at Jiraiya on their way past. Oh come on, you even persuaded him to go so don't look at me like that. He was slightly annoyed for turning out as the bad guy from all of this, but he guessed they had their reasons. After all with Naruto gone they won't be able to. A perverted giggle escaped his throat as he started to imagine what could have been going on in the house. Of course with no man around and so many curious girls just discovering their bodies. This time his giggle was followed by a stream of blood dripping from his nose as he walked away in a daze. People made a path for him in the streets as they wondered if the man had lost his wits by the way he was giggling and drooling. Despite their yearning for Naruto to stay by their sides, the girls did what they could to help him pack for his trip while he relayed instruction on what he wanted and needed them to do while he was gone. First and foremost of course was that no one, no matter who they claimed to be, was allowed inside the estate except the girls themselves and those that had already been there before. They were also instructed to check for Genjutsu just in case before they let anyone else in. If someone was there they had to have one of the girls with them at all times and would not be allowed in the office, basement or on the second floor. Period. 
Likewise the girls were also not allowed to go snooping around the office or his room, but that was a pure trust issue on his part. That night they had a large dinner with just Naruto and the girls where he explained to those who didn't know, exactly who he was after making them swear not to say a word. There were shocked gasps and widened eyes around the table, but after explaining his reasons for secrecy they agreed to never reveal his heritage until he was ready for it to be known, if that day ever came. That night Tenten and Eno got permission to spend the night there, though it was a bit difficult considering whose house they asked to stay at. Tenten was by far the hardest to get permission for since her father didn't even know anything about Naruto other than the rumors around town. It took nearly an hour and a half to convince him that she would be sleeping in a room with other girls and they were only spending the night since Naruto was leaving on a long mission the next day. After reassuring him a dozen times that she would keep an eye open, she finally got fed up and told him that she was staying over anyway since as a ninja she was considered an adult and could make decisions on her own. Before she stomped off back towards Naruto's estate, they could hear her father yelling after her for a few blocks before the normal noises of the village drowned him out. They spent the night just enjoying each other's company as they played some card games or just sat around and talked as some of them cuddled together. At one point it would have been Jiraiya's fantasy as Haku and Kin took Naruto's sides while he sat on the couch, Hinata sat in his lap while Ino and Tenten laid across their laps with their heads towards the center. They didn't stay in that position long though as they quickly found out that the legs of those sitting were quickly losing circulation. After that Ino and Tenten settled for sitting on the floor and resting their heads on their arms which were propped up on the leg shelf as they all talked about nothing in particular. They talked about their families and their teams. Tenten of course finally got some information on his swords, at least what he was willing to give anyway. He couldn't give her too much since her really wasn't sure what all they could do. He also allowed the girls to ask him what he knew of his own parents, though there was still one bit of information he kept to himself. He didn't think they were ready to know what was inside of him, and to be honest he was a little afraid of what their reactions might be. It was a pleasant night all considered but like all things it eventually came to an end and they were forced to go to bed. Naruto woke up the next morning just as the sky was growing lighter. Silently he crept around his room, gathering the last bits he needed to take with him before dressing and slipping the numerous scrolls into his equally numerous pockets. This would also be one of the few occasions that he would take all of his battle gear with him as he had no way of knowing just what he might run into since the perverted sage didn't give him any mission details. Yeah it could have been overkill, but it was better to be prepared for a flood and get a drizzle than plan for a drizzle and drown in a flood. With his clothing and supplies packed he slipped out of his room and down the stairs. He had two more stops before he left so he went to his office and descended into the, now less than hidden, room. He managed to get a stool that did well enough to hide the seal, but it looked a lot more out of place than the pot had. Once he was inside he quickly pocketed his heritage scrolls and grabbed the two katana that were hanging on the wall then left for his final destination. After the mess with the locking seal installation, Naruto had made a small army of clones once again, to do their best to clean up what they could of the recent events at his house. There were still some bloodstains on the floors, but the important thing was that everything that had been boxed up or moved was placed back in order. There had been a few personal effects that had been broken, like the pot, but nothing that couldn't be replaced. Now he stood amongst the shelves of the basement and gathered the scrolls he felt he could study while his companion did his, research. Once those were safely stashed away he went back up to the second story and softly knocked on Hanada's door before opening it slightly. Hanada and Tenten were sleeping soundly beside each other as he snuck over to their futons. Being as quiet as he could he leaned down and kissed Hanada. I'll see you soon my Hina-chan. It amused him when a small smile played on her lips when he whispered to her. See ya around Tenten-san. He addressed the other sleeping girl before making his way out the door into the next room. After a soft knock and swinging the door open he looked on the new scene with a bit of amusement. On the left side of the set of futons, Haku lay looking as peaceful as possible. That was where normal sleeping habit ended though. Ino was laying crosswise on top of the brunette, face down with her head turned to the side and arms splayed out ahead hugging onto Kin's waist. The former Odo ninja was sprawled out on the second futon with arms and legs spread in different directions. 
She was on her back with one hand sitting on the pillow and the other laying on Eno's head. Her left leg was hanging off the side of the futon and her right was cocked at an angle over towards Haku. He suddenly chalked at the display when he realized that he was once again privy to a display of Kin's natural attire. Walking even more cautiously over to the futons pulled the half-discarded blanket over the trio as best he could before doing his best to kiss them where he was able. Kin's forehead, Eno's cheek and Haku's lips. He stalked once more out of the room, but stopped in his tracks when he found two people blocking his path in the hallway. He tried to stammer out an excuse, but soon found he didn't need to. Hanada stood there trying to contemplate what they were seeing in their still half-asleep days. Hanada was the first one to recognize the blonde top in the early morning twilight. Naruto-kun Yan what are you doing up already? He couldn't tell them that this was exactly what he wanted to avoid. He really didn't want to make a big deal about leaving for a month since it wouldn't be the first time he'd done so. I was just about to leave Hanada-chan. Since Aero Senen wants to leave early, I didn't want to wake you all up. He tried to keep his voice down so as to not wake anyone else up while at the same time trying to motion for Hanada to keep hers down. Hanada got a bit of a contemplating look on her face, which he found a little cute, until she realized what he meant. Oh. Dot um. Oh. A little more awake now with the realization. Naruto-kun you should have woken us. We want to walk you out. She pouted a bit that he would try to leave without letting them know. Shish. Hanada-chan we already said goodbye last night. I'm only going to be gone for a month at most. It's not that big of a deal. He was pleading with Kami that they would let him leave peacefully, but deep down he knew it wasn't to be. Hanada half scowled half pouted at him. It is a big deal because you won't be here for a month. I don't care what you say, you're going to sit here until we are ready and we're going to walk you out. Suddenly grinning, Tenten ran past him and into the next room where he heard her yell, and then a thud as she landed on the futons amongst the other girls. That was followed by squeals and three girls running out into the hall thinking they were being attacked. They latched onto him out of instinct before looking towards their attacker. As their morning haze left them they suddenly realized the state of their dress and with another squeal and dashed back into the room, bed shirts lifting just enough to show that they were all in a similar state of dress, leaving Naruto with a bit of a nosebleed until Hanada hit him in the arm to bring him back to reality. She giggled at his plight before disappearing into her room again, followed by Tenten who got chased out of the other room, to get dressed. Half an hour later they were walking with him towards the gate as the sun just started to peek over the horizon. Naruto-kun did you even have breakfast this morning? Aero Senen said we'd be stopping for breakfast when we hit our first destination. I had an apple this morning though to hold me over. Do you have enough can I? Yes. Did you remember your sleeping roll? Yes. Did you? This isn't my first mission you know. You girls can stop worrying about me. Naruto said, a little annoyed at their fretting. I wonder if this is what it feels like to have a mother. We can't help it. We love you and that what people who love each other do. Eno grinned as she told him right before leaping onto his back and forcing him to carry her. She got a couple friendly glares from the girls who were wondering, why didn't I think of that? Naruto just captured her legs to hold her in place as he addressed them all. If anyone should be worrying, it should be me. After all, you're going to have to deal with the counselors constantly trying to get into the estate. Which reminds me, don't leave home without some sort of weapon, and don't be afraid to use it to scare them off. If they won't leave, get one of the clan heads over to shoo them away. They have no rights to be on that land, but they don't like being told that they can't have something they want, just like the Tem. Also, it might not hurt for you all to get a current law book just so you can study what your rights are. We know, and if they get too persistent we'll just find some other place to stay until you get back. Haku leaned over and kissed him on the cheek to calm him down a little. By the time they got to the gate they found Jiraiya just arriving from the other direction. The sun was now a little over the horizon and it gave Konoha an unearthly orange glow. Setting Eno down he turned to the girls one last time before venturing out. Remember it's only a month, then I'll be back to see you all again. Stay safe. With little ceremony he went down the line, giving a more personal goodbye starting with Hanada. Zenzai for breakfast. 
Haku then Ino. Both of them smell like they've been spending too much time in the gardens. Kin. I didn't think she brought any weapons. Dot why do I hear bells? He stutter stepped when he got to the last person in line. Ah hey. Well I'll see you later Tenton. He waved to the girl then turned around. Only to be forced back the way he came from as Tenton planted her own kiss on him causing some giggling from the other girls who knew it was coming. When Tenton finally let the struggling Naruto go, he was blushing furiously amidst the laughing of the girls and the catcalls of Jiraiya. T. Tenton. Dot Y. The girl just mock pouted at him. But Naruto Kuen. I felt left out. She stuck her lower lip out even more causing the rest of the girls to crack up laughing and the Sanin to develop a crimson mustache. Che. I'll remember that when I get back. Naruto once again turned on his heel and began to walk away but again was forced to stop as Jiraiya tried to get in the same lineup Naruto just went through. Sighing he grabbed the man by the hair and pulled him away as he started to cry and pout. This is exactly why I wasn't willing to give you access to my house Aero Senen. Oh come on Gaki, it's just a kiss. Just one little kiss, from each of them. Shut up, we're leaving. The last thing they saw as they looked back through the gates were five girls waving at them frantically and blowing kisses at Naruto. Hey I'm going to miss every one of them, but it's only for a month, just one month. He couldn't believe how much he missed them already. They had grown so close over their time together. He was of course the closest to Hinata and Haku, but that didn't mean he wouldn't miss them all. He made one last solemn promise the village started to disappear behind them. I swear I'll get Tsunade's wrinkled old ass back here to heal you old man. You'll be back up in no time. Hanasu. Divide. Using his mother's blade, Naruto is able to cut certain attacks in half. The phrase and command that support this, masks the time that the user is building chakra in order to perform the technique. This is not a foolproof defense, but it is very effective against lesser to middle powered jutsu. Chapter 21. The Legendary Healer. It had been a few hours since they left Konoha and they were now approaching the first town in their travels. Nay, Aero Senen, we're looking for Tsunade to heal Gigi-san right. So, why aren't we in more of a rush? Jiraiya cursed the boy's perception as they walked. Well, um, I'm just not anxious to see my old teammate is all, hey hey. It was partially true. She did, after all. While did fill out some of his fantasies she also didn't like being in his fantasies to begin with. Quote dot dot dot. Yeah, and I'll believe that for about zero seconds. Aside from the fact that she's female and she needs to heal Gigi, why aren't you in a hurry to find her? Jiraiya was a little angry with the statement. What? Finding the one person who may be able to heal my, possibly dying, sensei isn't enough. It's because of that man's teachings that I'm even here today I'll have you know. We're just not in that much a rush because Tsunade can be rather elusive, so we have to be thorough. Naruto lowered his gaze to the ground. Sure Jiraiya had taught him things for the finals, but they hadn't been around each other nearly as much as the Sanin had been around Serutobi. Now he felt rather bad for questioning the man's anxiousness to find the medic. The two walked in silence for a while before Naruto decided his course of action. Sorry. Don't worry about it. Let's just focus on finding Tsunade. We can't rush because we might miss her if we do. She moves often, so there's no telling where she could be. His temper was cooling now that they came up to the town's entrance. The noise that welcomed them was similar to that of the streets of Konoha just before the main fights of the Chunin exams. Ha. A festival. I. Guess it won't hurt to relax a little. Naruto. We'll be staying here tonight. Feel free to explore whatever you want and we'll meet at the hotel in the center of town later. Naruto looked around at the people visiting the entertainment stalls. It definitely looked. Dot fun, and no one seemed to be glaring at him as they passed. It was so different from Konoha. He brought out his wallet and considered it for a moment before taking out a few Ryu notes and pocketed them. That would be his limit for the day. Just because he wanted to have a little fun that he never really got to do back home, didn't mean he was going to blow all his hard-earned money. Oh who? That's quiet the savings you have there. I don't think you should be walking around here with that much money on you, it could get stolen in a crowd like this. Why don't you give it to me to guard for now while you go enjoy yourself? 
Naruto seemed to consider the Sanin for a minute before shrugging and digging his wallet back out and handing it over. Jiraiya shuffled his hair before walking off as he tossed the wallet in the air casually. He made it about 20 feet before he heard a small poof. Looking down, he saw a small bundle of something where Naruto's wallet once was. Seeing edges to whatever he held, he lifted it by them and let the object unfold. It only took a fraction of a second of him holding it in front of his face to realize that he was holding a pair of woman's panties. That was a fraction of a second too long though as he started to hear low growling all around him. Naruto walked down the middle of the street playing his pipes as he took in the sights. He only stopped once to smile as he heard the girlish cries for help from his sensei. Try to take my money and that's what you get, Arrow Senen. Walking forward once again he was able to visit many of the booths and try out some real festival foods for once. The only thing he thought may have matched this atmosphere was sitting at his own table with his girlfriends, not that there was much of a contest in that respect. Thinking of them though, he decided he could splurge a little and get them some trinkets, so he kept his eyes open for anything the girls might like. Everything from jewelry and clothing to food and games was displayed as he caroused the festival and over the course of a couple hours he was able to find everything he wanted before he decided to look for the hotel that Jiraiya had told him about earlier. With a full stomach and with his presence safely sealed away, he strode back through the town playing his pipes as people listened while he went by. Many had thought he was a street performer and he was rather surprised by how many offers he got to stop and play near stores and stands to attract customers. Unfortunately he was on a bit of a time schedule so he apologized to them all before making his way to his destination. It was another two hours before there was finally a knock at the suite's door. Naruto was able to bring himself out of his current scroll on the next stage of Tonfakata in order to address the noise. Hold on, I'm coming. He jumped directly from the bed to the door and peeked through the peephole. Seeing no one on the other side he shrugged and turned to go back to the bed. He made it halfway before another knock sounded through the room. Okay, who's there? Either you're a midget or you're hiding. He narrowed his eyes at the door, and placed his hand on the hilt of his ninja to when he heard some low whispers on the other side. We're looking for a certain person from Konoha. We heard that you are a ninja from there and we hoped you could help us. The voice came from a male, that much he could tell, but other than that it gave away nothing. Who told you I was from Konoha? The clerk at the front desk. Who is it you're looking for? Another set of whispers could be heard before a new voice made itself known. Uchiha Sasuke. Naruto nearly laughed at the name mentioned. He probably would have if it didn't trigger so many alarms in his head. Why would someone be asking for Sasuke outside the walls of Konoha? Were these people working for Orochimaru? And what, may I ask, do you want with him? We just need to talk to him. Well I'm sorry but I don't think he's allowed to have visitors right now. He was injured. Yeah, so he's at the hospital. Once again Naruto found himself trying not to crack up laughing. Hardly, but the Anbu might know where he's being held. Suddenly there was a dense killing intent radiating through the door and Naruto's survival instincts shouted for him to run. He barely made it out of the way as the door exploded into the room. Instantly two figures dove inside and one grabbed Naruto hoisting him into the air before knocking him against the wall. Deep blue met red and black as Naruto matched eyes with an all too familiar face from the bingo book. Uchiha. Itachi. Once again he narrowed his eyes. What do you know of my brother? Outside Itachi looked calm, but everyone in the room at the moment could feel the pressure that he was letting seep out. What happened to him? Despite the obvious danger he was in, Naruto tried to keep his head clear. He was now in the room with at least one S-ranked criminal and someone else that he couldn't see due to Itachi blocking his view. Funny you should ask really. You see your brother, while seeking to gain power to kill you, ended up traveling almost the same path and started attacking allies. You really should see the legacy you left behind, it's pretty sad really. The killing intent instantly doubled. Tell me what you know. Come on Itachi, we need to go now or that Sanin is gonna come back. You can listen to all his joyful little stories about your brother after we're away from here. Silence Kisame. I will learn what I can, now. The Uchiha yelled over his shoulder before turning his icy glare back on Naruto. Now tell me. 
Well I can see where he gets his arrogance from. Naruto just barely saw the man behind Itachi cringe at his words. Your brother is a stuck-up little prick who thinks the world should be given to him on a silver platter. He even had the backing of a lot of the council to get anything he wanted to. Add to that the wealth and social standing of the Uchiha and you get one very spoiled brat. That is, until I started to defy him. Now I showed Konoha his true colors and he's gone psycho, even going so far as to threaten to rape women in front of me and attempt to attack and kill me twice. Now here I am in your hands and there he sits in an Anbu cell awaiting his fate. Other than that mistake I would say your genocide of the Uchiha went rather well, at least for me. After all, when they were gone the shinobi attending my daily beatings were nearly cut in half. I. C. Foolish little brother. It matters not now though. Uzumaki Naruto. You will come with us. Finally. As much as I love a fight, going against a Sanin would just be bad news here. I can barely swing my sword without something getting in the way as it is. Just as Kisame finished the three heard a slight coughing by the door. Looking over they found Jiraiya standing there with Naruto grinning as he stood right next to the heavily bruised man. Uchiha Itachi, Hoshigaki Kisame. I'm surprised to see you two Akatsuki so close to Konoha. Jiraiya sneered at the two missing nin, daring them to make the first move. Akatsuki, I'll have to ask about that later. Naruto filed what little information he was given on the two in front of him to add to their visual makeup. Itachi considered the two Naruto's. He went to punch the one in his hand to see if it was the real one, but was forced to jump back when a couple of shuriken came at him. Dropping his Naruto, he watched with a little anger as it jumped over to the two Konoha shinobi as the one that was standing next to Jiraiya poofed away. Now the four stood face to face with the two nuke nin inside the room and their exit being blocked by a sanin and a jinchuriki. Kisame, we're leaving. Come on. It's two on two. We can take them. No, Jiraiya is not someone we can handle easily alone especially when we are so close to Konoha. The QB jinchuriki makes things even more difficult. We will retreat for now. Itachi threw a lone kanai behind him causing the wall to explode due to the note that had been attached to the handle. Before Jiraiya could move to stop either of them they were already halfway down the block. Quote dot 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 quote. Quote dot 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 quote. So what was that all about? Naruto asked the man beside him. Quote dot dot dot. Nothing you need to worry about Naruto. Bullshit. They wanted me. Why? Who are Akatsuki? That's not information that you are allowed to know. Just drop it. Oh because I'm sure they're going to drop it just because I can't know what's going on. Maybe if someone mentioned that there would be S-ranked missing nin trying to get me I would be able to get away before I was already in their hands. Ever think about that? I'm lucky enough that I sent a clone out to get you since you were taking so long. The blonde was gritting his teeth, trying to keep himself from hitting the man. Jiraiya had to admit, the kid had a good point. That didn't mean he wanted to tell him everything though now that brought up another issue he'd been meaning to ask. By the way, where did you get that sword? You're trying to change the subject. I'm curious. Jiraiya shrugged innocently. You tell me why those nuke nin were after me, and I'll tell you about the katana. The sanin sighed. How he wished he'd been born a Yamanaka sometimes. It would have made his information gathering and, research, so much easier. Sighing at the genin's defiance he reluctantly gave in to the boy's demands. Fine. The Akatsuki are a group of criminals that are after the biju. We don't know to what end yet, but rumors are that any jinchuriki that they find and capture, don't come back alive, if they come back at all. Other than that we don't know much about who or where they are, or even how many are in the organization. Happy now. Quote dot dot dot. About as happy as I can be considering I have a bunch of criminals after my life. Other than that, yeah, just peachy. Naruto responded with an equal amount of sarcasm and venom in his voice. Whatever. Now tell me where you got the katana. Which one? Dot huh. I have two in case you didn't notice. Which one do you want to know about? Up until now the Sanin had been concentrating so much on the blade that he knew to even consider anything else the teen was wearing. Quote dot dot dot. Well if you're offering, how about both? Naruto just sighed before bringing both swords out onto a cloth on the bed. He pointed to the black blade first. 
This one I got on a mission to Nami no Kuni where I was charged with guarding the bridge builder Tazuna. On the way I encountered the missing Nin Kafu and threw some stroke of dumb luck on my behalf and a moment of arrogance on his part one beat him and took his weapon. I'm sure Kiri is going to be up in arms over that once they find out about it from their genin team that was at the exams. It's hard for me to believe that a guy like Kafu would fall to someone of your level Gaki, but I suppose the proof is in the eye of the beholder. Now about this one. He was about to touch the red blade only for Naruto to grab his wrist and wrench it painfully to the side. If you so much as touch that katana without my permission I won't hesitate to break your wrist. His glare told Jiraiya all he needed to know. Even if the Sanin could beat him easily, it just wouldn't be worth it no matter how much he desired to hold the weapon. This sword belonged to a famous Kunoichi refugee of Uzu no Kuni. She was famous for this blade along with her hair color and the color of her armor in battle. Her nickname of Red Death came from those features as well as the apparent joy she took in being drenched in the blood of her enemies. The Sani nodded with a little boredom, already knowing this much as it was fairly common knowledge among the higher-ups in Konoha, so it only surprised him a little that Naruto would know about it. It was the next portion of information that caught his undivided attention again. Her name was Uzumaki Kashina and she was married to Namikaze Minato, the Yandaimi Hokage. Now Jiraiya was sweating a bit. The fact that his student had been married was not a well-known bit of information. If the kid knew that much. She and Minato had one child, though that is not common knowledge. Being our resident spymaster though, I'm sure you know exactly who that child was. Naruto was now glaring at the man a bit. His name was kept secret for his own protection, but this also caused him a lot of grief since there were certain aspects of his life that some were given free knowledge of. That knowledge caused him years of abuse and ignorance from others, but now he knows who he is. The Sanin gave a subtle shudder. The kid obviously knew who his parents were and, if his words about the village populace were any indication, he held no great love for Konoha as a whole. So. Dot you know. I'm guessing it was Serutobi sensei that told you. The boy shook his head and Jiraiya narrowed his eyes. Then who? Danzo. The older man hissed at the name. He knew the man all too well and had no great desire to see him, let alone speak with him. Does Hokage-sama know about this? Hi, it was just after that revelation that he gave me my parents' estate. Before you ask, no, I don't blame him for it. Regardless of what my life has been like, I understand that I would have had no life at all had word gotten out about who my father was. As it was, I would have questioned his actions if there weren't a few bright spots in my past. Only those seem to allow for his reasoning. Thankfully those bright patches have grown in number as of late, and while I'm still hated by most in the village for what is in me, I can withstand that for the sake of those who know who I really am. Not as a namikaze, but as Naruto. Quote dot dot dot. I see. Well since you already know who your father is, then you no doubt know that I was his sensei. That was why I decided to teach you in the first place, other than Serutobi sensei's request. That's also why I taught you the Rasengan, though I'm glad to see you didn't go overboard with it and use it in the finals. That would have spelled bad news for all of us if word got out. Well since we're going on this little trip and I used the excuse of training you to get you away from the viper's pit that Konoha's seemed to have turned into, we might as well figure out what I'm going to train you. Reaching into an inside pocket, Jiraiya brought out a leather-bound book and tossed it to the genin. Here's the first volume for basic sealing. That should get you star. He stopped as the book was thrown back at him. Don't insult me Aero Senen. I finished that one years ago. I'm up to the 5th intermediate volume, but if you have the 6th and 9th starter and the 3rd intermediate books I wouldn't mind seeing them. I never managed to get my hands on those. He watched as the Sanin scratched his head in obvious embarrassment. Ha. Huh. I guess I should have seen that one coming. After those seals you showed me, it should have been pretty obvious. Reaching back into his pocket he drew out a partially open scroll, revealing where he had gotten the first book. Resealing the one in his hand he pulled out the first of those asked for, the sixth starter book, and handed it to the blonde. There, read up and let me know if you have questions. I plan on quizzing you on what you know as we travel, so don't take this lightly. It had been two weeks since the start of their journey and Jiraiya couldn't be more. 
Annoyed. He had found out about Naruto's issues with the opposite sex, and had been warned about his recent relapses. What he hadn't been told about was Naruto's zero tolerance for perverseness. Sure the kid had basically made him help with his training during the one-month break for the finals of the exams, but he had played that off as wanting to be as prepared as possible for said exams. He easily got away though during the times when he had Naruto working on the Rasengan. With such long spans of time when he would be working alone that left the Sanin with large chunks of free time. Now though, with Naruto in a more relaxed situation in which he constantly had questions pertaining to seals he was reading about, the man had barely a second to himself. Sure he was both surprised and proud that the boy sped through the books he was given, but it wasn't helping his, research, at all. When he did manage to sneak a peek in, Naruto would show up and either alert his targets of his presence or pester him until he couldn't concentrate. He could swear the kid was doing it to purposely keep him away from the fairer sex. For someone like Jiraiya this meant that he had little inspiration for his stories, but at least he made his own deadlines. Being a ninja author it was accepted that his work was often irregular due to missions. Despite all that it was still his favorite pastime when duty wasn't calling. It was because of this that the pair was ahead of schedule coming into Tanzaku Gai. This is one of the largest gambling towns in the elemental countries. If we want to find Tsunade Haim, this is one of our best chances. One of my spies was able to spot her here not too long ago, but that doesn't mean she's going to stick around, so we have to work fast. Jiraiya looked down at his silent traveling companion, who turned out to be holding a Rasengan in one hand while reading a book on sealing that he held in the other. A small tick mark appeared on his brow as he scowled and slapped the hand holding the Rasengan off to the side, causing it to lose stability and whip out into the surrounding trees. Naruto looked casually up from his book and surveyed the damage. He watched as a few branches fell and clattered on the roots below before turning back his annoyed sensei. Was that really necessary? Maybe if you'd pay attention. Tsunade is most likely here and we have to look quickly unless she disappears. Hey, isn't this town supposed to have a castle? Huh, yeah it's right. Jiraiya pointed out over the town to where he knew the tall castle would be, but his finger now pointed at nothing but clear sky and the remains of a dust cloud. As if to answer his question, a man ran past them yelling something about giant snakes attacking the town. The two looked at each other to confirm what they heard before rushing through the gate towards where the castle should have been. Rushing through the streets they tried their best to avoid the stampeding crowds before getting fed up and leaping onto the roofs. Now with a clear path they were able to get to their destination in minutes, but that seemed to be all the attackers needed as all they found was a broken wall and the collapsed castle. Naruto took in a few whiffs of air. Smells like sake. Dot and snakes. So he's here too. No doubt trying to get some healing. Jiraiya had heard about Orochimaru's arms from the Anbu who had witnessed the event. With the injuries that were described, it was apparent that only one of the top medics in the world would even dare to try to heal his arms. One of those medics was in Suna, but since he already betrayed them by killing their cage it was pretty much a given that they wouldn't welcome him with open arms. Tsunade though had most likely not heard of the events in Konoha yet. In addition, Orochimaru was their teammate and would know just what strings to pull to get what he wanted. We're going to have to step up our search. We're splitting up. If you find her don't try to convince her to come on your own. With Orochimaru involved we'll need to handle this delicately. We'll meet at the hotel in three hours regardless of what we find. I have a better idea. We go to the hotel now and train while I search. Naruto watched the confusion turn to realization on the Sanin's face. Taju Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. Find Tsunade. If you see her dispel yourselves. Do not make contact. Go. As simple as that the massive search party was bounding off through the town, slowly and carefully so as not to arouse suspicion. Okay. Well then, what do you want to train in? Well, before you so rudely interrupted my reading. I was about to finish my book, so how about we do your little quiz while we wait? With a nod of acknowledgement they were off to the hotel area to reserve a room and begin their training, leaving the clones to scour the town for traces of their target. Four hours later Jiraiya lay on one bed snoring away while Naruto leaned against the wall as he sat on the ceiling while meditating on what he'd learned. 
It always seemed to surprise the hermit when he would answer the man's questions so easily. He also noticed that it made Jiraiya a bit more uncomfortable whenever he gave his own views on the topics they discussed and turned out some apparently unexpected of uses for some of the seals he would learn. He was brought out of his musings when his meditative trance went a little too deep and he splashed into some water. Welcome back child. Naruto looked around, easily realizing where he was. So Fox, I see you've found an easier way to pull me in here. Was there something you wanted? I noticed that you carry those swords around with you, yet you seem to never practice with them. Why is that? They aren't really my preferred weapons. Small blades that keep you in close to your target are more my style, or longer blades that don't clink around too much when moving. A katana and a wakazashi clink around too much and if you're trying to be stealthy it just doesn't work. So why not get them shortened? Quote dot 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 question mark quote. It is possible to shorten a blade to fit your style. The opposite is, of course, pretty much impossible without risking the strength of the blade though. You also will not be able to get it straightened, but at least they could be more manageable. So long as they work from the tang up they will not damage the blade and it's generally a fairly quick adjustment. With weapons like those it would be a pity to not use them. I'll have to keep that in mind. There may even be a smith here that can do it for me. Word of advice, keep the scraps. We wouldn't want the possibility of another one of those weapons showing up in the wrong hands. Plus we may be able to put them to use later. Naruto nodded in understanding. He had honestly never heard of shortening a blade, but if it could be done then he would have two, very usable, blades instead of two large noisemakers. Was that all? Yes child. Now go. You have things to accomplish outside. With another pulse of chakra Naruto was jolted awake to find himself in a rather uncomfortable position of laying on his neck with his legs slightly akimbo as they leaned against the wall. Grumbling at the soreness in his neck, he pushed off the wall and rolled to his knees. Taking in any information he might have missed, he found that a few of his clones had dispelled already when they came across Tsunade and another woman in a bar across town. Aero Senen. Aero Senen. Grumbling at the man's lack of response, Naruto grabbed a hold of the mattress to his sensei's bed and with a heave, flipped it over. Now that would have been all fine had Jiraiya rolled out neatly onto the floor of the room, but Naruto had his pranksters itch flare up and instead tipped the mattress to the side, towards the window, that opened up over the roof of the bathhouse. Dot the woman's side of course. By the time Naruto made it to the hotel lobby, the battered and bruised Sanin was just finishing wringing the extra water out of his clothing. Quit fooling around Aero Senen. We found her, but we need to hurry. You wasted enough time already. Well maybe I would have been faster if someone didn't push me out the window. The older man scowled at the boy, clearly angry. The least you could have done was warn me so they wouldn't have known I'd be coming. I could have at least gotten a peek in before they grabbed their towels. I called you, twice. Maybe next time you'll actually get your lazy ass up instead of having to be tipped every time. You'd think a person would learn after spending so much time on the road with me. Naruto threw his hands in the air in over-exaggerated frustration before turning around and walking out into the street. Jiraiya took a moment to grumble something under his breath. Something about, I'll break you in eventually kid. Then you'll worship me for my knowledge, spoiled brats and their multiple girls. A random kanai whipped past his ear, nearly nicking it. All right, I'm coming. Now listen, we have to play this off just right, so follow my lead. We're going to act like we just found them by chance. Haim is a betting woman so that'll work in our favor. Just let me do the talking and we'll be fine. Not giving his accomplice a chance to retort, Jiraiya made his way into the restaurant and looked around at the crowd inside. Using his flawless acting skills, he widened his eyes upon spotting Tsunade sitting in a booth off towards the back corner. Tsunade. He shouted in a perfectly convincing, surprised voice. Naruto just rolled his eyes at the obvious fake actions. Jiraiya. Of course when someone is as drunk as this woman seemed to be, it would be difficult for such bad acting to not work. What the hell are you doing here? Jiraiya lead the way over to the booth and sat opposite the slug Sani. You're a hard woman to find Tsunade, you know that. Surprisingly enough he was able to give her a genuine smile. A good thing too because the woman's companion seemed a little suspicious of the pair. 
It's good to see some things stay the same though. How is the traveling Shizun? We're doing well Jiraiya-sama. The woman replied a little nervously. Good, good. You know you should visit Konoha once in a while. I think you'd find things a lot different than when you were last there. Instantly both women were on guard as they stiffened. Tsunade even seemed to sober up a little. Smooth arrow senin. Naruto whispered out the corner of his mouth. Quiet. I've almost got her. And why would I ever want to go back to that place again? There's nothing there for me but bad memories. Taking her sake bottle in hand she took a big swig, not even seeming to care about the scowl her assistant was giving her. I guess you didn't hear the news then. At the rise of an inquisitive eyebrow he continued. Orochimaru attacked Konoha. Yeah I heard. A joint attack from Odo and Suna. It failed. What else is new? Sensei was stabbed by Orochimaru's Kusanagi sword. He's dying Tsunade. We, we need you to come back and heal him. Jiraiya lowered his eyes to the table trying to show that what he said was true. And. Quote dot dot dot. What do you mean? And. That old fool took up the title Hokage. Cages die, it's their destiny. Only a fool would become Hokage. Tsunade sneered at the pair in front of here. So if it was offered to you, you would decline. Half the restaurant quieted at the sound of a bottle shattering on the floor. Tsunade looked at Jiraiya as if she'd never seen him before. Hey are you serious? You really came all this way to ask me? No, of course not. Like I said only a fool would take such a job. Why don't you take it if you think it's so grand? You and I both know I can't do that Tsunade. I'm not fit for such a title. Besides I have my spy network to run. I can't be Hokage and run around the nations at the same time. Well you're just going to have to find someone else. I'm not going to sacrifice my life for a bunch of people that I don't even know. Dot quote. Tsunade stood up, signaling for Shizun to do the same. The second woman picked up a previously unseen pink bundle as she hurried to her master's side. Maybe if you bash someone over the head enough they'll agree to leave that place, but me, I'm staying as far away as I can get. The pair turned to leave, but were stopped when the Sanin felt a tug on her sleeve. She looked down to see a hand attached to an arm that lead to Jiraiya's companion. Kid, you'll let go now if you know what's good for you. And you'll close your worthless trap if you know what's good for you. Once again silence filled the restaurant but this time it was from the killing intent filling the area. Care to repeat that twerp? I said you are a worthless piece of trash that has no hope of amounting to anything. If a person like you became the Hokage we'd end up the laughing stock of the ninja world. Naruto finally looked up at her with hate blazing in his eyes. You have no idea how hard the old man worked to keep the village safe and stable. You have no idea how much he helped each person in it despite who or what they were. Your worst day wouldn't hold a candle to his and yet you think that you can turn down that honor because you have some personal issues with Konoha. You have no idea what it means to be Hokage let alone the backbone to take that title. All you can do is run away like a scared little girl. He let go of her sleeve and made shooing motions towards the door. I wish to only have the presence of real ninja. I'll even take the company of this pervert over your self-pitying ass. By this point both Jiraiya and Shizun were holding Tsunade in place to keep her from killing the blonde boy. So you think you're some tough guy huh? Maybe you think you can even take me on. How about we take this outside and I show you just how weak you are, Gaki. Tease Tsunade-sama. You don't need to go that far. Let's just go. We have other things to worry about right now. Shizun was forced to shrink back when Tsunade glared at her. Fine. Before the slug princes could yell at her assistant, three heads turned to look at the boy that was now standing between them and the door. None had seen him move, but then they weren't really paying much attention to him either. If you want a fight so bad then let's go. Naruto lead the way out as Jiraiya and Shizun reluctantly let Tsunade go. The three followed the boy down a side alley so that they wouldn't disturb anyone passing by. Physical attacks only. First one floored wins. Tsunade said as Jiraiya and Shizun cringed at the implications of such a fight. It was well known that Tsunade had some insane strength backing her attacks, and if even one hit the boy he would be done for. Fine. Naruto took off his swords and threw them to Jiraiya who gaped at such an act. Naruto are you sure you don't want to keep these? 
They could come in handy. I'd rather not risk breaking them. Naruto settled into an open fighting stance as he considered Tsunade's own stance. The female Sanin extended one finger in front of her. Time limit. No. One finger. This is all I'll be using. Naruto just smirked. Fine. You win. We leave you alone and go back to Konoha empty-handed. Jiraiya made to interject but was cut off as Naruto continued a bit louder to overshadow his arguments. If I win you come back with us and heal Gigi-san. You don't want me to be Hokage. I could care less if you choose to not be Hokage. Like I said, I think you're unfit for the title. You will heal Serutobi Gigi though. Tsunade cocked an eyebrow, slightly pissed that the brat would underestimate her yet again. Fine, and just to make this interesting I'll even throw in this if you win. She pulled a necklace out of her shirt, showing him the crystal that swung on the end. He could see Jiraiya and Shizune gape at the action, but he himself could care less. I don't need some jewelry from beating a drunk boss San. The two witnesses leaned back in fright as Tsunade visibly fumed. But if that's what will make you happy then fine. Do your worst. No sooner had the words left his mouth than Tsunade was on him. With a flick of her finger he was sent tumbling backwards down the alley. Shizune was already running after him to make sure he was still alive while Tsunade smirked and turned towards her old teammate. So I guess this means I'm not coming back with you. She smiled when Jiraiya sighed. Not exactly. They looked down the alley where Shizune had stopped halfway to her target. Looking further they could make out a shadowy shape slowly getting to its feet. What? You thought one little love tap could keep me down? Please, I've had worse bumps falling out of trees. Hey, it was more or less true considering his fight with Gara. Despite the pain in his chest Naruto made his way into the light of a lamp, just outside the back entrance to a store. He was bleeding from the mouth a bit, but that didn't quell the determination in his eyes. Well since you already lost. Holding his hand out Naruto created an all too well known swirling ball of chakra before rushing at the pair of Sanin. Tsunade stared at the ball in non-belief, almost allowing him to get to her before she reacted. With another burst of chakra she hit the ground causing a crevice to form down the middle of the alley. With the concentration on his Rasengan Naruto reacted a little too late. Instead of taking a straight line towards his target, he ended up stumbling and losing control of the ball. Desperate to make something out of his attack he thrust his palm forward and released it, causing a blast of chakra to rush towards the two older bodies. Jiraiya knowing what would happen, dove behind a dumpster to wait out the storm while Tsunade stood directly in the path of the attack. Luckily Naruto was kind enough to tone down the power since he had no intention of killing the woman. Unluckily it was more than enough to send her flying to the opposite end of the alley. Shizune looked on in horror while Jiraiya shook his head and snickered. Tsunade was in shock that she let such an attack get through, but that was also matched by the shock that the kid was able to do it at all. Shock turned to anger though as she got to her feet and pounded her way to Jiraiya. What the hell was that? Teaching a kid Rasengan. No wonder he's got such a big head. Do you realize how dangerous that was? Oh pipe down Ba San. Naruto said as he picked himself up from where he fell. You're just lucky I went easy one you. Now, about my winnings. What winnings? We agreed physical attacks only and you used a jutsu. You ignored the rules so you lose by default. Yeah I would have lost by default but you used a jutsu first. Don't think I'm so ignorant to not know you pack your punches with chakra. We both know that if you flicked me with just your muscle power that I wouldn't have even lost my balance. Since you broke the rules first, you lose Heim. Tsunade grit her teeth. It was just her luck to lose, not that anyone would be surprised by that. Fine. Best two out of three, and this time it's anything goes. She was slightly startled at Naruto's nonchalant shrug as he once again took up a stance down the alley. Once again Shizune tried to argue against it, but her words fell on deaf ears. Jiraiya would have been worried, but at the sight of Naruto's smirk as he passed by he knew the boy was up to something. Tsunade didn't even give Naruto a chance to see her stance before she leapt into action, speeding towards him she saw him start to make hand signs. Ram. So a jutsu then. Well I'll just have to smack him around before he can cast it. 
Had she been paying more attention to herself than her opponent's actions she would have realized a couple things. First, Naruto wasn't trying to make any other signs, instead just holding the ram sign. Second, her view of the world was starting to get lower and lower as she got closer to him. It wasn't until she was almost to him that she found her chin scratching the ground as she slid to a stop at his feet. She looked around startled and found she couldn't move right. What the hell did you do to me brat? Binding seals. It should be pretty much impossible for you to move much. Naruto casually walked over while taking out a kunai before kneeling beside the prone woman and holding the weapon to her throat. Yield. His victim spat curses at him for a couple minutes, but eventually was forced to concede as she hung her head in the dirt. Fine you bastard. You win. Are you happy now? Now let me go. Naruto released his seals as he stood up. Like I said you will heal Gigi. Even if I have to drag you back by your hair. I expect you to hold to your side of the bet. Quote dot dot dot. Fine, but I have some things I need to take care of here first. It'll take me about a week, but when I'm finished I'll go back to Konoha and heal Sensei. Jiraiya made to speak but was cut off. No, I am not agreeing to be the Hokage. I'll heal Sensei and he can pick someone else. She motioned Shizune to follow and disappeared around the corner without a backward glance. Jiraiya walked over to Naruto who was leaning against a wall holding his ribs. You know, you're lucky she was drunk. She would have never fallen for that if she wasn't. When did you manage to get the seals on her? Before we left the restaurant. I was planning on using them if she didn't agree to go back, or I lost. You didn't really think I'd let her get away did you? That's playing a little dirty don't you think? We're ninja sensei. We don't do things cleanly if it benefits our cause. Naruto pushed off the wall and started to make his way back to their hotel. You just called me sensei. Jiraiya said with a smirk. Naruto paused mid-stride. Quote dot dot dot. I must have taken a harder hit than I thought. Despite the jibe, he did actually hurt from the impact of the strike. Enough so that he fell to a knee and coughed up a little blood. Hey. Jiraiya rushed over to see Naruto holding his chest with one hand while wiping his mouth with the other. Kid you better ease up or you're going to bite off more than you can chew one of these days. As stern as he wanted to be, he couldn't help but worry for his student while oddly feeling some admiration. To fight through an injury when your life wasn't at stake seemed foolish but he had done it to help their goals, and help them he did. It had been nearly a week since their meeting with Tsunade. It took three of those days for Naruto to completely heal from the hit he took, showing just how close to a serious injury he could have gotten. Had it not been for his tenant he would have likely been bedridden for the entire month, at least. Even with his rapid healing it took a few visits from Shizun to make sure everything was still in place and functional, during which time she made sure to mention how amazed she was that he even got back up let alone attacked her mentor back. As such Naruto and Jiraiya spent most of their time in their room with Naruto reading his new book and Jiraiya quizzing him on what he knew about seals while using a spy mirror to peek through the new window in the onsen's roof, an action that got him knocked through said window more than once. Naruto dropped his current book and looked over towards the window where his sensei, the esteemed Aero Senen, sat trying to peek out the window without being in a position that could endanger his well-being again. Nay, Aero Senen. What are we going to do when hubby Tem shows up? When? Oh come on. They were obviously in the same place at the same time when we got here. Now she says she has to wait to tie up some loose ends before we can go back to Konoha. It's obvious she plans to meet him again for some reason. Quote dot dot dot. You know kid, sometimes you're too smart for your own good. Listen. If Tsunade hadn't been drunk when you fought you'd be nothing more than a red stain on the ground in that alley. If she is going to meet with Orochimaru then I want you to stay as far away from them as possible. Got it. Jiraiya leveled a gaze on the blonde to let him know he was serious. Hi. Hi. Stay far away from them. I suppose you're going to intervene then. Exactly. That's why you won't have to worry about getting involved. While we're out having a nice chat you're going to be here studying seals. Whatever. Just don't come crying to me when she decides to join him and fight you just to get out of our deal. Tsunade may be many things but she won't back out of a department or use deception to get away. 
is that why she walks around in a permanent henge and why Shizun gets nervous every time we talk about staying longer. Quote dot dot dot. She'll come with us. Well you have more faith in her than I do. Now if you'll excuse me I believe I have some studying to do. Naruto picked up his latest book before exiting the room via the window. It was a nice day so reading on the roof of the hotel would be more than welcome if only for the fresh air. The Sanin watched his protege leave and sighed to himself. He knew there was a chance that Tsunade would do exactly as he said, but he had to believe in her, even if no one else would. She was his teammate after all, and at least she didn't abandon the village. I sure hope you know what you're doing Haim. He made to get some rest, but was interrupted when there was a knock at the door. Coming. The door opened to reveal none other than Tsunade in all her glory. Come on you old toad. We're going out for a drink, for old time's sake. The offer caught him off guard but he quickly agreed to it. After all, if there was one woman he'd stop his girl chasing for it would be her. Dot dot. Though he would still peep. He had to have something to write about after all. Uh. Yeah, okay. Taking a quick look around the room, it took him a second to remember that Naruto was outside reading already. Oh well. Wouldn't be the first time I've left him alone while I chased some tail. Smiling, he gestured for Tsunade to lead the way which earned him a gentle smile and nod in return before Tsunade turned to lead them to their destination. As they walked out through the lobby they were stopped by Shizun who had been reading a medical book in one of the lobby's plush chairs. Tsunade Sama. Where are you going? She looked at the two rather suspiciously. She knew what was happening tomorrow and couldn't help but believe this would do some harm later. We're going out for a drink Shizun, as old teammates. Just to reminisce about the old days and all that. Stay here and study, we'll be back later. Tsunade gave her apprentice a cold glare, warning her not to spill any information. I I see. Please be careful and don't drink too much. Remember. We'll be leaving for Konoha in the morning. If you get bored the Gaki is on the roof studying too. Feel free to. Keep him compen. Oof. Jiraiya was forced to stop his lecherous line of thought as Tsunade's elbow planted itself in his gut. Rubbing his stomach, he just laughed a bit before following the retreating back of the older woman. Don't wait up for us. Shizun shook her head at their antics before considering her options. After a moment she decided to join the young blonde mainly just to have some company, though her thoughts stayed purely social rather than following the lines of Jiraiya's thought process. Being a Jonin herself and having the chakra control of a medic, it didn't take her long to scale the wall of the hotel where she was able to see the mop of hair that could only be her fellow ninja. Hello Naruto-san. Jiraiya-sama told me you were up here studying and I thought you could use some company. He went out chasing tail again didn't he? Naruto replied while flipping a page. Shizun's sweat dropped at his nonchalant attitude towards the sage. Hey. Dot not exactly. He went out drinking with Tsunade-sama. Naruto quirked an eyebrow, but shook off the bad feeling he got as the medic sat down next to him and opened her own book. Studying too. Yeah, even when you're in the higher ranks it never hurts to know more. There is a lot about the human body that I have yet to learn, especially in regards with how to heal it. I see. I never really got far enough in medical jutsu to worry much about that, but I wouldn't want my other skills to even out either, so I'll keep studying no matter how powerful I get. Of course, I still have a long way to go to be of much a threat to the ninja world as a whole. He casually flipped another page in his book and continued reading. When one learns things using cage bunshin, one tends to learn to multitask as well. Not to mention the random attacks Jiraiya would throw at him while they were traveling no matter if he was reading, bathing or using the toilet. While it was true that a ninja should always be prepared, there were such things a limits to what was necessary for training. That's not to say that he hadn't gotten the old pervert back during his peeping escapades. One yell, or a swift kick over a wall was enough to get the witch hunt started. So you do know some medical jutsu then? Shizun knew Rasengan took chakra control to use, but she hadn't expected someone that seemed to like to be on the offensive to know healing techniques. When I first started training I kept my boundaries open, just to see where my interests and talent would lead me. I found out that, while I could do medical techniques, they just didn't interest me as much as the more, flashy attacks, I guess you could say. 
Naruto gave a smile and shrug, a little embarrassed that he went for the exciting and dangerous part of ninja life over the gentler half. I ended up settling for ninjutsu, taijutsu, fuinjutsu, kenjutsu and a little genjutsu. Right now I'm concentrating on fuinjutsu though since I'm traveling with an expert on the subject. I'm not one to waste resources when they become available. She knew he had to be somewhat of a genius for what he'd done to the drunk Tsunade, but to have such a broad range of skills at such a young age was pretty unfathomable. Well you definitely give new meaning to the phrase, well-rounded ninja, don't you? If your other techniques are on par with your ninjutsu and she tips the book in his hands to see the title, making her eyes widen at how far he was with the level of the subject. Fuinjutsu then you must really be a powerhouse. Hell you should already be at high chunin or low jonin with that knowledge. Naruto flinched a bit at her praise. Well there were other issues keeping me from getting that far too fast. I only just made it to the chunin exams this time around because Gigi made a special exception for my case. I made it to the finals, but didn't get promoted yet for some rather obvious reasons. His words made Shizun lower her head. She knew he had a close relationship with the Sandame from their earlier talks when she healed him. Though they were brief, he still showed that he held the old man in high regards. It's no wonder he blew up on Tsunade-sama. Anyway, I don't care what rank I'm at. I'll keep getting stronger to protect what is precious to me. The blonde announced as he looked up from his book and over in the direction of Konoha. I will always be there to protect them no matter what the danger and keep those who would try to endanger them in their place. Whoever they are, I'm sure they're very lucky to have a guardian angel like you looking over them. No I'm the lucky one. Dot for having them acknowledge me. He returned his gaze to his book and began reading in silence. Shizun took this as a sign that he would rather stop the direction they were headed, so she reluctantly followed suit and dug into her own studies. They ended up sitting there long after the sun started setting, waiting until the last licks of light crossed their pages before finally calling it quits. Well, I guess I'll see you tomorrow Shizun-san. I doubt those two will be back anytime soon, and I have a feeling that I'll need all the sleep I can get, for the trip. Why yeah, I guess that's a good idea. His sudden announcement had startled her and something in the way that he worded it made her wonder if he knew about their meeting tomorrow. Until tomorrow then Naruto-san. Walking back to his room. Naruto tossed his newly completed book aside. Truth be told he had finished it over an hour ago, but being in the company of someone other than his perverted sensei was somehow calming. Of course anyone that could keep their mind away from the female anatomy for more than 10 seconds would have been acceptable company after being on the road for the better part of a month with the man. Sighing, he flopped on his bed and tried his best to fall asleep. It was much earlier than he would have normally turned in, but if his bad feeling from before was right, and Tsunade was trying out some tricks, he would need to be prepared for a fight like none he'd been in before. Morning came very quickly for the container since he had gone to bed so early. He found it a little odd that Jiraiya still hadn't returned, but again that was nothing new. The only reason it caused more concern than normal was because of the possible events that may unfold later that day. Determined to be ready for anything, he gathered his supplies and set them out to make sure everything was accounted for. Kanai, shuriken, blades, seals, wire, pills, ointments, everything he needed was check off his list as he went through his assortment of tools. He sealed everything back up and put the scrolls in his pants and vest, stopping to debate once as he weighed his swords. On one hand they were very powerful weapons that could help tip the scale in a fight. On the other hand though, if they were taken from him they could make someone else a lot more powerful than they needed to be at the moment. Since he didn't really know how to use the larger weapons proficiently yet he opted to store them for now, but kept them in a readily available pocket just in case. The last thing he needed right then was for Orochimaru to decide to take him out personally with his Kusanagi and have nothing to defend against it save for his ninja too. As faithful as the small blade had been to him in the past, he doubted it would hold up against the legendary sword for too long. Having all of his gear packed up and ready, Naruto decided on a quick shower. It wasn't that he cared about going into a fight dirty, since he really was a little bit grimy due to his training schedule and less than hygienic habits as of late. He'd normally just train, then read until he fell asleep leaving no time for such things as bathing. 
The reason he decided to get a shower now of all times was more practical. Using warm water was a quick and thorough way of loosening muscles before strenuous activity, and if there was a more strenuous activity than the possibility of fighting a sonin, then he hadn't found it yet, although shopping with the girls came close. He was just coming out of the bathroom when there was a knock at the door. Figures he'd get wasted enough to lose the room key. Probably too hungover to climb up the wall too. Naruto grumbled as he walked over to open the door as another, more frantic knock came. Hang on. I'm coming. He opened the door to find Shizune there, holding her stomach and breathing heavily. Jiraiya-sama. Is Jiraiya-sama in? The woman was clearly distraught as she tried to look over him and into the room. From her limited vantage point she couldn't see anyone else there so she turned her attention back to the boy in front of her finally noticing his state of dress, or lack thereof. Blushing heavily she turned around and apologized. Gee Goman. I didn't mean to come at a bad time. I just really need to see Jiraiya-sama. It's about Tsunade, isn't it? She went to meet the hubby Tem. Shizune spun on her heel, not caring about his unclothed state anymore as she grabbed his shoulders. You knew. But how? Naruto checked the hall before pulling her inside and shutting the door, causing her to squeak a little in surprise. When we got here we went to where the castle was and it reeked of booze and snakes. It wasn't difficult to figure out who had been there. Then there was when Tsunade asked for a week to settle her matters here but wouldn't tell us what they were. We didn't know for sure, but we had a good idea. Aero Senen was going to go to stop her, but I'm betting she did something to keep him away last night. I haven't seen him since they left yesterday. Naruto put his hand on the seam of his towel before looking at the medic and arching an eyebrow. Taking the hint, the blushing woman quickly turned around as she heard the towel drop to the floor behind her. So if you knew then why didn't you bring it up earlier? Because, first we had to get Tsunade to trust us enough to come back to Konoha. A fight over whatever this meeting is about would be bad for relations. Second, if there is a fight today then two Sanin against one gives us good odds of taking Orochimaru out for good. Though that'll be a little tougher if Ba San gave Erosenin any trouble last night. For all we know he could be tied up in a cellar somewhere in town. I'm finished. Shizune turned around to see him in his full battle gear for the first time. It reminded her of some of the ninja she'd seen during the last war seeing all of the pockets full of things she could only guess at, while a sword handle poked out from behind him. Then there was the look in his eyes, a look that told her that he had already seen battle and all of its horrors. A look that seemed so out of place, yet at the same time she couldn't think of a face it would fit better. You actually plan to help in a fight between Sani? Well I don't plan on sitting by and doing nothing if things start to go south. Jiraiya may be a pervert, but he's the only teacher I've got, and Tsunade is a cold, hard bitch but she's the only one that might be able to save the old man. If I have to stick my neck out a bit to tip the scales then I will. Of course that doesn't mean I'm going to rush in an attack right off the bat either. If the fight's going fine then I won't interfere at all. Now enough talking. If you're here that means Tsunade is already meeting with the snake. Naruto made to jump out the window, but had to duck his head back inside as two shuriken lodged into the frame near him. Unsheathing his ninja to in order to guard against any new attack he eased his head out the window again. The blade was unfounded as he realized the source of the attack was the Gama Sanin himself. The hell arrow Senen. You could have cut me. Shish shut up Gaki. Tsunade. She used some kind of drug on me. It took me most of the morning just to get over here. It's clearing up, but it'll be a long time before I'm ready to win a dancing contest. Yeah, like the rest of you life. Listen Tsunade is already on her way to the meeting. Shizune, help him get on his feet. I'm going on ahead to see what I can do. Wait, what? I'm the John and here you should stay and I'll go. Besides I know Tsunade-sama the best. True but you're also the only real medic here. You can help him recover a lot faster than I can. Shizun wanted to argue further, but Jiraiya cut in. The Gaki's right. You'll just have to be quick about getting me up and running again. Naruto. Be careful. I don't know what that snake offered her, but if it's enough to risk taking me out of my game then it can't be good. Her precious people. What? The two males turned towards Shizun's soft voice. He offered to bring her precious people back to life. 
She sniffed a bit at the thought of such a thing being possible. Being able to see Nawaki and Dan alive again would be more than she could bear. At the cost of healing his arms. Shit. Naruto jumped off the roof and bounded over to where the castle once stood. Naruto. Damn it. Shizune. Listen to me. There is no way to bring people back to life. What he was talking about is an abomination of a kinjutsu. I need you to heal me as fast as possible. If that kid gets involved, things could take a turn for the worst real quick. Shizun nodded shakily before getting a glass of water and giving it to the man to drink. After a few more glasses he was at least able to stand somewhat steadily on his own. Your chakra control will be a little iffy for a while, but you should be able to fight decent enough. With both of you, you should be able to match him while I take on his apprentice. Apprentice. Hi, Kabuto-san. I don't know his abilities, but I should be able to keep him busy long enough for you and Tsunade-sama to deal with Orochimaru. An unknown ninja. That could be a problem. We need to move now. Let's go. Jiraiya didn't wait for her consent before bounding off over the rooftops, taking the same general path Naruto had taken not too long ago. Tsunade slowly walked towards Orochimaru, her hands glowing green from her healing jutsu. The only thoughts going through her head at the moment were about her brother and her lover who would soon be reunited with her. As she came within inches of her ex-teammate they were forced to jump apart when three kanai shot between them. All three people that occupied the small road turned towards their surroundings to see who would dare interrupt them. You. I. Tsunade sneered, furious at who had showed up. Good morning Haim. I hope you didn't get too much of a hangover from your drinking binge with Sensei last night. Naruto stood on the wall off to one side and behind Tsunade. Ah. Naruto-kun. I haven't seen you since the exams. Tell me, how's Sensei doing? Orochimaru asked, rather relaxed given the tense situation Tsunade was causing as her killing intent saturated the air. He's alive no thanks to you. Maybe next time you'll do us all a favor and fall on that damned cursed blade yourself. And after all of the entertainment I gave you, this is how you thank me. Oh well, Kabuto-kun, kill him. Without so much as an acknowledging nod the bespectacled youth standing nearby threw a couple sanbon at the blonde, impaling his neck and heart precisely. Now that pest control is taken care of we can get back to. Telling her exactly how you intend to bring back her loved ones. Naruto's voice spilled over the scene again, this time from behind Orochimaru as he was discovered to be walking towards them on the side of the wall opposite the one he'd been standing on before. Looking back at the body Kabuto had attacked they were just in time to witness the last of the smoke dissipate. Kabuto. I thought I told you to kill him. Apologies Orochimaru-sama. I will remedy this error immediately. Once again Naruto was hit with lethal accuracy, and once again he poofed out of existence. These clones aren't free you know. Now he was leaning against the hole in the wall that Tsunade had created when she first met the snake here a week ago. Fine if you won't tell her, I will. You see Tsunade. Dot dot quote. Orochimaru raged while Kabuto attacked in response. Again the clone popped, and again another showed up elsewhere. He plans to use a jutsu called Edo Tensai. It's true that it brings back the dead, but, it brings them back as nothing more than emotionless zombies, there's more to the trick, but I doubt, it would bring them back completely. As it is they would, be completely, under his, control. Oh and let's not forget. Dot the only cost is two human sacrifices. Orochimaru roared in anger as his trickery was explained. His anger went up each time Kabuto would kill a clone only to have another continue where its predecessor left off. I should have killed you when I had the chance you brat. And we both know that if you had stuck around you would have died too. This time Naruto appeared behind Tsunade, more or less using her to shield himself from attack. So, Haim, is that what you want? A couple of undead marionettes in exchange for releasing their puppeteer on the world again. Hey, most likely he'd use them to kill you as soon as you healed him. Tsunade didn't want to believe the brat, but she couldn't help it. She knew all about her ex-teammate's sick experiments. How do you know so much about this jutsu? It was her last hope to discover he was lying, even though Orochimaru's actions against him pretty much proved his guilt. 
because it was the same one he tried to use against the old man when he brought the Shodai and Nadaim back using it. He tried to bring back the Yandaimi too, but that one backfired on him. Right asshole. Naruto gave the man a full-toothed smile over Tsunade's slumping shoulders. Is that true, Orochimaru? Tsunade lowered her head, her voice coming out in a growl. Not only had the snake offered to give her loved ones back to her with such a despicable kinjutsu, but he'd also already brought back both of the previous cage, her blood relatives, to fight against the village they founded. Who? 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 You really are the annoying prankster aren't you Naruto-kun? You just can't let things that don't concern you alone. Well since it seems I won't be getting healed the nice way, I'll just have to make sure you can't heal anyone else either. There are other ways for me to get the use of my arms back. Despite his threat, Orochimaru and Kabuto were forced to jump to the wall, then to a tree in order to get away from Tsunade's maddened attacks. Get back here you bastards. She called out to them as she crashed through the wall. You know, leaping over that would have taken less chakra. Naruto shut his mouth as the enraged Sanin gave him a glare. I won't thank you for this, so shut up. Just be glad I'll be healing that old man when this is over with. Hell I might even take up the Hokage seat just to put you in your place, legally. Naruto couldn't help but smile at himself as he followed the woman after the two Odo Nin. Progress is progress I suppose. I just hope Aero Senen and Shizun San can find us. He watched as Tsunade continuously cratered the ground with her attacks. Okay, well that shouldn't be a problem then. Guess I'll just hope they get here before she runs out of chakra. Hitting nothing is definitely not working wonders for her chakra stores I'm sure. Sighing at her actions, Naruto followed behind, though far enough to stay out of the action for now. He would stick with his original plan of only helping if needed, and right now getting anywhere near the berserking blonde woman would end up as a bad day for him. Chapter 22. A Fight Amongst Sanin. It had taken them a while to get to the meeting point due to Shizun needing to heal Jiraiya a bit to keep him going, and heal her own stomach where Tsunade had punched her to knock her out earlier. Neither injury was life-threatening, but having them healed would give them a better fighting chance in the battle to come. They knew even before they hit the dirt road that they were too late. Their fears were confirmed as they saw the newly wrecked wall and the obvious path leading through it. Looks like we won't have to use Tauntin to track them after all, whatever the Gaki and Orochimaru said must have pissed her off. I haven't seen craters like that for decades. Shizun stood wide-eyed at the destruction before them. Hi, I haven't seen her this mad since those Yakuza tried to openly peek on her in the hot springs. Memories of his own run in with Tsunade at the hot springs made Jiraiya shudder involuntarily. Well, not much we can do standing around here. Let's get going. Right. The two shot through the hole in the wall, following the numerous areas where the landscape had been recently remodeled. They only slightly lost the trail a couple of times, which was easily remedied by walking over the crest of the next hill or standing on a large rock or tree nearby. Asterisk huff. Huff. Stop running you bastard. I'm going to make you into a stain on the grass. Tsunade yelled out in rage. Yeah that'll keep him in one spot. Naruto just rolled his eyes from his hiding spot behind a large boulder not too far away. Why Tsunade? You seem tired. Is old age finally starting to creep up on you? The hubby Sanin was forced to dodge again as a chakra-powered hammer fist was brought down where he once stood. If one of those even scrapes me it'll be game over. Before he had time to think further she was after him again. This time it was Kabuto who reacted as he took out a kunai and sliced his own hand right in front of Tsunade's face. As soon as the crimson liquid entered the woman's sight she collapsed in a heap. The hell, Naruto thought as he hadn't seen any actual attack. He continued to watch as Kabuto simply punted the slug princess away from the pair. Tisk, tisk, tisk Tsunade. Still afraid of a little blood. What kind of medic are you? Now I don't even have to lift a finger. Dot not that I can. Kabuto. Take care of her please. Orochimaru decided to take a front row seat in order to watch the show as Kabuto proceeded to hit and kick Tsunade around the plains. Shit. Hemophobia. Didn't expect that from a legendary medic. Come on Aero Senen. We could really use you here about now. If this keeps up much longer we're going to need a legendary medic for Tsunade. 
Aw oh, screw it. Naruto couldn't watch such a one-sided fight anymore, so he quietly made a dozen clones and ordered them to fan out. This wasn't the time for a rash charge. Kabuto was still an unknown, and for all they knew he could simply level the area and take them all out. Grabbing a few shuriken, he got ready to head into the fray just as Kabuto was kicking Tsunade in his direction. As soon as he deemed them close enough he launched his attack. Kanai, Shuriken and Sanban rained towards Kabuto and Orochimaru forcing them to back off as Naruto rushed in to grab Tsunade. It's that brat. Kabuto kill Tsunade now, Orochimaru ordered, to which his assistant readily obeyed. Kabuto dodged and weaved through the hail of steel as he made his way towards the, still downed, Sanin. He quickly made a chakra scalpel as he neared, but was denied his target when a new wave of shuriken came at him from directly in front. As if that weren't bad enough he had to deal with the extra effect of fighting against someone who had access to the leaf's more formidable jutsu. Shuriken cage bunshin no jutsu. It was a little risky but he had to do it. Naruto just prayed that Tsunade would stay down long enough for the attack to pass over her. It was a needless worry though as she was still frozen from the blood, some of which was now her own due to a busted lip and bleeding nose. As the attack passed over her, Naruto didn't waste a second. He grabbed her and slung her over a shoulder, not bothering to watch as Kabuto was forced to retreat and dodge the massive wall of bladed metal headed his way. The clones he had spaced out previously now went on the offensive as they rushed the two Odo Nin in order to give Naruto and his charge time to run. The Bunshin weren't really a match for Kabuto and only served as a minor annoyance to Orochimaru himself, but they served their purpose. When the two ninja looked up they were just in time to see their target's back disappear behind a hill leading back towards the town. He plans to meet up with Jiraiya. Quickly Kabuto, after them. The hubby Sanin ordered as the two bounded after the weighed down Genin. It didn't take them long to catch up due to his burden, but they also didn't like what they saw when they did. About an equal distance away from Naruto, and closing in, were Jiraiya and Shizune. Damn it. Kabuto. You will engage Shizune and Naruto-kun while I deal with Jiraiya. Tsunade should not be a threat so ignore her. Hi lord. Kabuto readied his chakra scalpels once again and prepared to charge while Orochimaru caught Jiraiya's eye and moved in from the opposite side. Due to the old pervert's current limitation, he and Shizune were a little slower in their approach, causing all parties to meet at the same time. Shit. 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 Naruto was running as hard as he could towards the only friendly people in the field as he listened to Kabuto getting closer. He saw Shizune step to her left and grab something under her sleeve indicating she was ready to attack, so he made a break for her since his sensei seemed to be preoccupied with the more dangerous opponent. Breaking to her right he saw her raise her arm out of the corner of his eye, revealing a Sanban launcher not unlike the one he had given to Kurenai. He couldn't watch the actual attack though as he bolted past and made some distance between himself and the battle. Satisfied that they were, for the most part, out of danger he set Tsunade down behind some rocks to give her at least some protection. Now is not the time for your fears to be acting up Heim. Get a hold of yourself. Whack he smacked the dazed Sanin across the face, but she made no move to retaliate. Instead she just lolled her head back into position until she was staring at the blood on her hands. Naruto growled in frustration until a yelp of surprise brought his attention back to the fight. Shizune had just taken a hit from Kabuto and she was now holding her stomach the same way she had been that morning. Fine. You stay here and cry about a little bit of liquid and I'll go save the ass of your precious apprentice, okay? He got no response, but he hadn't expected one either. Shizune was having a rather difficult time in her fight. She had to give her opponent credit though, his fighting as a med nin was top notch and he threw in some nasty kicks. The most recent attack had hit her in the small intestine, just below the stomach, and it definitely didn't feel like a massage. Even in glancing it was going to leave a bruise. She saw that he wasn't going to give her a chance to recuperate though as he renewed his assault. It wasn't that she wasn't good at fighting but she was worried about her sensei and friend. When she'd seen Naruto rushing towards them with her on his back she feared the worst, but when she saw Orochimaru and his henchmen pursuing it allowed her a little relief. After all, why would they pursue Naruto if Tsunade was already taken care of? 
She was dashed from her thoughts as someone landed beside her and made a slash at Kabuto only for the boy to back away. Shizun, you could have told us Tsunade has hemophobia. It was bad enough that they knew, but it almost cost her, her life. Naruto scolded as he sized up their opponent. You're Yakushi Kabuto from the Chunin exams. I see you're finally showing your true colors, traitor. I'm hurt Naruto-kun. I'm not a traitor. After all, I was never actually loyal to that weak village you come from. Orochimaru-sama has been my lord for a long time. Tish. As if it makes a difference now. Your master failed and was forced to run away with his tail between his legs, and now he can't even bribe one woman into healing his ruined arms. You know, if you had just offered her money instead of some twisted resurrection, she probably would have been putty in your hands by now. Instead you chose a sick perversion that will cost you your lives. Kabuto didn't take the bait. He remained as calm as ever, his smile creeping them out a bit as he readied himself to strike. Well if I'm going to die now, I would really hate for it to be of old age. Further charging his scalpels he rushed the two to engage. Naruto sheathed his ninja to as it would do little against a completely chakra-based weapon. Instead he opted for ninjutsu as he flew through hand seals. Futon. Soyokes. A gentle breeze seemed to wash over the area putting the gray-haired youth on guard for anything. Kabuto started to laugh a bit as the breeze ruffled his hair. Is that all Naruto-kun? Your attacks were more impressive during the exams. He continued his attack as though nothing were wrong as Naruto began a new set of seals, and Shizun prepared to attack with her own scalpels if he got too close. Naruto finished his seals with Tiger. Ninpo. Ensho. It was a combo technique of Kaden along with the futon that was already in place and its effects were immediate. The soft breeze surrounding Kabuto turned into a sweltering sauna as beads of sweat began to form and drip off his face. They watch as he began to pant from the new exertion it was taking him to move, but he was still able to function. To prove that point he charged once again, this time aiming for Naruto as he was now deemed the larger threat. I suppose I shouldn't have underestimated you after watching you fight, Naruto-kun, but this little bit of heat will not deter me from completing Orochimaru-sama's goals. His attack was once again thwarted as Shizun showed up in his path, slicing her arm down. He jumped to the side of the attack and landed his own on her forearm, cutting some of the muscle and making her wince from the pain. The small distraction was enough for him to land a kick to her ribs, causing her to roll out of his way. Seeing he was open to attack now, Naruto turned to different tactics. Bringing his ninja to back out, he now hoped that his kenjutsu was better than Kabuto's taijutsu or he would be in for a whole lot of pain. There was little time to think on such things though as his opponent rushed right to him and took a swing. He was able to dodge the fast strike, barely, and now knew that this had disaster written all over it. He couldn't block the scalpel for fear of his own blade being cut in two and attacking would result in the same if Kabuto blocked his strikes. He could run chakra through the weapon to even the field a bit but if Kabuto had more control over him then it would make little difference, and considering he had never pushed chakra through a normal weapon before it was pretty much guaranteed that his control over the technique would be shoddy at best. All he could hope for would be to dodge until Kabuto gave him a glaring opening. Unfortunately for Naruto, he gave that opening first and Kabuto seized it. With a double palm thrust Naruto was thrown backwards into a rock, hitting it hard enough to make an audible smacking sound. Had that been a normal attack he might have been able to push the pain aside and hop right back up, but Kabuto still had his scalpels active and as such he had cut through some of the muscle in the blonde's chest. Naruto groaned as he sat up, then immediately tossed to the side and coughed up a mouthful of blood. Jiraiya wasn't faring much better. Sure he had the advantage of having all of his limbs mobile, but they might as well have been useless for all the chakra control he had at the moment. Since neither could use jutsu to any real effect, they settled on a taijutsu match. The problem in that was that Orochimaru was always the better of the two at hand-to-hand -hand combat. Even with his arms swinging around uselessly he was able to fend off Jiraiya's attacks with ease though he still managed a scrape or two. Come Jiraiya-kun. You know it's pointless to play these games so how about stepping it up a notch? With a retching motion Orochimaru brought up his kusanagi while Jiraiya made some distance. So from taijutsu to kenjutsu. That isn't much a change up tem. The hermit looked warily at the blade. 
He knew all too well the power it possessed. One wrong move and he'd be right alongside his sensei. Oh I'm sure you would just love to go into ninjutsu, but with your chakra all messed up that isn't really an option now is it? The snake Sanin laughed at his foe's obvious discomfort. Oh come now Jiraiya-kun, you didn't really think I couldn't sense that did you? Your chakra is fluctuating like Tsunade's temper. I'd be surprised if you could even cast a decent D rank right now. The Otokage's taunts ran Jiraiya's patience thin, but he managed to keep a level head. There's more than one way to skin a snake, and I plan on showing you all of them, traitor. Diving into his own pouch he dug out a couple kunai. They wouldn't do anything against the legendary blade, but it was a far cry better than trying to stop the thing with his bare hands. He managed a meager guard against Orochimaru's first strike and was able to push it away as he stepped in closer. Dodging the second strike he swung his left arm, but his own attack was blocked as the tongue holding the kusanagi wrapped around his wrist. The elongated muscle jerked him off his feet and threw him into a boulder away from his attacker. With Jiraiya temporarily dealt with the snake checked on the other fight going on. He watched with glee as Kabuto's strike hit and the Jinchuriki was thrown back. When the teen was almost on him again he saw Shizun charge in to intervene. He was about to do the same, but a strong kick to his head proved that he had other matters to deal with. Well, attacking when my attention was elsewhere. You surprise me Jiraiya, I thought you were a little more noble than that. We haven't seen each other in decades freak. Things change. Next time it'll be a kanai instead of my foot, so keep your attention off my apprentice. So it is true then. You made Naruto-kun your little follower. I admit the boy is surprisingly intelligent, which makes me wonder why he'd agree to learn from an oaf like you. Well unfortunately we can't all have secondary reasons for attracting little boys to our causes. Some of us actually want to teach them rather than enslave them. My, my, you assume much Jiraiya-kun. Immortality does have its downsides you know, but you needn't know about those since it isn't a path someone like you would follow. No, you will wither and die one day while I will be around forever. Don't worry though, I'll make a nice little memorial for you to go along with all the other insignificant bugs that I've crushed along with Sensei and Tsunade. That was enough for the Toad Sage as he rushed in once again until metal met metal in a shower of sparks. The Kusanagi easily cut through one kanai, but with its lost momentum it was blocked and turned aside by the second, which in turn was followed up by the broken blade being tossed into Orochimaru's face as Jiraiya once again made some distance while digging out another kanai. The broken kanai he had thrown bounced harmlessly off his opponent's face before the man realized there was a sizzling tag on its handle. Unfortunately he noticed it with enough time to leap away and put up a hasty guard, keeping the damage to a minimum. You're just full of tricks today Jiraiya-kun. I'm going to enjoy watching them all fail fruitlessly. The man just growled back as he brandished his new kanai and got ready for another assault. Kabuto started to advance on the injured Naruto but was blocked as a black blur shot in front of his target. As soon as she appeared, Shizun grabbed Naruto and shot a couple Sanban at their opponent. It didn't do as much as she'd hoped it would since he easily sidestepped them all but at least it kept him from moving forward before she could jump away with Naruto. She wouldn't have much time with Kabuto on their heels, but she managed to start her diagnostics jutsu, but when she went to start looking over Naruto she found her charge no longer in her arms. She almost screamed as she looked back and realized that no one was following her either. Jumping on top of the closest rock she soon found out exactly what happened. Naruto was able to see behind Shizun when she picked him up. He watched as Kabuto shot towards the side instead of following them and instantly knew what he was planning. Since the medic was too busy starting her jutsu he simply slipped out of her grip and went after the older teen, cutting him off before he could round the next boulder with a solid kick to the ribs. He could feel a couple crack under the pressure and grinned as Kabuto went skidding back the way he came. He had a problem though. His muscles were still torn and the pain made it difficult to breath. Sweating from the exertion he just put on himself he was forced to take a knee as his target was getting back to his feet. I admit I'm surprised Naruto-kun. Not many could bear the pain of such damage. Yet here you are, not only taking the pain so well but also able to attack back. Though I must admit you looked a bit winded. 
The team's voice was jeering and matched his smile as a glowing hand went to his side to fix the damage that had been done. Yeah well, when you live a life, like mine, pain is pretty much your closest friend. The blonde struggled to his feet again as he got ready for anything. He was already in bad shape, but he could push through this pain. He'd done it before, many times. Kabuto charged him again, but again was interrupted when Shizune appeared in front of him. Naruto what were you thinking? You can't fight like that. She watched out of the corner of her eye as the boy next to her slumped a bit before readjusting his stance and straightening back up. And if I had let him go he would have killed Tsunade and the old man wouldn't get healed. Fuck that. I'm not risking the life of the first person who protected me just so I can have a more comfortable fight. He spat out another globule of blood off to the side as he glared at the gray-haired youth before them. As if an unheard command hit them, the two boys flew at each other and started to exchange blows. Kabuto, with his chakra scalpels active, slashed and stabbed at his foe as he tried to do as much damage as possible. Still under the effects of the boy's jutsu though, he was quickly beginning to tire. His clothes were already soaked with sweat and his glasses had steam and water droplets obscuring his vision. Still he was able to fight and push the blonde. Naruto on the other hand was only constrained by pain, and that was something he could deal with even though it was a bit distracting. His main goal at this point was to not let the cutting chakra on his opponent's hands touch any part of his body. His best bet at doing that was to block the older boy at the wrists or forearms, the fact that Kabuto had longer arms made it a little easier once he got in close. Even with his above average taijutsu though, he still managed to get hit a few times. He now sported a few cuts along his own forearms as well as more muscles torn in his lower left ribcage and right calf. The latter was a surprising strike and had made him stumble enough to give Kabuto a wide opening on his heart. Seeing the opening the older teen shot a hand forward with the intent on completely incapacitating his opponent, but to his aggravation, or pleasure depending on how you look at it, he found himself cutting into a female's chest instead. A loud, high-pitched scream was heard as his victim felt the pain rip through her before she collapsed. Taking a moment to consider the situation, Kabuto stepped back and admired his handiwork. It appeared that Tsunade's apprentice, seeing his intent, had stepped into the strike and took the deadly blow for the boy. Of course because she wasn't lined up exactly the same way due to their size difference and general positioning, the hit ended up in a non-lethal area, as long as she got healed soon. With the blood dropping from her torn clothing though, and the only readily available medic having hemophobia, it wasn't likely that she would live past the day. Shizun. Naruto caught the woman as she fell so she wouldn't take more damage. He looked into her eyes in confusion. Why? Shizun coughed up a little of her own blood before answering. Because. Dot you remind me so much of. Dan. I just. Dot saw him in you. Dot and couldn't stop. She winced as the pain got to be too much. Naruto made two clones and handed the girl off to them. They simply nodded and headed over towards where Tsunade was most likely still curled up in a ball. It was a long shot, but it would be the only hope the girl had. When the clones were out of sight amongst the rocks he took a deep breath, once again pushing the pain aside easily since it was lessened at this point thanks to his own healing, before settling his gaze on Kabuto. I may have only known Shizune for a little while, but she is one of the few who has never acted cold towards me. You'll pay for what you did to her asshole. He created another four clones as he took his stance again, waving the ever-confident Kabuto to him. Tisk. Tisk Naruto-kun. You should have taken the momentary reprieve to rest yourself. I'm sure your injuries could have used the break. It doesn't matter either way though. Kabuto charged in, intent on taking the boy out of the fight for good. What he got was another look at Naruto's jutsu repertoire. Sweden. Tepidama. Three water bullets shot from Naruto's mouth and headed for Kabuto. One straight for him and one towards his sides, forcing him into the air to avoid the barrage. Sweden. Tepidama. The older teen looked up, shocked at his opponent's repeated attack. Now that he was in the air it would be extremely difficult to dodge the same attack. Seeing five water orbs headed his way this time he quickly formed his chakra scalpels to slice through them. There were too many though and the fourth one hit his dead center making him fly away from the blonde, but at least causing the last bullet to miss. 
Naruto wasted no time and rushed over to where his clones had taken Shizune to check her situation. Tsunade was still on her knees, staring at the blood on her hands and shaking when Naruto's clones arrived with Shizune. She barely registered the thump of the other woman's body hitting the ground in front of her, a fact that greatly annoyed the boy. Hey boss san time to get to work. Shizune san needs you now so snap out of it. The only reaction he got in return was her blinking. Quote dot dot dot. Oi. I said your apprentice is hurt. If you don't help her now she might die. Still no reaction. He looked worriedly between the sanin and her charge before nodding his head in determination. Smack. The slug princess blinked in surprise, wondering why her cheek suddenly stung so much. She dazedly turned her head to see a furious-looking Naruto staring at her. His mouth was moving, but she couldn't hear what he was saying. She saw him frantically pointing at something on the ground nearby so she turned her head that way. What was laying there? A ninja, it seemed so familiar. A female with short, dark hair and black clothes. Where had she seen this person? Flashbacks of her travels came to her with vision of a little girl turning into a woman standing next to her, her apprentice. Shizune. Suddenly the idea of blood didn't seem so bad now that another precious person to her looked to be in pain. She turned to one of the clones and glared at him. What the hell did you do to her? She demanded. She got injured fighting the ninja that you ran away from, and if you don't do something fast she's going to be nothing but a pile of cells. His retort earned him a punch in the face and a return to oblivion as Tsunade unleashed her rage on him. How dare you even insinuate it's my fault. Get out of here before I take you out too. She yelled at the other clone as she turned to her downed apprentice, quickly running through diagnostics to figure out what was wrong. She was hit by a chakra blade. I don't know how bad it is, but it should be the only hit she took. If you concentrate where the... The clone never finished as he was kicked out of existence as well. Who the hell is the legendary medic here? I don't healing advice from a runt like you. The Sanin growled out as she got to work on the injured area. She was too proud to admit that she had been so flustered that she was completely skipping the possible mortal wound in favor of doing a full scan of the woman. I won't let another one die. Not this time. She became so focused on her work that she never noticed the figure creeping up behind her. Kabuto was blown right into the fight between Jiraiya and Orochimaru as they met at another standstill. The two Sanin were rather shocked at the sudden appearance, but for Orochimaru this turned out to be just what he needed to end the stalemate. He jumped over to the recovering teen and helped him up by yanking him off the ground with a tongue wrapped around his neck. Kabuto-kun, how nice of you to join us. Judging by your manner of entry I would say that you are having a bit of trouble with your fight. Apologies Orochimaru-sama. They managed to catch me off guard. It won't happen again. Before he could run off again he was stopped by a slight spike of killing intent. Now Kabuto-kun, how could you leave without giving me a present? Orochimaru made his intentions known as he held out one of his arms. Getting the idea, Kabuto pushed up the sleeve of his master's shirt revealing a black snake tattoo. With an apology he went through hand seals for his master and assisted him in summoning two large snakes to their aid. Hissing was as far as the two giants got though. Doden. Yomi Numa. Jiraiya was able to capture them in his swamp, but only partially as the technique stopped when his chakra control dipped too low. Shit, Tsunade couldn't have picked a worse time to think she knew what was best. Jiraiya assessed the damage done. While the snakes could still move their heads, they were going to be held stationary in the mire until the chakra sustaining what was there dissipated. Running through his seals he tried his own summoning. Kuchio's no jutsu. His own summoning was noticeably smaller and made the man curse his old crush once again. Jiraiya. The summoned toad looked at his summoner then to his most likely opponent. Quote dot dot dot. I don't mean to sound pessimistic, but I don't think I was the best choice for this one. The hermit just sweat dropped. Yeah, no kidding. Look Tsunade screwed up my chakra so instead of getting Gamabunta I got you. I don't expect you to fight it, it can't move right now anyway. I may need your help though once Orochimaru comes back down, at least with his assistant. We just need to bide our time until I have enough control back to summon Gamabunta. Think you can handle that? The toad spat on the ground in disgust at hearing the rogue Sanin's name. I should be able to hold them off for a bit, 
but if it's that man's apprentice I don't know how long I'll be able to last. Just try your best and... Oh. Shit. Jiraiya ducked for cover as Orochimaru swung under the giant snake's neck by his tongue. Had he realized that the traitor wasn't aiming for him he may have tossed an attack, but now it was too late and he could only watch as the pendulum neared the peak of its arch and the shape at the end flew off in the direction where Tsunade was at. For all he knew the woman could still be freaking out and he couldn't count out that both of their students were injured, though based on Kabuto's entry to the scene at least one of them had to still be alive. Even if they weren't hurt though, they would be no match for the traitor. Gama. Let's go. Sorry Jiraiya. A little busy here. Jiraiya looked over to see the toad currently in battle with Kabuto. Little punk wanted to take our backs. Kabuto pressed his kanai harder into the amphibian's armored bracer as he grinned. I can't let you interfere with Orochimaru-sama's plans. Too bad kid. Go Jiraiya. With a heave Gama pushed Kabuto's blade back and gave him a swift kick in the stomach sending him tumbling backwards. Thanks Gama. Fight defensive. The toad just croaked in response letting the Sani know that the time for words was over. Not looking back, he jumped to the nearest boulder and bounded across the plains towards his goal. Shizun was starting to stabilize and was thankfully out of danger for now. She still had a lot of work to do though to make sure there wouldn't be any lasting damage. Tsunade was so intent on healing her apprentice that she never noticed the person behind her until they were standing in front of them and she heard a loud clang of metal. Looking up from her work she found herself staring at the back of a blonde head. The shaking of the body told her that whoever the person was up against was giving him a rather difficult time. Peering around the body she laid her eyes upon another person who made her snarl. Before man or boy could get the upper hand, the choice was made for them. Naruto was harshly thrown sideways into a nearby boulder. His scream of pain was completely ignored by his assaulter though while Orochimaru simply grinned evilly at his original target. Why Tsunade Haim, it seems that you've overcome your fear of blood somewhat. Such a pity, I guess this may be a challenge after all. Inside he was seething a bit for multiple reasons. First was that he had planned on using the woman's weaknesses to get the better of her. Then there was his other former teammate showing up and neutralizing his summon, though only partially. Finally there was the little blonde brat. The same brat that had helped the Hokage during the invasion had now cost him a free healing of his arms. Not only that but he stopped another easy kill on his blonde teammate. What was the little hero going to come up with next? Sorry to disappoint, but nobody, and I mean nobody hurts my precious people and gets away with it. And yet you just smacked the kid into a rock. Tsunade looked over to where Naruto was starting to shakily get to his feet and sneered. It's his fault I have to go back to that detestable village. He deserves at least that much. My, my, such a harsh attitude for a princess don't you think? That's okay though. After all if I can't exploit one weakness. Orochimaru hefted his kusanagi with his tongue, making Tsunade get ready to dodge or defend the strike. Quote dot dot dot. I'll just have to exploit another. With a dash and a thrust he aimed straight for the woman, who easily dodged out of the way. Too easily in fact. She watched him streak past, not even turning around, making his target obvious. Shizun. Tsunade was too slow to react though and the blade came down, hitting metal once again. For the second time Naruto stood between her ex-teammate and his target. This time he held a black blade against the legendary Kusanagi, but despite the Sanin's sword's fame it seemed to do little against the katana. I just had to ask. Orochimaru cursed to himself. His famed blade was stopped again by this brat, but truth be told the blade that blocked it intrigued him. Despite his desire to learn about the curious weapon though, his desire to get it out of the way was far stronger and he channeled chakra into his own sword in order to sharpen the edge and cut through both his opponent's weapon and his opponent. To his surprise though, the more chakra he put into his blade, the stronger the resistance against it became. Soon it was too much and he was beginning to be pushed back. Impossible. Overpowered by a kid. Sneering at the way the events were unfolding he swiped his sword away, causing Naruto to lose balance for a second. That was all the time the Sani needed as he planted a swift kick in the boy's side, sending him into yet another boulder. With his opposition removed, Orochimaru made another stab at the unconscious girl on the ground. 
Once again a shape came in front of him, but this time he did see blood, and it brought a smile to his face. He grinned even more when she lifted her head and showed him her pained scowl. Why Sunade Haim? I didn't think you had it in you to bleed for someone else. Why it's almost like something sensei would do. Of course he, unfortunately, lived through his ordeal so you're not exactly like him because I'm going to kill you now. He pulled his sword from her chest and tried to make a swing for her head, but was denied the final contact as she ducked. I told you nobody hurts my precious people. She stepped in quickly and punched his pale body away, sending his blade a short distance further, before dropping to her knees. I didn't think he hit that close. I I can't fight him like this. Tsunade looked over to the woman who became like her own daughter, though she had never told her that. She swiveled her gaze over to the blonde who was slumped on the ground nearby. And it looks like he's not going to save the day again. That actually hurt Haim, but it seems like that nasty gash is sapping your strength quickly. With this kind of performance even a Haruno could beat you. He saw the confusion cross her face at the jab. A really weak ninja from Konoha. I'd love to tell you about it sometime, but I have a schedule to keep. He casually moved over to his discarded weapon to pick it up but had to stop as two words reached his ears and nearly froze his blood. Ninpo. Sozo Sei. He looked behind him and saw Tsunade's chest wound healing before his eyes along with the small abrasions she had acquired during their previous engagement. Nearly gaping at the technique's power he almost missed her charging towards him. Even reacting at the last minute cost him his sword as he was forced to dodge or become one with the ground. Coo coo coo. What an intriguing technique. I can't imagine how useful it could be. Mind telling me about it? How about you learn it from Shinigami-sama on your way to Hell Bastard? Tsunade jumped high in the air, but it was nothing he hadn't seen from their run to this location from the town so he easily dodged out of the way. This fight wasn't in her favor as long as he could dodge and she knew that. Need some help Haim. Jiraiya landed next to the blonde as she let out a relieved sigh. Something troublesome has appeared. Orochimaru grimaced. This fight was quickly moving away from his favor. That changed slightly when his own help showed up. Kabuto. I would have thought you could keep Jiraiya occupied a little longer. Apologies Orochimaru-sama. Though his summon was easily dealt with, it gave him an opening to retreat. The teen handed his master the Kusanagi once again allowing the man to swallow it into himself. No matter. It seems we will need to pull out all the stops. Do it. With only minor concern, Kabuto began the summoning ritual once again. Seeing the action taking place Tsunade jumped back towards Shizune and began her own summoning while Jiraiya followed suit, taking a look around frantically before necessity overcame his worries and he joined in the three-way test of sealing speed. Kuchio's no jutsu. The three shouted. Jiraiya finally having decent enough control over his chakra, was standing on Gamabunta. Jiraiya, what's going on? The toad boss looked around and saw the slug to his left and the snake to his right. One of them he openly sneered at, though his attitude was more towards its summoner. Orochimaru, so we've caught up to him again. I can't say I'm happy to see Manda either, but I am surprised to see Katsuyu here. Finally found Tsunade A. Eh? Sorry Bunta. No time for small talk. We're in a fight here. The toad put a ready foot on his weapon as he prepared for the fight. The wife was bugging me about a snake skin purse anyway. To their left stood Tsunade on the head of the leader of the slug summons, Katsuyu. Beside the Sanin laid Shizun, still partially suffering from her injuries. Tsunade Haim. It has been a while since you called upon me. I had been living a peaceful life until lately. It seems that Trouble likes to seek me out though. Take Shizun to safety please. I don't want her caught in the crossfire. Understood. Out of the slugs back another slug formed under the younger medic, a miniature version of its creator. I will take her back to the town Heim. Not waiting for an acknowledgement, the small slug dove off and made its way out of the battlefield. Tsunade. Where's Naruto? I didn't see him before we summoned. Jiraiya shouted to her concern for his student evident in his voice. Who knows? Maybe this will teach him to stay the hell out of the way next time. She scowled at the man. It was their fault this whole situation got so screwed up. If they would have all just left her alone she wouldn't be in this whole mess and Shizun wouldn't have gotten hurt. 
Orochimaru and Kabuto stood atop the head of the large, purple, snake boss summon Manda. The reptile did its best to look at the detestable man on his head. Orochimaru, how dare you summon me to such a place? I don't want to be involved in your petty battles. I should eat you for even thinking of summoning me. Manda-sama, please don't say such things. We merely required your help in dealing with some troublesome opponents. We will give you 100 sacrifices for assisting us. Kabuto tried to be as polite as possible in the face of the summon. You dare speak to me whelp. I demand 200 sacrifices just for allowing you to keep your miserable existence. Manda sounded furious and Kabuto wisely backed away. You will get your sacrifices Manda, now kill them. Orochimaru hissed out, not really caring either way so long as he got what he wanted, and right now he wanted both of his old teammates dead. Katsuyu. Right. Zeshi Nensen. The slug spouted a geyser of green acid at the snake forcing it to dodge. By the aftermath of the attack it seemed the action was well founded as the landscape where the gel hit began to melt away. In retaliation, Manda slithered over to the mobile toxic factory and wrapped himself around, squeezing hard. Gamabunta tried to take the opening with a sword swing, but his weapon was grabbed away by the serpent's mouth, who then turned it on his captive. Katsuyu. Katsuyu Debunritsu. Just as the tip of the blade was going to drive into her, Katsuyu split into countless small slugs and simply dissolved out of the snake's grasp. Looking around, Orochimaru got a bad feeling. His suspicion was proven true as he saw Tsunade running up Manda's back right towards his perch. Kabuto was forced to abandon the fight quickly as a stray foot nearly took off his head. Meanwhile the two Sanin engaged in a fierce taijutsu battle until Tsunade went for a strong axe kick. While she didn't hit her intended target, she did come into contact with the summon's head, forcing it to drop the blade in its mouth. Orochimaru hissed at the lost advantage, but managed to whip his tongue into Tsunade to unbalance her before kicking her away. Katsuyu partially formed under her, giving a softer landing than she would have otherwise had. Thanks Katsuyu. Be more careful please, Haim. They had little time to converse further as they heard Jiraiya calling out his own jutsu. Tsunade. Stay back. Kaden. Gamayu Enden. As Gamabunta spat a stream of oil at the coiled manda, Jiraiya lit it on fire causing an inferno to engulf the snake. Did we get him? Gamabunta and Jiraiya both waited for the flames to clear a bit to get a look at their target. No, that's, the toad summoner never got to finish as the ground started to tremble and earth spewed up in front of them as something headed straight towards them. Bunta. Underground. What? As quickly as he could the giant toad reached out and grabbed the thing that came out of the ground that was trying to impale the duo. While he successfully stopped the purple end of the great snake's tail, the ground behind them erupted and the head of the serpent came shooting right for them. A shadow passed overhead as Tsunade attempted to strike Orochimaru's summon with Gamabunta's discarded blade. So tired. No. I can make it. I won't let him get away unpunished. Bringing the giant knife forward, she aimed to impale the snake, but looked on in horror as she realized her timing was off. The blade would impale her target, but not before it would be able to sink its teeth into the preoccupied duo. She closed her eyes and prayed for a miracle. Kuchios. Kusamano no Gyofu. Another huge cloud of smoke puffed up, surprising all three Sanin as it shot out right amidst the chaos. Unable to stop her path, Tsunade plunged into the cloud hoping that she wouldn't hit a potential ally. As the wind picked up and the scene became visible to the three and their summons, there were many mixed feelings. Rage, appreciation, relief and astonishment were among the expressions crossing their faces as they saw a new toad with its weapon pinning the snake's neck to the ground. The new toad kept its shield on its back while it held a spiny sasumata against Manda. The spikes on the weapon's twin prongs served to keep the snake just out of reach of Gamabunta while the sword of its leader was shown to have pierced the snout of the serpent. Gamakan. Gamabunta and Jiraiya both looked a little shocked at the new arrival. I'm thankful for your aid, but. Dot how did you get here? The boss toad asked. Dunno. Ask the kid, when he wakes up. Their eyes were drawn to his head as they made out a small shape between his eyes. Jiraiya's eyes widened at who he saw. It was obviously Naruto, the yellow hair being a dead giveaway, but he had definitely seen better days. 
One arm was cocked at an odd angle while the opposite leg was bleeding through the torn cloth of his pants. More blood ran from his forehead and mouth as his determined eyes started to close. Naruto. Good thing he was in a good spot, I can't stay anymore. Good luck. With another poof of smoke, Gamakan was gone again, leaving Naruto to plummet to the ground. Having seen him starting to go unconscious, Jiraiya was already there to grab him before he hit. Naruto. Come on, stay with me. Jiraiya frantically checked over what he could of Naruto's injuries as he set the boy down. Tsunade get down here and help him. I'll deal with Orochimaru. Ignoring the two, Tsunade set her focus on her other teammate. Orochimaru. Her voice was cold as she glanced down at the seething man. Orochimaru. I would eat you for getting me into this mess, but I can't do that with this hole in my mouth. Pray you never need to summon me again, because if you dare to I will eat you. Seeing himself unable to move any longer, Manda dismissed himself in order to heal. It wouldn't do for him to die this day. This is not good. With Manda now out of the picture, the Otokage looked between his two teammates with a little apprehension, then smirked at what he saw. It seemed their teamwork was not up to par anymore. With that idiot too concerned about the kid it'll at least only be one on one. Looking back at the female blonde his smirk grew into a grin. And she's lost a lot of chakra. Without any more hesitation he shot his tongue out and had it wrapped around her throat. Dai Tsunade. With the slimy muscle wrapped around her neck the blonde was struggling to free herself. She was choking and needed air, but she stayed clam and was able to work her hands under the offending flesh in order to push it away and slip out. Holding tightly onto the tongue she gritted her teeth and let out a roar as she yanked Orochimaru to her. It took all of a second for him to cover the distance and get rewarded with a punch to the face that sent him shooting back the way he came only to be tugged up again. She released a new assault on him in a flurry of kicks and punches, taking him on a guided tour of the surrounding area and accentuating each new landmark she made with the sound of flesh on flesh. With one last punch she launched her victim across the field and into the blade that remained where Manda was once pinned. Gamabunta wanted to finish this fight once and for all but he himself was too low on chakra to even move while Katsuyu was too low to even reform herself completely. We're sorry you too, but this is the end of our fight as well. In a huge burst of smoke the last two summons disappeared, leaving the surrounding area covered in a haze for a few minutes. As soon as the haze cleared from their vision, Tsunade and Jiraiya both had to grit their teeth in anger. Across from them stood Orochimaru, obviously battered but still alive. Beside him crouched his henchman Kabuto who was healing him as well as he could through his own pain and lack of chakra. It seems that taking you both on at once is, admittedly, a little beyond my capabilities with my arms like this. Don't worry though, I'll make sure our next reunion is even more heartfelt than this one. Next time it will just be the three of us, without any interruptions. His yellow, slitted eyes shot to Naruto before he and Kabuto began to disappear. Next time I will make sure there are no interruptions. With that last statement their former teammate was gone and they just stared at the spot where he once stood, seething in anger. A groan snapped them out of their dazes as Naruto shifted on the ground at Jiraiya's feet. Tsunade. A little help over here. He shouted out as he once again went over the boy's injuries, not liking what he saw at all. To his dismay, Tsunade let out a snort and turned away. He shouldn't have been here in the first place. Serves him right to be hurt. Jiraiya just looked at her. Shocked that she would even suggest just letting him be. That shock soon turned to anger though. Tsunade he saved the life of your apprentice. He saved my life and he even saved your life. Don't you think he deserves some healing? If you want to give him healing, Jiraiya, then go find a hospital. I never asked him to help me. He was the idiot that decided to try to take on a Sanin and a Jonin level ninja as a Genin. Honestly does Konoha only breed morons now? Now, if you don't mind I have an apprentice to look after. Tsunade simply started to walk off. Tsunade you have no idea what this kid's been through. Give him a chance and maybe he'll surprise you just like he did with everyone else. I've given enough chances to people in my life hermit. Don't you dare tell me who I should or should not give another one to. Before hearing another word she sped away back towards town, ignoring the sounds of shouting behind her. Shit. Well kid, 
I hope you're not hurt as bad as you look. Jiraiya glanced back between the blonde's arm and leg as he gave an involuntary shiver. Hey anyway, let's get you back to town. I can't help you out here with no supplies. He picked the boy up carefully, trying to ignore the pained groans as he rushed back towards the town as well. Because he had to be careful with his burden, Jiraiya didn't make it back to the town until later that afternoon. He was able to find a doctor in a few minutes and left Naruto in the man's hands as he went back to the hotel where they were staying. Reaching their room he quickly packed before heading over to where Tsunade and Shizune were staying. Knocking a couple times he waited until Shizune opened the door for him, wincing a bit from her sore muscles. Jiraiya-sama. W we didn't expect to see you here. Yeah well, we're all just full of surprises today it seems. Where's Tsunade? Quote dot 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 quote. Shizune. She's packing. The girl flinched at the scowl the man gave her as he shoved his way past. J. Jiraiya-sama. Wait. Tsunade. Jiraiya went into the bedroom area without hesitation and found Tsunade there grabbing clothes and sealing them away. Her rough handling making it clear that she was in a very bad mood. Had this been any other time the Toad Sage would have hightailed it away from there, but at the moment his foul mood easily matched, if not surpassed, her own. Tsunade what in the hell do you think you're doing? I'm leaving this place what's it look like? And what about Sensei? What about him? Tsunade you said you were going to go back and heal him. Do you really think that I'm going to go back to that place after all this? You're a fool Jiraiya. She got up and stood in front of him, glaring as if daring him to make her leave. He wouldn't let her down. Slap Shizune stood wide-eyed with her hand covering her mouth while Tsunade covered her reddened cheek in shock. I'm the fool. I. Am the fool. Fine. But then you're the cold-hearted cowardly bitch. You won't even save the kid who's the reason we're all still standing here right now. Shizune looked back and forth between the two in disbelief. She knew all about their past, having been there for more than a few interactions between the two, but never had Jiraiya struck Tsunade no matter how bad their arguments got. More than that though, she was surprised that Tsunade had refused to heal someone. Tsunade-sama, what is he talking about? The Sanin glared at each other before she spoke. Nothing Shizun. Get your stuff, we're leaving. I'm talking about how she blatantly refused to heal Naruto after he saved you, then defended Tsunade until she woke up enough to fight, then saved me when Manda was about to eat me. Tsunade you've changed too much. Dan and Nawaki would be rolling in their graves if they could see you now. Tsunade was about to slap him, but her hand was stopped mid-strike. She looked over into Shizun's pleading eyes. Please. Tsunade-sama, you didn't really do that did you? I mean you wouldn't just leave Naruto-kun like that would you? You bet she would. I had to carry him back here and hand him off to a common doctor to get his leg and arm fixed. Who knows what else could be wrong? For all I know he could have been pinned under one of our summons since Tsunade wouldn't tell me where he was. Shizune shrunk back from her mentor as if she were suddenly a stranger. He's lying right Tsunade-sama. He has to be lying. All the answer she got was Tsunade turning her back towards her to continue her packing. She wanted to cry out. Sure the woman had her quirks, but to deny someone their health because she held a childish grudge was taking things a bit far. Quote dot dot dot. Jiraiya-sama. Where is Naruto? While still glaring at his teammate Jiraiya answered her. Quote dot dot dot. Two blocks down. Take a left and go another three. You'll see the red cross outside. He listened as she strode towards the door. Shizune. Where are you going? Tsunade demanded as she scowled at the girl. I'm sorry Tsunade-sama, but I'm going to do my job. I'm not going to leave an innocent in pain if I can help it, just like you taught me. Before Tsunade could retort she slammed the door behind her. Thank you Shizune. Jiraiya closed his eyes for a second in relief then reopened them in a steely gaze towards the one other occupant of the room. At least one of you remembers your vows as a medic. Maybe it's time the master becomes the apprentice. Not bothering to let her reply, he shun shined away, leaving Tsunade to wring out a shirt as she tried to relieve her anger. Damn you Jiraiya, you want to twist people around your finger. Well two can play that little game. You want me back in Konoha. Fine, I'll play that one too. We'll see who's following who around soon enough. 
he sat in the waiting room, playing with some of the kids as he waited for news on his student. Thinking over his latest conversation with Tsunade, he wondered if she really would accept the position of being Hokage, and if she did, would she be the right one? Suddenly her wasn't so keen on his decision to not take the position himself. Had he done so he wouldn't have been able to train Naruto to protect himself from the dangers he faced from Akatsuki and possibly Iwa as well, but on the other hand not taking the position left him wide open to his enemies inside Konoha and if Tsunade decided to back them in their plans there would be little he could do. Sighing, he sat back in his chair and closed his eyes for a moment to try to gather his frantic thoughts. At least Shizune had a level head. When she left her mentor behind at the hotel she wasn't sure if she'd done the right thing or not. Jiraiya could have easily been exaggerating Naruto's wounds after all and just been mad since Tsunade refused to heal him on the field. She had almost turned back when she saw the doctor's office and decided a quick check wouldn't hurt at that point. One look at the blonde's bandaged and patched form proved her standpoint easily. As soon as she saw the state he was in she rushed over and shoved the doctor out of the way ignoring his protests. Those stopped though once she started her diagnostics jutsu. It wasn't every day that a normal doctor's office was given the assistance of a medic ninja after all, and Kami knew he needed the help with this one. How bad was it doctor? Shizune asked the old man with a little hesitation. You mean aside from the fractures and concussion? I may not be a ninja but even I know the signs of chakra exhaustion. It took almost a half hour to get his leg and arm set. All of our pain relievers and attempts at anesthetization failed, so he had to stay awake through the pain. We were going to close the clinic so people wouldn't hear the screams, but he told us to just set them, that it wouldn't be the first time. He was a real trooper through it and only passed out after we were finally finished. He's a true testament to what you ninja go through to be able to handle so much pain. The doctor was rambling on, so impressed by his recollections that he never noticed the blanching that took over Shizune's features. After that was over we checked the rest of him and, well, it could have been better. Torn muscles, the concussion I mentioned, a dislocated shoulder, one of his ribs almost punctured a lung but we were able to set that right though that one made him grunt a bit. All in all it was one of the worst cases I'd seen in a long time and I'd prefer not to see one of the like again if at all possible. If you see anything else that I can help with just let me know. My services are at your disposal. The doctor finally took in the girl's complexion and was slightly unnerved. Girl are you okay? You look like you might need a bed of your own soon. I, I'm fine doctor. It was just a lot to take in. Shizune could hardly believe what she was hearing or what her diagnostics was telling her. Kami, is this what Tsunade-sama refused to heal? No, his body is healing rapidly. Whatever she refused to heal was far worse than this. She involuntarily gritted her teeth as her mentor's lack of concern for the boy's health. If it was true that he'd saved them all at some point then it should have been the least she could do to heal him. She took the time to heal his minor cuts and his bruises before moving to the torn muscles and stretched tendons. By the time she was done she was sweating and tired, but he would be at least a little more comfortable for now. Slightly wobbling, she made her way out to the waiting room to see Jiraiya leaning against the wall with his eyes closed. Jiraiya-sama, she gently shook him awake and giggled as he mumbled something about nurses, healing, him. Jiraiya-sama we've stabilized Naruto. He still has some injuries, but from what I've seen we may want to take him out of here soon. I don't think it would be a good idea for the people here to witness any kind of miracles. Jiraiya looked at her with a little confusion until he heard her whisper something about advanced healing. As soon as she mentioned that he shot up from the wall. I think I agree with you there Shizun. We'd better get him now, we need to be leaving after all. Gliding into Naruto's room he picked the boy up and the two slipped out of the building before any questions could arise. The only thing the doctor would find upon his return would be a stack of money and a simple note to say, thank you. As the two made their way across the rooftops towards the hotel, Jiraiya turned his head towards Shizun. Thank you for helping him Shizun. You are a testament to what a true medic is. He felt a small pang of guilt at his statement when he watched the girl flinch. Thank you Jiraiya-sama, but I fear Tsunade-sama won't feel the same way. Bah, forget her. 
If she wants to act all high and mighty just because this guy gets on her nerves she can go right ahead and do it, but that's no excuse for acting like a kid herself. She should know better than to let a comrade injured in the field, especially after her experiences. Quote dot dot dot. I know it's hard on her, but you're right, her medic training should come first. To let someone out there on the field, especially after a fight like that. I really don't know what's gotten into her lately. Yeah, it'll be hard enough getting her back to Konoha. I don't know if her bet with the Gaki is going to be enough to push her there. Don't worry about that. The Sandame seems to be a very special person to Naruto-kun. If there is anything I can do to repay him for what he did for me then I'll help you get Tsunade-sama back to Konoha. And just how do you intend to do that? Jiraiya gave her a skeptical look. By going to Konoha with you. And that will make her go to Konoha how? Because she's lost without me. Even if we parted ways here, today, she would be running back to pick me up in a couple hours. They both shared a bit of a chuckle as they landed in front of the hotel Jiraiya and Naruto were staying at. Feel free to wait in the lobby, I'm just going to grab our things and I'll be right back down. The Sanin told her as he gently set Naruto in one of the lobby chairs before hitting the stairway to the upper floors. Shizun sat in the chair opposite the sleeping Genin as she watched over him. What makes you so strong Naruto? How is it so easy for you to go up against Sanin like Orochimaru and Tsunade without flinching? How can you be hurt so bad, yet still be able to jump in at just the right time to save the day? Heroes are a myth Naruto. I know it, but it seems like someone forgot to tell that to you. Her thoughts were interrupted when she heard a tapping on the glass next to her. Looking over she let out a little shriek of surprise as she saw Tsunade looking around the area a bit before peeking back through the window. Her muffled voice barely came through the glass, but she was still heard by her companion. Come on Shizun, while he's not here we'll skip out. Shizun gave one more worried look over to Naruto before looking back at her mentor and scowling. She shook her head no causing a little surprise to cross the Sanin's face before she scowled in return. Now Shizun. Let's go. Again Tsunade's muffled voice was met with a furiously shaking head before she decided she would need to get a little more personal if she wanted to get out of there without Jiraiya noticing. Rushing into the hotel's lobby she grabbed Shizun's hand and tried to drag her out of the building. To her annoyance the girl didn't budge. Shizun, what the hell are you doing? We have to go now before that pervert comes back. No, I'm going with them. Tsunade was stunned. WH what do you mean? You're leaving me for them. No Tsunade-sama. I'm doing what's right. Naruto-kun saved us and went through a lot of pain to do it. It's our obligation to repay that to him. No one asked him to help. No, but he did and without it both of us could be dead right now. If healing sandame sama is how we can repay him for that then I will do what I can, and you should too. Honestly I'm ashamed to call you my mentor right now. You left an injured ally on the field when you could have at least made sure he would live. You've broken your oaths as a medic Tsunade-sama and that is something that I will not follow your teachings in. Naruto-kun isn't completely healed yet, and he's going to need to be looked after for a while before he's completely stable. I plan to do exactly that. Tsunade was shocked and angry. The blonde brat had turned her own apprentice against her. Do what you want then. I'm leaving. Don't even think of crawling back to me later. The younger woman just smirked at her as she started to stalk out of the lobby. Suit yourself Tsunade-sama. See how long you can last on your own. I'm sure Dan and Nawaki will look out for you with the shining example you've become. The Sanin froze mid-step. Hanging her head she shook in rage and a little sorrow. That's a low blow Shizun. You want a low blow. How about a Sanin fighting a Genin in a back alley? while drunk, over a pointless bet. Shizun. Run away all you want Tsunade-sama, but I'm going to do what I can to help them, and I also want to see just why Naruto is so strong. Aren't you even a little curious about that? Despite her words, she was trying to keep her mentor from leaving alone. If bringing her medic's curiosity into play was the way to do it, then she would push every button she could. Please, Shisho. You really are a brat, you know that right? Tsunade turned to her student with tears forming in her eyes. I'm scared Shizun. That place, it, it brings back so many bad memories. Then meet them head on. 
Both women looked over to the chair where Naruto was sitting. He hadn't moved an inch, but his eyes were now open and he was staring at them. Even if there is more pain than joy there, you have to make it so the joy outweighs the pain. It at least makes it easier. How? He shouldn't even be awake for at least a couple of hours. The shock from the pain should take at least that long to wear off. Shizun was in awe at the moment since she knew what he'd been through as far as injuries that day. Tsunade on the other hand only knew about his arm and leg from what she had seen. And what would you know about facing my kind of pain Gaki? Ever had the person you love die? How about a sibling? No huh? Then how can you even come close to knowing what I would be going through going back to that place? No I haven't had a loved one die, thank Kami, but I also haven't had a loved one until recently. From before that though I have had the pain of loneliness. I also don't have any siblings because I'm an orphan, but then you wouldn't know that pain, the pain of being unwanted, disrespected, hated. I have many pains you couldn't even fathom yet I still find reasons to continue going back to that village because there is more than just pain there for me. I have people who love me. I have friends. I have family, even if they aren't blood related. For them I'm willing to return to that hell and I will continue to do so until they give me a reason not to. As long as I can protect those precious to me, I will be there for them. Both women could see the hurt in his eyes as scenes only known to him flashed across his vision. In comparison, Tsunade's own reasons not to return seemed to dim and flicker. Why you talk a good story Gaki, but I plan on seeing for myself this so-called pain you go through. You better pray that it's worth my time or you'll be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. Like I haven't heard that threat before. Shizun was about to start questioning him on some of what he said when a couple loud thuds were heard announcing the arrival of another Sani. Hey everyone. Ready to go. Jiraiya was all smiles as he took in the somber scene in front of him. Knew the kid could do it. Never had a doubt. Okay. Maybe one. Or three. Ignoring the hermit, Tsunade walked over to Naruto's chair. Glaring at him for a minute she finally sighted. Reaching around her neck she took off her necklace and slung it over his head. A bet's, a bet. She said before mumbling, with any luck its curse will keep up and I won't have to deal with you again. Tsunade-sama. Oh can it and let's get this over with. The female Sanin started to walk out of the building again as the other two adults stared after her shocked that she would give up such a precious item. Well are you coming? She turned and glared at them with a little annoyance. Rushing to comply, the two gathered their belongings with Jiraiya picking up Naruto before following Tsunade out the door. The group began their journey back to Kanahagakur without another incident. Two of them satisfied with the results of their mission, one disgruntled and dreading their destination and the last stealing glances at the young blonde, wondering just what it was that made him tick. Chapter 23. While you were gone. Harusada Tenten. The group flinched at the tone of the gruff voice, but none more than the girl belonging to the shouted name. H. Hi. Father. Slightly afraid, the girl turned towards the man as he came striding up to the group. You disobeyed me last night Tenten. I am very disappointed in you. Nawa Harusada crossed his arms as he reached them and stood facing his daughter with obvious disapproval in his eyes. It was just a sleep over dad. You're always telling me I should make more friends. I meant decent friends. As soon as the words left his mouth he realized the implications he had just made as the rest of the group took a step forward and crossed their arms. The glares he got would have been enough to put a raging bull into a fear-induced coma, but he stood firm. A ninja he may not be, but he'd be damned before a bunch of teenage girls got the better of him. I of course don't mean your current company, but rather. Naruto-kun. Tenten finished for him flatly, obvious distaste for his attitude dripping from her voice. Exactly what is it that you have against him dad? W well, I've heard all kinds of stories about him and how he treats others. I'm just doing my job as your father and looking out for you honey. He tried to soften his eyes to calm her down, but it was rather difficult with her glare pinning him in place. And just what stories did you hear, Mr. Harusada? Ino tapped her foot expectantly. How about how he slaughtered a bunch of civilians recently? Even the ninja that come to the shop are talking about it all the time. He puffed up his chest at the mention of his store. As a weaponsmith, he held great pride in his work. 
How about how those civilians were trespassing and trying to steal his property? How about how he left most of them alive and only killed those that broke some law the Sandame made that calls for death upon breaking it? How about how those civilians outside the property were calling for his death for rightfully defending his home? Haku shot back with such fury that the man was forced to take a step back in surprise. W. Well, they didn't mention that. What about how he keeps pranking all the stores in town and random people? What about how those were the people that wouldn't let him shop in their stores to begin with? What about how those are people that used to beat him? What about how that was his way of practicing his ninja skills since no one would spare their time to teach him? Hanada called out, surprising not only the smith, but her companions as well. What about? Just give it up dad. He's not some monster and no matter how deep you dig you won't hit any dirt. Well he's still a boy and I know how boys think and act because, believe it or not, I was a young boy once too. The elder Harusada had to hide the hurt that came from the few disbelieving looks he got. Anyo. Harusada-san. Naruto wouldn't and has never done such a thing to any of us. Haku-chan. Kin-san and myself all live with him and he has done nothing but respect us. Hanada looked downcast a little at the memory of just how far from the truth the man was. Back when they had managed to put the blonde in the hospital due to their own aggressive pursuit of him. As the three others who were involved in the event caught on to her thoughts, they too looked down as they remembered the shame in their actions. Eno spoke up softly, just loud enough for those in the immediate vicinity to hear. Sir, Naruto-kun is not your typical adolescent male. Because of what he's been through in life, he doesn't act like a true teenager most of the time. Sure he will kiss and flirt a little, but that's as far as it has ever gone with him, and all the farther he is willing to go for a long time. So he's just biding his time until he wants to strike. No, Haku and Kin said in unison. Haku continued. No, that has nothing to do with it. He, he's afraid to go farther, both for our sakes as well as his own. He doesn't want us to accidentally waste our lives for a small fling. Plus he's. She couldn't finish as Kin slapped a hand over her mouth. Sorry, but his own reasons are his own. We aren't the ones to be giving away that history. Kin felt her friend nod in agreement under her hand before she released her, allowing her to apologize for nearly revealing too much. Ten Ten's father looked skeptical, but relented that his daughter had spent the night at the boy's house and seemed to be in perfect health. Not to mention she seemed to have gained quite a few female friends, something he had been bugging her to do for some time now. Quote dot dot dot. Fine, but you are only to be in that house if others are there too. I don't want you alone with him under any circumstances. Is that understood? Hi, hi, can I go now? Since Naruto went on his mission we decided to have a girl's day out. Tenten replied with a wave of her hand and a smile. Nawa sighed at his daughter. He hated to admit it but she was growing up. Being an official ninja now he really had no legal sway over her but that didn't mean he wouldn't fret over her well-being as her father. Go then, but make sure you're back for dinner. You are not sleeping under any roof but mine tonight young lady. Sure thing dad. Tenton smiled and ushered the others away before the man could change his mind. He had to sigh again as the group disappeared down the street. I really hope I didn't just make a mistake there. Don't worry Harusada-san. Naruto may be young but he would as soon chop his own arm off as hurt anyone who doesn't deserve it. Spinning on his heel, the smith found himself face to face with a bright orange book. Only one person was bold enough to read such a thing in public. Kakashi-san. What do you know of that boy? I know that he'd do anything for his comrades. I know that he has a sense of honor greater than most samurai. I know that, if there is a chance he can save someone and turn them to his side that he will find the way to do it. I also know that if I had a daughter there would probably be no safer hands for her to be in short of a eunuch. Kakashi casually flipped a page in his book as he waited for the man's reply. Quote dot dot dot. I still don't want her alone with him. She's my baby girl and she's all I have left. I may be a little overprotective, but that's my right as a father. Fair enough. Just remember to give him a fair chance. Despite what you heard about him, Naruto is probably the safest male of their generation to hang around. We shall see. 
Over the course of the first few days it was rather pleasant for the girls at the Namikaze estate. For the most part they simply hung out and trained unless they had missions to go on. Haku and Kin formed a temporary team. They were told that Kiba would join them as well once his injuries were healed, something they weren't really looking forward to, and that Hitaki Kakashi would be their Jonin sensei. Once Kin was filled in on the Inazuka's past actions, she was more than ready to put a Sanban to his baby makers if he ever tried anything with her. That was only the start of their problems as they soon found out. Now that word had gotten out that Naruto was out of the village, they started getting more and more visitors. Some stated that they simply wanted to look around for old times' sake and they were just as politely turned away. Others, including Homura and Kaharu, were more demanding that they be granted entrance. When denied they attempted to force their way in, but Naruto's locking seal held true and didn't budge. The girls were almost hoping that someone would be foolish enough to try to jump the wall, just so they would have something to take their frustrations out on. Unfortunately, after Naruto dealt with the last bunch that entered his property without permission, the rest were hesitant to follow suit. Thankfully that all died down after other ninja began to show up around that section of town. Ninja that by all rights had no business in the area. Members of the Yamanaka, Nara, Akamichi, Aburame and even the Inazuka clans had all been impressed enough with the group's performance during the Chunin exams that they took it upon themselves to look after Naruto's place and its inhabitants while he was away. They were joined by others who were grateful for the blonde's actions after word spread about how he had helped in the Sandames fight against Orochimaru, and those who just hated the civilian council. Where there are good deeds though, there are also foul plots abound. Hanada had been approached by numerous members of the Hyuga clan. Some had been friendly while others were extremely aggressive or even saddened. The thing that they all seemed to have in common though was that they wanted her to return to their clan. Those that had expected the once meek girl to be easily persuaded were rather surprised when she stood fast in her decision to stay clear of the noble clan, even after they promised her, her status back as clan heir if she accepted, or the worst beating in her life if she refused. Today though would be the worst encounter thus far. Not for what was said, but for who had decided to show themselves. Hanada was happily working in the garden at the front of the estate while Ino and Kin were working around the side of the house. The front was her favorite though and she was currently working on training Ivy to grow over the front gate. At least that was her plan until she heard the shuffling of feet on the other side of the wall. Jen and Hanada. Hanada turned towards the gate of the estate with mixed feelings of hatred and dread. The voice she heard was known all too well to her. She narrowed her eyes at the sight of two members of her previous family as she walked a little closer to them. Hayuga Hiyashi. Hayuga Neji. How may I help you too? Not used to being addressed as such, especially by his weakest offspring, the distaste on the Hayuga head's face was palpable. Despite his anger, Hiyashi managed to calm himself enough to talk. Hayuga Hanada, you are required to attend a meeting at the Hayuga compound in two days' time. The elders and myself have decided to make you an offer that will allow you to continue with your current endeavors. I'm sorry but I won't be able to make it to that meeting. It is regrettable. Hanada replied coolly. How unfortunate. We will reschedule for later in the week then, I suppose. Hanada could see the man's knuckles whitening as his hands balled into fists. Well this is most distressing. You see my whole month is absolutely booked solid. Hanada gave a small smirk. He couldn't touch her as long as she was on her side of the wall. You seem to have grown some courage, brat. Though I wonder if you would have the same courage if you were here on the street talking to us face to face. No matter. There are other ways to persuade you to come. This one you should be very familiar with. Hiyashi gave a slight wave to his side and Neji reluctantly undid his Hitai ITE and the bandages covering his forehead. Hanada narrowed her eyes again at the sight of her cousin's Hayuga soak no Juinjutsu. From the remembrance of past pain in his eyes, Hanada became worried for what her father might have in store for him, and for her. As much as it pains me to do this Hanada, if you refuse to answer our summons I will be forced to take drastic measures. While you may be able to remain safe behind that demon's walls, there are others who are not so fortunate. To punctuate his statement, Hiyashi activated Neji's seal forcing pain into his system and sending him to the ground in agony. As quickly as the pain began, 
It was gone and Neji was left breathing heavily in the dirt. You see Hanada. Walls are amazing for protecting yourself, but when it comes to protecting others. Let's just say. They get in the way. He smirked at his daughter, but to his own surprise she wasn't bawling for him to stop at all. He could tell she was upset, but he could also see that she wasn't about to budge either. Had he been paying attention to her instead of his own joys in using the seal to get to her, he may have noticed the small jerk in her movements. You're despicable Hiyashi. Hurting your own family just so you can gain back complete control over our bloodline. I'm sorry Neji, but you chose this path yourself when you decided to try to kill me at the preliminaries. That's right father. I won't step in and save him just so you can try to win me over, or were you going to wait until I came to your little party then force me to receive the same seal? Remember well that you have no control or say over me or my actions any longer. No matter who you threaten, or who you try to make an example of, I will not bend to your will anymore. To show that she was finished talking, Hanada strode away into the house while Hiyashi stood red-faced and glaring at her back. That insolent little harlot. I'll have her back under my thumb if it's the last thing I do. Hiyashi continued to rant until a new figure showed up at the gate, two figures in fact. So the almighty Hayuga Sama decides to pay us a little visit does he? Can't say you're very pleasing to the eye. Or the ear for that matter. Not to mention how barbaric he is. How the mighty have fallen. What right do you have to speak to me as such you little demon whores? You, Yamanaka should be ashamed. Unlike my daughter you are still a clan heir. To even be seen with such worthless trash is a disgrace to all of the clans. As for your little Odo spy friend, maybe I'll just have the council execute her for her involvement in the invasion. What involvement? She assisted us against the Odo and Suna forces. If you're going to execute her then you better be planning on executing all of our allies. I believe you took part in the battles, so why don't you do us all a favor and start with yourself? Eno glared at the pupil-less eyes of the Hyuga head, not even flinching as he started to raise his killing intent. If you haven't gotten the memo yet, Inoichi confirmed that your precious Uchiha brat wasn't the one that fought against Gara's Tanuki form and beat it. That feat was courtesy of Naruto, your so-called demon, so in the end it was the one you denounced so much that saved us from the real demon. If anything, that should make the clans approve of any relationships he has. Like Eno. Kin Tu faced off Hiyashi without backing down, though they were now beginning to sweat a little from the pressure behind it. Hiyashi just sneered at the two girls. Again you little wenches seem to be tough when there is a barrier between us. I wonder how you would act without such an obstacle in the way. If you'd like we could meet you in the center of the market and humiliate you there. Of course you'd probably end up attacking us and because of that you would be putting yourself in prison. It doesn't matter if you're a council member or not, attacking a Konoha ninja, especially a clan heiress, would earn you a one-way trip. Isn't that right, Hayuga? Ino glared at him. Now I believe our little game here is finished. Goodbye Hiyashi. Like Hanada before them, the two girls turned their backs to the enraged clan head and entered the house. Not seeming to care when Hiyashi stomped off down the street while Neji struggled to get back to his feet and limp along behind him, glancing back only once. How's Hanada? Kin asked, slightly worried. She'll be fine, but I hope she doesn't hate me for taking her over for that little bit. I couldn't have her leaving with that man just because he was hurting her cousin. The two walked into the sitting area to see Hanada face down on the couch. It was obvious that she was sobbing due to the shaky raise and fall of her back and shoulders. Quote dot dot dot. Hanada. Hanada. I'm sorry, but I had no choy. Hanada turned her tear-streaked face to her friends. Don't apologize. You you did the right thing. I probably would have gone with him if you let me keep control. I would have crumbled and left and possibly died. I wouldn't want Naruto-kun or any of you to hurt because I have a weak will. No. Don't apologize to me. I'm the one that should be thanking you, for allowing me to act how I wish I could act in front of him all these years. It, made me happy, but I still didn't want to see Neji get hurt. I hope, he's not punished because of this. Don't worry Hanada-chan, I'm sure he'll be fine. After all, he's the Hyuga prodigy. I doubt they would kill him. Kin tried her best to comfort the girl as she rubbed her back. For Hanada, 
this was something she still had to get used to, affection. After her mother had died she had gotten precious little of the action until she was put on Team 8. Now with all the other girls it was almost an overload to her system with how much affection she was getting. It made her feel like she was actually wanted. Even with all that though, she would give it all up as long as she kept the affections of her beloved Naruto. Mere days after the event with Hiyashi, three girls found themselves out shopping for groceries. Hanada, Haku and Kin were out in the marketplace looking for food that they would require for meals in the coming week. For Kin it would be a new experience since the invasion and for Haku it would be even more of an eye-opening experience into Naruto's life. It was obvious as soon as they walked up to the first food stall that they weren't very welcome. The glares of the patrons spoke volumes as they browsed the selection. Even the stand owner seemed to be uncomfortable having them there. Recalling such looks from her days of stalking. Dot air coincidentally following Naruto, Hanada decided to test a new theory. Anyo, how much would it be for a dozen plums sir? The owner looked towards her and sniffed, seemingly annoyed with her very presence. 576 yen. The girls were stunned, but it says here that they're 16 yen each. How could they possibly add up to that much? Kin asked. The stall owner just smirked at her. Demon tax. As soon as the words left his mouth the stall grew deathly cold. Care to repeat that sir? I said, demon tax, and that goes out to any demon's horse too. He replied, completely unfazed by their glares. If you don't like it you can go somewhere else. Too bad for you. Smiling he turned to another customer who was ready to pay and completed their transaction, including a dozen plums for the normal price of 192 yen. A mere third of what he was going to charge them. I see, so this is how you treated him. Well that's fine, there are other places to get food from besides this dump. We'll just go to someone who deserves out money, not some blind fool who can't see past his own nose hairs. With a turn, the three girls walked away from the stall, missing the owner's smirk as he watched them cross to another stand a short distance away. Soon they became slightly frustrated as stall after stall saw fit to adjust its prices on the spot for them. After an hour and a half of trying to find someone who wasn't prejudiced against them for being friends with the blonde, they sat down on a bench to rest. I, I knew it was bad for him, but that they would go so far as to do the same to us, it makes me wonder just why we protect them. Hanada sighed as she stared across the street into the glare of their most recent attempt at gathering supplies. And this is what Naruto-sama had to go through his whole life. Hell in Odo they were too afraid of us to even consider such a thing. Hell most of them gave the ninja discounts out of fear of retaliation. No wonder he wanted to help out Nami, it was like he was watching others live his life. I think if I had to grow up with this I would have been begging Zabuza to kill Gato and just take what we could get some money for before leaving. Well we aren't going to be able to eat if we don't find somewhere to get food, so we better just keep at it. I just hope the insults don't get much worse or I may do something I might regret later. Kin announced before forcing herself to stand. The other two begrudgingly followed her lead and they began their search once more. It wasn't until five stalls and many arguments later that they met a familiar face. Good morning ladies. Kurinai smiled down at them as they entered her view. All she got in reply was some tired grumbling. Laughing it off as tiredness from training. The Genjutsu mistress finished paying her bill before turning back to them. Have a pleasant afternoon. Hanada I'll see you tomorrow for training in AD rank. Smiling, she was about to leave when the girl's conversation with the stand's owner hit her ears. Okay sir, how much for that rice? Her and I could hear the venom in Hanada's voice despite her attempt at hiding it. Curious she hung back a little, wondering what could have brought that on. 10,000 yen. The Jonin whipped her head around in surprise, wondering what they would need with so much rice. What she saw stopped her short of yelling at them. The bag the girl was pointing to couldn't have been more than 10 kilograms. The owner was either blind, or overpricing them on purpose. The grin on the man's face spoke closer to the latter. Well, that wasn't the highest cost today, but also not the lowest. Kin sighed. We don't have many options left. We could always ask for a mission to go to a town outside of Konoha and bring stuff back, but that would take a while and the chances of some of the food spoiling would be high. 
Haku grumbled back. Excuse me, I couldn't help but overhear you plight. The heads of those in the stall looked towards the voice to see a rather angry, red-eyed woman glaring at the owner. I believe I just bought that same-sized bag of rice for 2,500 yen, perhaps my ears were deceiving me when I heard you telling those girls the price was four times that. Though the man was obviously displeased at her intervention, he held a straight face. You just got lucky to get your food when you did, inflation and all that. It's a pity, really. Inflation in that short amount of time, really. Well perhaps I should go warn my friends that they should start growing their own food from now on if they want to eat without going bankrupt, and trust me, I have a lot of friends. She glared at him as he fidgeted around. Finally seeming to come to a decision he let out a rather gruff noise and turned sharply to the three teens. Fine. The rice is 2,500 yen. Now if you're going to buy it then do so and leave. Oh I'm sure they can't get by on just rice. Here girls let me help you gather your necessities. Since one of you is on my squad it's only right that I watch your diet. Over the course of the next half hour the quartet managed to gather what they wanted from the stall and pay the disgruntled owner the correct amount for the bounty. Thank you Kurenai Sensei. It seems that even saving the village from a rampaging monster isn't enough for them to see him as an equal. Perhaps someday the truth will come out and we'll be able to talk to them freely about it. Kuranai was shocked at the insinuation of her student. Pulling her aside and signaling the other two to wait, she crouched down and looked the girl in the eyes. You know about him, she whispered to the former Hayuga. Hanada blushed a bit before answering. After following him around for so long it was only a matter of time before I overheard the mutterings. Yes, I know what's inside of him. I also know that he is not that thing. After being near him now for so long I know that he is Naruto-kun and he wants nothing more than to protect those who deserve it, and even those who don't. She sent a glare in the general direction of the populace before turning back to her sensei. I could never hold it against him for what he's had to bear, it just makes it that much more infuriating when someone denounces his strength. He's so strong and yet so kind and caring that it makes me so angry when they insult him sensei. I just wish they would take the time to give him a chance. Suddenly finding the ground very interesting, Hanada missed the smile on her mentor's face. Putting a finger on the girl's chin to force her gaze up, Kurenai made sure that she saw her approval. Hanada, I'm sure Naruto would be happy to know that you feel this way even knowing what he holds. While I'm surprised that you know, and wish that I knew who you found out from, I am proud that you aren't following in their opinions. How could I sensei? when he was one of the first to accept me. Her statement earned her a comforting hug from the woman before they turned back to the others. Well I'm sure you didn't come here for just that little bit, so how about we get your shopping finished? Don't worry about where you go, I'll deal with anyone that tries to stop you. Eno, is that you? Closing the door behind her, Eno called out to her mom. Yeah mom, I'm home. Come to the kitchen dear, your father and I want to have a word with you. As she made her way through the house, Eno couldn't help but feel a sense of foreboding slither through her. That feeling only heightened when she was met with both of her parents sitting at the table along with one Morino Ibiki. Eyes landing on the man from the first portion of the Chunin exams she could do little but blink in surprise. Uh, hi, um what did you want? Eno honey, this is Konoha's head interrogator, Morino Ibiki. He wants to ask you a few questions. Inoichi explained. Ino-san, we have reports that you've been seen around town with at least two of our current captives. First I would like to ask you about events concerning one Haruno Sakura. Ibiki ready to pen on the notepad in front of him, ready to take down her statements. They could tell this was going to be difficult on the girl as she slumped into a chair, yet at the same time her parents couldn't be more proud. Normally they would have thought that their daughter would run off to her room, but lately she seemed to be changing. Ever since she participated in the Chunin exams they noticed her changing. She no longer hung out with her childhood friend, even for a rival's spat. She never mentioned her academy crush Sasuke either, though she tended to bring up the Uzumaki boy more often. Her mother had gotten bent into a knot about that for a bit, but after a brief talk with her husband behind a closed door and she seemed to have changed to at least neutrality. What about her? As you should be aware, 
Haruno Sakura was detained for breaking and entering the estate of Uzumaki Naruto, harm to his person and theft of his possessions. Yeah, so what do you need me for? If you know all that just lock her away and throw away the key. Her easy dismissal of what used to be her best friend startled the three a little. This was after all the little girl that she used to be inseparable from. Right. Well it isn't quite that simple. What we need is a little more information on her before we get started with direct questioning. This isn't something we would normally do, but since you will most likely be going into the interrogation field we figure picking your brain couldn't hurt a bit. To get started, you were in the same class as Sakura-san. How did she act around that time? Quote dot dot dot. Well, we were friends at one point, and I helped her get over her shyness, but that changed when Sasuke came into the picture. Everything changed. She was still the same brain that she always was, but anything outside of classwork seemed to turn her into an automatic ditz. I won't lie and say I was a saint myself, but at least I still practiced my clan techniques and did some training. Eno took a moment to pour herself some tea from the offered pitcher and take a sip to calm herself. She would soon be treading dangerous waters as far as her parents were concerned and she wasn't sure just how much either of them knew about certain events that had happened recently. So basically Sakura-san was already after the Uchiha in the academy and would have done anything for his attention. Ibiki summarized the situation just to make sure he had the right idea. That's pretty much it. It didn't help that her mother goaded her into impressing him practically every day. The few times I did see her after the end of our friendship her mother was basically only concerned about how much she impressed Sasuke, or how badly she hurt Naruto-kun. Speaking of him, how did she treat Uzumaki in the academy? Ino suddenly felt a little uncomfortable. She really didn't want to recall this part, but it was her duty now. Quote dot dot dot. He was the dobi of the class, the moron. Hated by the teachers and parents and the kid we were all warned to stay away from almost daily. If she wasn't beating on him for going against her opinion or trying to ask her out, she was just ignoring him, like the rest of us. Her mother put a comforting hand on her shoulder earning a half-hearted smile in return. What about after graduation? Inoichi wanted to get the questions moving to a part that even he was more curious about. He had only heard a brief description about the Chunin exams, but it was going to have to come to light now. When we graduated, Naruto changed. Not in a bad way, but he was suddenly smarter and stronger. She didn't take it well. Neither did I, but I got over it once my real training began. I didn't really see much of her until the exams, but whenever I did she was always shadowing Sasuke. I heard of a couple confrontations though between her and Naruto. When the exams came up I thought it would be a great chance to beat some sense into her and show her I was the one for Sasuke. Dot hey. Dot now I'm glad that fell through. It seems like all those involved are pretty much connected throughout their history. Regardless, continue and I'll just separate what I can. Ibiki flipped the page of his notepad over to a new sheet and got ready to write. The first exam you already know about, and since it wasn't really interactive I don't think I need to talk about it. Getting a nod to continue Eno took a deep breath. We caught up with Team 7 in the forest as Sakura was trying to fend off a team from Odo. She might not have been my friend anymore, but I didn't want to see her die right in front of me, so I forced my team to help. At the end of the fight Sasuke came out and chased them away, but he was covered in some weird marks and acting really strange. He grabbed Sakura and me and headed into a hollow in a large tree. At first I thought I would be happy when I saw him, do things with Sakura. She saw some disappointment in her parents' eyes and it stung that it was directed at her, but she pressed on. But then I started to get nervous and didn't want to be a part of it. I tried to get away. But Sasuke grabbed me and forced me back inside before threatening to force himself on me if I didn't remove my clothes. Inoichi nearly bent his spoon in half at the revelation. He'd heard it all before, but spared his wife the details. Now that it was out in the open she was clutching his other hand so hard that he was making a fist and gritting his teeth in an attempt to stem the pain. My poor baby. He didn't hurt you did he? I want charges pressed against that little bastard. Dear. We can't press charges because it was done during a simulated real-life event. They were allowed to go to whatever extent they deemed necessary to complete that portion of the exam. 
He tried to calm her down, but she was already in tears. Meanwhile Ino was trying to hold her own back as she fought to continue. After Naruto dealt with them he gave our team the scroll we needed and we all went to the tower together, minus team 7 as he felt they didn't deserve his generosity. Gee I wonder why, Ibiki thought to himself. My next run in with them didn't really happen until the my fight with Sakura in the preliminaries. She constantly hounded me on how I should be the Uchiha's bitch and be happy about it, and even attacked me after the fight was over. Kin and Naruto stopped her from continuing though. Again we didn't interact for a while, but when we did she felt the need to constantly hound me about Sasuke even though I am no longer interested in him. I see. If that's everything then I'll be on my way. Thank you for your time Ino-san and I hope to meet you under better circumstances in the future. Hi, Ibiki-san. Taking his cue from the somber mood, Ibiki stood and clapped his fellow interrogator on the shoulder in farewell before retreating from the home to get to work. As he exited through the front door he saw the two elder Yamanaka embracing their daughter as she finally succumbed to her tears. Hiding her emotions for so long, she'll make her father proud one day. Ah Uchiha-san, how are you this afternoon? The bright and cheery attitude of Midarashi Anko was a little much a mismatch for the current decor of the surrounding room. Considering they were in one of the lower levels of the Anbu prison one would think a person would be at least a little gloomy, but here she was all smiles. Disturbing smiles, but smiles nonetheless. From his chained spot on the wall Sasuke glared at the woman before spitting in her general direction. The bandages on his arm and leg still tinged slightly pink from the rough stitches he got and the cast on his wrist itched so much that it was maddening, but shackled as he was he couldn't do anything about it. And what would the snake whore care about my day? Once I get out of here you'll know just where you stand, I promise you that. Well whether you leave or not all depends on how you decide to answer my questions. Personally I hope you resist a bit because I'm in a playful mood. As she casually talked, Anko laid out a scroll on the nearby table and started to unroll it. Do you know where I got this scroll? A grunt was the only reply she got and it caused her to snicker. I got it from someone you're very familiar with. That little blonde Brad Uzumaki seems to fancy himself an interrogator, and to be honest from what I've seen this stuff do he'd make a pretty damn good one. As if that Doby could do anything right. Paint balls and feathers will do little against me bitch. He activated what he could of his Sharingan to add a little intimidation but the woman easily shrugged it off, adding in a laugh at his pitiful attempts. Well, you can either tell me what I want to know, or... Dot dot quote. She unsealed the first item and the third. Appearing in her hands were now a roll of pins, a thick rope of material and a lighter. We can see just how adapted to fire you really are. To show exactly what she meant, Anko chopped off a small piece of the rope and placed it on the end of a pin before pushing it into the boy's bicep. Taking a moment to watch his face wince from the pinch she lit the material, showing it to be a slow burning compound. Much to the boy's distress, the heat of the mixture was easily picked up by the needle and transferred directly inside his body. The resulting scream was forcefully silenced as Sasuke glared at her with gritted teeth. You'll have to do better than that you slut. Uchiha don't break easily. Oh that's good, because I want to be able to play for a long time. Don't disappoint me now. I wouldn't want out. Date, to end too soon. The sickly sweet tone of her voice made him begin to sweat a little, but it was when he noticed what she was doing that he actually turned pale. On a tray between them she was placing more pins with the flammable mixture wadded on them. Already at least 30 prepared pins were arranged on a diagram of the human body. It didn't take a genius to figure out that the placement on the chart was where she was planning to insert them into his body, and some of them looked far more painful than the single pin that was in him now. Or aren't you supposed to be asking me questions? Hum. Oh. Right. I got so excited about my new toys that I almost forgot that part. Let's see. Did you or did you not stab Genin Uzumaki Naruto? Even though she was going through with the questioning, she began inserting the pins along his arms and legs. Tish. Yes, and I'd do it again too. The Uchiha tried not to wince at each prick this time, and managed to ignore a few. I'd do it again too if I got the chance. It's just too bad that Suna bitch blocked me or I'd have killed him then and there and rid the world of an eyesore. Really now? That's interesting. So, 
even though he is a loyal Konoha ninja you would willingly attack him of your own volition. Bring him here now and I'll gladly cut off his head in front of you. He gave her the best glare he could despite the numerous pins sticking out of him. How about that story about Inazuka Kiba during your mission to Nami no Kuni? It was all Anko could do to not start lighting the kid up now just to hear him scream. What's there to say? He was in an optimal position to protect the last Uchiha. If you were me would you have let such an opportunity pass you by? That earned a twist of the needle she had just put into his left pectoral, eliciting a small scream. I know better than to use my comrades as a means of escape. I would have looked for any other means to get away than risk a teammate's life for my own. Ha. Don't get all high and mighty snake bitch. I know all about your loyalties. You couldn't fool a toddler. Another bad move on the part of the Avenger and that point would be driven home by the screams that now traveled the halls. In another area of the prison two females were sitting on their respective cots facing each other but not talking. They could see and hear each other through the bars in the center of their shared cell, but any other interaction was severely limited. Isako looked at her daughter with quite a bit of displeasure before breaking their silence. You know we wouldn't be in this mess if you had been stronger. I thought you were the smartest one in your class. Yet you let that Yamanaka bastard walk around your head freely. Now we have to go through this interrogation crap because you were too weak. No wonder Uchiha-sama hasn't accepted your advances yet. Sakura just sat there unblinking, causing Isako to sniff at her indignantly. They sat in silence once again for another hour before a loud scream echoed through the hall, bringing the girl out of whatever trance she had been in. Sasuke-kun. W-h what are they doing to him? She looked frantically toward her mother for help, but found only a cold, hard glare. The same thing they'll be doing to us soon you little brat. Ugh. I should have never trusted you for such a thing. I could have seduced him myself long ago, but I chose to go another route to make our family stronger. Perhaps there's still hope though. Maybe they'll allow you to bear his child if only to take it from you once it's born. After all, I doubt he'll be leaving anytime soon and with what you pulled, you and I are going to be in here for a while too. Sakura was going to reply but was interrupted as the cell door on her mother's side opened. Her eyes immediately darted to his bandana as she recalled the scars that lay beneath it from the last time she had met Ibiki. Haruno. His voice grated out with obvious distaste. So glad to see you gracing us with your presence once again. It's rather convenient considering we were unable to finish our conversations from before. Despite his smile, Sakura felt a shiver go down her spine. Something about it seemed strange to her, like it was hiding a lot more than the face the man wore at the Chunin exams. Despite his intimidating aura Isako was able to look him in the eye, though she paled visibly behind her scowl. I believe I've said everything I plan on telling you last time Ibiki. I don't know what you plan on getting out of this little visit, but it won't be much I promise you that. Said the fly to the spider. The cracked door on Sakura's side of the room opened to reveal Inoichi Yamanaka as he walked through the opening. Hello again Isako, Sakura. Now, which of you wish to begin talking first? He looked at Sakura and noticed she was now huddled in the corner of her cot as far away from him as she could get. On the other side of the bars Isako was glaring at him. He would have thought it was without fear if her own cot wasn't clattering from her shaking. Neither. Well there are a few ways we can do this. First, and probably the easiest, I can search your minds for what we want to know. Of course that is both time consuming and not very fun for me. We could also try Ibiki's or my methods of mental torture. Effective, but I can't guarantee your sanity afterward. He took a moment to look between the two women. Of course I can't guarantee your sanity as you are now either. How dare you make such claims? Neither myself or my daughter are anything but mentally stable. Isako spat at him. Quote dot dot dot. Right. Anyhow, there is also physical torture. While that is more Anko's style, we can be more than accommodating. Unfortunately she has our newest toys in use currently. Sakura was about to whimper out what he meant but the unholy scream that ripped through the still open door made her eyes widen in horror. Sasuke-kun. What are you doing to him? She attempted to make a break for the door in order to save him, 
but as she tried to dodge around Inoichi the man easily held out an arm and with a thrust at her neck sent her sprawling back across the floor. This action of course made Isako lunge for the bars between them in concern for her choking daughter. How dare you harm my little girl? If you lay another finger on her I'll have you locked away for the rest of your life. Like her daughter, Isako soon found a grip around her neck as she was thrown back to her caught compliments of Ibiki before his partner clued them in on what they heard. Shut up woman. You are the prisoners and we are your worst nightmare. That scream you just heard was indeed dear, dear Sasuke. Right now he's having a little fun with Anko and our new interrogation scroll. We haven't gone through everything in it yet, but the creator of it was kind enough to leave instructions for its use. I decided to let Anko use it as she saw fit to get the information from him that we want. From the sounds of it, she's decided on her physical approach. A pity really, from what I've seen some of those items sealed in there have the potential to leave some nasty scars. Now, how about we allow you to reevaluate your situation? You are stuck in this cell until you are found innocent, which may or may not ever happen. If you are found guilty, your sentence may be reduced depending on the information given. If we suspect you, either of you, are holding back we are authorized to use any means necessary to find out what we want to know. Now we've already had a peek into your most recent actions thanks to Inoichi's visit inside Sakura's head, so hiding anything he saw is useless. Ibiki watched the blonde shudder a little from the memory of his mind walk and smirked. W what did you see in her head? Isako asked them. Tisk, tisk, tisk. Now that would be telling, wouldn't it Haruno? You're not about to get off that easily. If we told you what we saw you would just tell us that there was nothing else. For us not telling you is better because you have no choice but to tell us everything or face further torture. D don't hurt M my mother. Sakura had tears glistening in the corners of her eyes as she nursed a bruised elbow. Shut up and stop being so weak you little tramp. The yell had the effect of making many eyes widen, but none so much as Sakura's herself. M.M. Mommy. The teen was in complete disbelief that her mother would yell at her like that. You see Sakura, your mother has already gone through some of our treatments. It seems that she's a little anxious to go through more and it's put a bit of stress on her. Don't take her words right now too close to heart. After all, they are probably the closest thing to her true feelings right now. Her greatest fear right now is showing us too much of her dirty laundry, but she also knows that if she doesn't cover everything I saw inside your little head that she'll be in for some rather harsh punishments. Inoichi's calm explanation gave Sakura the creeps, but at the same time she saw her mother's eyes widen as he had apparently pinpointed exactly what was going through her head. Sakura sat there trying to decipher what exactly was going on. If her mother really had secrets that she was hiding from Konoha that we bad enough to warrant interrogation, what had she kept from herself and her father? Head drooping, Isako started relating events that she thought her daughter might have shown them. Slowly she picked her way through memories of her interactions with her daughter and recalled them. Her encouraging of her daughter to pursue the Uchiha in order to raise the position of their family encouraging her daughter to mistreat the Uzumaki brat, telling her daughter to steal Naruto's jutsu in order to impress the Uchiha, organizing a mob to raid the Namikaze estate. That was as far as she was willing to admit openly in front of her daughter. Unfortunately the gods of mercy were not with her that day as Ibiki stepped up to her. Well Isako, that does indeed match up with what Yamanaka-san saw in your daughter's head. Dot but we think you can do a little better than that. After all you admitted to more when we last saw you. Unless you're willing to admit everything we will be forced to use drastic measures. Isako kept her face to the floor, unwilling to relinquish more. I see. That's a shame, truly. Ibiki. Sasuke's screams have stopped. See if Anko is done and let her know we require her assistance. After Inoichi left room, Ibiki turned back to Isako as he heard her whisper something. I didn't quite catch that Haruno-san. Could you repeat it please? In a soft voice that he could tell was strange she answered him. Take my daughter away from here, please. She. Dot she doesn't need to be here for this. Even after what you called her you're trying to act the kind caring mother. While I would love to have her stay though, she already left with Inoichi, see. Isako looked up at the bars that had separated her from her daughter and saw an empty room. 
Sighing in relief she sat back up on her cot and awaited what was coming like a true counselor, even if she was sweating like mad. Her apprehension only increased when she saw the cell door open behind the massive man. To her surprise she saw both the blonde hair of the Yamanaka and the purple hair of Anko. Her fear spiked as she saw the smile on the other woman's face. Ah Isako-chan. I was hoping I could play with you some more. After last time I didn't think you wanted to have any more fun. Her insane grin only widened at the look of terror framed by that pink hair. How did it go with the Uchiha? Ibiki asked without turning to the new arrivals. Oh he didn't talk much yet, but did you hear those screams? He'll either talk soon or go mad. Fun for me either way. An hour gift. Works like a charm. I'll tell you that kid is devilishly creative. I couldn't have dreamed up half this shit even hopped up on 10 soldier pills. Despite that fact that such a thing would kill her, it got the point across. Overdosing on almost anything related to their profession was usually accompanied with delusions shortly before the death of the user. Some of their best torture devices were crafted from the interpretations of some of their more insane patients. Well, what would you recommend for our dear Isako? Oh, um we could try one of the ones I haven't done yet. The two males sweat dropped at the sight of Anko bouncing up and down on her heels. It was rather apparent that she approved of their little gift. Quote dot dot dot. As long as it isn't too damaging, I suppose you could indulge. Instantly the scroll was unraveled across the floor in front of the female interrogator. The waited rather impatiently as she reached for numerous seals before jerking her hand back in indecision. Finally, after what seemed like half an hour, she selected on with a nod of her head and they watched as the smoke dissipated. On the scroll sat a small sheet of paper along with something that made even Isako's eyes raise in question. Sitting for all of them to view was a small jar of feathers, some rope and a bag of small clamps. Even Anko was at a loss as she looked up to the other two questioningly. I've heard of tickle torture, but why the rope and clamps? When they simply shrugged in answer she picked up the accompanying instruction paper. Her eyebrows hit her hairline as she read while a wicked grin crossed her face. Once she finished going over the steps and explanation she shoved the paper into the hands of the curious Ibiki while she grabbed the rope and headed for the rather uncomfortable looking counselor. By the time the two men were finished reading, Anko had Isako forcefully stripped and somewhat loosely tied to the cot. The coarse rope wound around the woman's body before coiling under the frame before re-emerging to wind around her more. The bindings, while nowhere near tight, were in some rather uncomfortable places. As she shifted on her back the rope rubbed against her neck, wrists, ankles, stomach, thighs, armpits, the tops and bottoms of her breasts as well as two strands going on either side of her womanhood. The three left standing watched as she glared at them and yelled all the obscenities she could think of. With a calm grace Inoichi strode over to the side of the cot and crouched down so he was closer to her level, while at the same time forcing her to turn her head to look at him. So Isako. Are you willing to spill your personal secrets or do we have to continue with the other portions of this torture? Fuck you, you prissy bastard. You won't get away with treating me like this. Mark my words, it will be you in one of these cells soon enough. The blonde let out a nearly convincing sigh of resignation before looking over to Anko and nodding her to commence. For the amount of time it took the woman to appear at the side of her captive they would have thought she had used a shunshun. Her glee-filled grin sent shivers up the spines of at least Inoichi and Isako. Even the stoic face of Ibiki seemed to grimace a little more. With little preamble, the snake mistress began to slowly pull out a couple of the clamps and pinch them on the flesh of the Haruno's stomach. It wasn't the most sensitive flesh she had to work with, but where would be the fun if she broke the woman too quickly? Even the slight pain made the victim wince as she was not used to such a thing. With the first phases finished Anko returned to the rest of the equipment and grabbed a couple of the feathers. This time she took her time coming back, making a show of twirling the feathers in the air. As she got to the end of the cot she ran a feather up the dirty mattress, letting it glide across the surface smoothly before it hit flesh. Isako's foot jerked at the sudden contact. The jerks only worsened as the feather traveled up her calf and around her knee. Despite the discomfort the ropes brought her, she tried her hardest to strain them as she tried to get away from the sensations the feather brought. As quickly as they came though the touch stopped and her squinted eyes opened. 
Now that you've had a small taste of what's to come, are you willing to talk? Ibiki asked from his spot at the wall. Your little tickle session doesn't scare me. In fact it feels rather fun. If this is what our interrogation department deems torture to be then I say we have been lucky to get what information we have. Why I could think of half a dozen better tortures than. The woman's breath was forced to hitch in her throat as two more clamps clipped to the undersides of her arms, in the skin around her triceps. She grit her teeth before glaring at her handlers, but had to close them once again as another two clips found their way to her thighs near her knees. A sharp intake of breath was her only verbal reaction. Before she could open her eyes again she felt the silky smoothness of the feather tickling her arm as it slowly moved up towards her elbow. Again she started to wriggle under the ministrations of Anko, but the accursed rope held fast despite how loose it felt. With each jerk of her body the thing rubbed harshly against her skin causing even more discomfort. Still the infernal beast did not let up with the feather, allowing it to curl in the nook of her joint with the lightest touch possible before again stopping. I admire your bravado Haruno-san, but it's pointless. We have a long way to go and you're already starting to show your limits. Indeed the woman was beginning to breath a bit heavier and the places that the rope touched were glowing a faint red color showing the irritation to those areas. G go to hell. Despite the tickle of the feather she was still able to manage to add a little hostility to her words. Of course that did little to aid her as more pinches came in rapid succession. Four clips on her sides, two just under her breasts, another two on the cartilage of her ears. Then the flimsy tool of the sadistic bitch was on her again. This time it began to be too much as Anko traced her biceps and armpits, using two feathers and taking obvious pleasure in the older woman's discomfort. With her pink hair starting to get a bit damp from sweat, she started to cry out as the feather hit particularly sensitive areas. The mixture of pain from the clamps, the sensations of the feather dancing across her skin and the discomfort of the ropes was easily working her mind into the realization that it can only get worse. After all they had a rather large bag of clamps and there were more than two feathers in that jar. F fine. She cried out in between Anko's movements to a now area. Instantly the feathers stopped but stayed hovered over her skin, threatening to continue their assault if they didn't like what she had to say. Glaring at her captors as hard as she could muster in her state she spat haughtily at them. What exactly are you after? You want to know why I made my girl do those things? It was because it was the best chance our family had of joining a respected clan that we had available. I would have done it myself if I had thought Uchiha-sama would have accepted me, but even I know that I am far too old for that to happen without due suspicion. Since my own attempts at making the Haruno family into a clan failed, I decided to continue my efforts through those that had more paths open to them. So you sold out your own daughter and coerced her into being a wanton slut for that arrogant brat. You're sicker than I am. Anko said in very real disgust. Tearing a person down physically and mentally in order to get information for the good of the village was easy for her but, considering her past, using others for your own selfish goals through coercion was worse than anything she could manage. Sure she'd played the seductress more than once, but it wasn't for her own power, it was for the protection of her village. Isako narrowed her eyes at the woman. That's right. I sold out my own flesh and blood in order to raise my family's status to where I deemed it should be. Being the laughing stock of the council doesn't sit well with me and I am determined to change that no matter what. If that mean ruining my girl's future to ensure a higher standing then so be it. Anko was about to start attacking her again out of spite, but a firm hand stopped her from succeeding. Looking up, she found Ibiki glaring directly into the Haruno's eyes. Moreno Ibiki had heard of people using their family members to gain power before, but something about Isako's story just didn't seem right. What had you attempted before setting your daughter on this course? The woman smiled back at him and replied in her best sing-song voice. Oh you know, sleeping with men in power. Trying to bear their children in order to have blackmail material to use against them. I even attempted to seduce members of existing clans, but that didn't work very well. It seems most of them believe pink hair is a bad shade to have as a ninja. Like blonde is any better, ha. Huh? I've done everything I could think of to gain status, including trying to create a new bloodline. That of course failed as well. See create a bloodline. As far as Anko knew such a thing was impossible. H how. 
As if finally realizing she'd said too much, Isako sealed her lips and glared at the ceiling. Determination filled her eyes showing that she knew what was about to happen and was preparing for the worst. To Anko's surprise, Ibiki forced her hand to move. Not away though. Instead he forced her to begin her torture once more, something she was all too happy to oblige him with. The bound woman was soon writhing once more as the feather danced across her skin. Anko didn't even stop her actions as Ibiki and Inoichi began putting clips on her most sensitive areas. Armpits, inner thighs, breasts, labia and some particularly jagged clips topped her nipples as she started to scream from the intense sensations of the various feelings going through her form. Forget it you assholes. I'll get my daughter to rape him next. He's too fucked in the head to even resist it anyway. You'll never get your proof. The torture reached its climax for her body and with one last scream she slumped on her cot and the smell of urine filled the air. The clatter of a clamp hitting the floor filled the now deathly silent room. Two of the torturers looked at the third questioningly as they saw his face pale and his eyes widen in shock. Then as quickly as it appeared it was gone and in its place was a visage they had never seen before on the man. Ainoichi. Ibiki was unsure how to approach his longtime friend. He'd never seen the man so mad before. It looked as if he was barely holding in his rage. He went to put a comforting hand on the blonde's shoulder, but when he expected the feeling of cloth on his hand, he found that he held nothing but air. In the next instant a loud slap echoed through the cell. Inoichi. Anko was shocked. One of her mentors had just done the one thing they were told to never do. Hell he was the one that taught her how to achieve this, yet here he was now letting his emotions run wild as he struck the bound woman hard enough across the face to knock out a tooth or two. With teeth clenched and hands still raised from the strike, Inoichi let his killing intent flood over their captive. You fucking little slut. You cowardly, unfaithful, loathsome bitch. If I were allowed, I would skin you alive and nail you to the buildings in the market square so everyone could see just how hideous you are. I won't though. I have my instructions and I intend to abide by them. After all, some of us follow the laws. Most of those who don't at least have morals. You obviously know nothing of either. I'm sure the punishment the Hokage will come up with will be more than enough to cover for some of your past transgressions, but for that event, I think the lowest level of hell would be too good for the likes of you. He took a breath to try to calm himself as he stepped away from the cot and the expanding puddle of fluid forming beneath it. Inoichi. Dot are you, okay? Ibiki approached the man, ready to restrain him if needs be while Anko undid the bindings of their captive, being careful to avoid any liquid that may somehow contaminate her with the woman's filth. At least Inoichi's outburst had the added effect of knocking the harlot out from the sheer pressure of his killing intent alone. Hell he himself had not felt such an intense amount for years, and never from that man. I'm. I don't know. I'm calling myself off of her interrogation schedule for the foreseeable future. I'm afraid I would fail in getting information with the temptation to just bring her pain being too strong right now. What happened? Who was it that she was talking about? That's. Dot not for me to say. I'm sorry but trust me when I say it would only cause your own attempts at interrogating her to be tainted in the future. On the other hand, at least some good may have come from this little revelation. Bringing his hands in front of him Inoichi's call of, Kai. Made the bars in front of the two shimmer, revealing that the other side of the room was not as empty as it had seemed. Slumped on her knees in the center of the floor, Sakura had tears openly flowing down her face as her body heaved heavily with her sobs. The gag in her mouth was soaked through with her own saliva and tears by this point and served to keep her from voicing her opinions to the men but they could see in her eyes and the way she was emptily staring at her mother that she would not be the same after this experience. Shino was nervous for possibly the first time in his life. This type of action was far different than one of his clan would normally pursue, but the time called for it. While his family were skeptical of his actions they had at least let him follow his own path on the matter. He could tell that they were at least a little curious as to the outcome. His father had given him a strict set of rules to abide to, and a few lessons in his own way. Lessons that Shino guessed would not work to his benefit in his current predicament. Nonetheless, he was grateful for the attempt as he certainly had no experience in such matters. His mother on the other hand was oddly protective. She simply stated that such actions would, 
corrupt the hive. Thankfully she didn't have the final say in the matter, though if his actions took him too far she would get a partial vote in the future. After all his actions could very well shake the very foundations of the antisocial clan. Few others in his family gave him support, but he hadn't expected it. Others gave him inquisitive glances as he had left the compound on his way to his destination. He seemed to blend into the crowd as he made his way across to the civilian sector of the village in order to begin this self-imposed mission of his. Even in his limited emotional capacity he still managed to have thoughts stinging through his head. If this goes badly, will there be a way to rectify my mistakes? Will the parental units be accepting, or will they turn me away? Will my carefully laid out plans complete without error? As he got closer to his first goal, he felt an odd sensation in his hands. Rubbing his fingers into his palms he found them to be slightly damp with perspiration. Intriguing. Rounding a corner, her was now on the path that would lead him to the building he was looking for. His steps became even more measured as his destination came into view. He felt like time was slowing and the path was getting longer ahead of him instead of growing shorter as he got closer. A feeling of apprehension washed over him making his eyebrows raise in contemplation of this new sensation. It was most vexing, but before he had time to ponder it he found himself standing in front of a door. Calming himself he brought his hand up to the wooden panel and knocked. His heartbeat pounded in his ears as he heard footsteps getting closer on the other side of the portal and he readied himself for the inevitable confrontation. The door opened and a rough-looking girl appeared in the crack that formed. Yeah. Quote dot dot dot. Abarame Shino. The girl thought for a minute before realizing he was saying his name. Oh. Just wait here and I'll go get her. The girl slammed the door shut and he heard the footsteps getting farther away. Apprehension began to build again and after a few more minutes he heard more footsteps coming his way. The door opened again and this time his apprehension only increased at the sight before him. Harum. Shino-kun. I'm so happy you're here. Bye Arika. I'll be back before 11. The slightly muffled voice of the now named Arika called back to them. Don't rush for my sake. Harum blushed a bit at the implication. Don't mind my roomie. She's just jealous because she doesn't have a date. She yelled the last part back over her shoulder, getting an indignant, rump, in return. Giggling slightly she closed the door and wrapped her arm around Shino's. So, what do you have in mind Shino-kun? I believe an appropriate first date is dinner and perhaps a walk in the park. He may not be the most suave bachelor in Konoha, but that didn't mean he couldn't take some lessons from one of the more successful of the male populace. After all, the blonde was able to keep multiple ladies happy with his actions, so he must be doing something right. That sounds lovely. Let's hurry. I'm starved. Neji decided to pick up Tenton on his way to the hospital to visit their injured teammate. It had been slightly aggravating at first to search for her, but he finally found her walking out of the Namikaze estate. She seemed to be spending an awful lot of time around the place lately and the thought of her hanging out with that particular group made him rather uncomfortable. Tenton, would you like to go see how Lee is doing with me? Despite his stoic demeanor, Tenton couldn't help but smile slightly at his thoughts of visiting his rival. Sure Neji. I'll see you around Kin, Eno. Tell Haku and Hanada I said bye please. With acknowledging nods from the other two, she headed off across the town with Neji. Tenton, what is your relationship with the people in that estate? His question caught her a little off guard, but she answered with a smile. They're my friends. We've been hanging out a lot lately and it's been really fun. So I've noticed. His cold tone made her flinch a little, but he stayed silent for the rest of the journey. Once they arrived at the hospital and checked in, they made their way to Lee's room to find him doing one-handed, one-footed push-ups on the floor. His training gave him a reward of Tenton punching him back into his bed, yelling at him the entire time. Lee, you know you're not supposed to be pushing yourself. What would you do if you ended up doing more damage huh? The once eccentric Jenin looked at his own lap and mumbled an apology back. Sorry, I just got bored. If I don't do anything all day it gets to be too much. Besides, I'm just here for some more checkups. They'll be releasing me again later this afternoon. Still, thank you both for coming once again. Both of his guests looked rather uncomfortable. 
Li had said everything with such a downtrodden voice that it was difficult to believe it was really him. That and the fact that he hadn't said anything about youth since they came in was unsettling. Shaking off the tense atmosphere, Tenton tried to smile. D don't worry about it Li. Besides, Naruto-kun probably already found Tsunade by now and is bringing her back as we speak. She smiled a little more genuinely as the spark of hope in Li's eyes got a little brighter. Hi. You're right Tenton chan I mustn't let myself get so down when there are still those who are fighting for me. If Naruto were to find out that I've let my youth flicker he would be most disappointed. We'll see what happens if he can manage to bring her back. The scowl Tenton gave Neji after that statement could have melted most men. Unlike you I do not base my hopes in fabrications of hopes or chance. Tsunade-sama could be anywhere and if they find her I've heard she has had a bad past in Konoha and wishes to stay away from its walls. Fate seems to wish to keep her away from our company. Lee once again found his lap interesting and Tenten was forced once again to bring him back from despair. And yet Naruto-kun has defied fate already many times, or should I go over your defeat at his hands Neji? Then there was that monster that he defeated, and he helped the Hokage. He's gone a lot farther than most of us could dream of going at our age. Yet the populace continues to look down on him. Have you ever wondered why that may be? Hiyashi-sama has told me that he was tainted at birth and that is why he will do everything in his power to bring Hinata back under Hyuga control. No matter what. Then he will have quite the fight on his hands. Naruto-kun won't let him take her away, and she won't come back of her own free will. She likes life away from that drab place too much to even entertain the thought. Maybe if you got out once in a while you would be able to enjoy some life too. I will take my stable life over one that brings unnecessary harm to those in my care, but thank you for your concern. The sarcasm nearly rolled off Neji's tongue as he sneered at the female member of his team. Please, you are both showing very unyouthful temperaments. If we are to be a team, you both need to get along much better. Tenten, you mustn't lash out and antagonize Neji further. Neji, how Tenten wishes to spend her time when not training with us or on missions is not our concern unless it will be detrimental to the team. Her having friends will only strengthen her bond with the village and allow her youthful nature to shine even brighter. Perhaps you should seek out some of these friends as well and join them. That will not be happening Lee. Even if I had wanted to spend time with any of them, with Hinata there I am forbidden to be near unless one of the main branch is with me. His spiteful tone was not lost on the occupants of the room. Just don't hate them for it Neji. They aren't bad people at all. It matters not. They are enemies of the Hyuga and as such I will have nothing to do with them. The room seemed to freeze as Tenten's eyes narrowed and Lee's widened. Enemies of the Hyuga. Just because your family screwed up on enslaving another one of their own doesn't make that person an enemy, neither does socializing with that person. If that were the case then I would be your enemy too wouldn't I? Am I your enemy Neji? She took a step forward in challenge. If you continue this despicable action of parading around with those who are less than filth then yes, you will be considered an enemy of the Hyuga. Neji didn't even flinch as he replied. Tell me Hyuga. Are you maybe just jealous that Hinata found a way out and you're stuck with your seal? It was a low blow and everyone there knew it when Neji activated his Byakugan. He grit his teeth and took a step forward just as the door to the room opened. Good morning my youthful student. Oh, Neji and Tenten are here too. Did you come to fan Lee Kun's flames of youth as well? His answer was a sniff from Neji as the boy left the room, not even bothering to acknowledge his sensei. It appears as though Neji's youth is in turmoil. I will have to talk to him about it later and rekindle his fires once more. Tenten just shook her head in sorrow. She really didn't mean to hurt her teammate like that, but he had brought it on himself with his arrogant attitude. Someday Neji, you'll see that there is more to life than servitude. Shikamaru looked towards the sky and sighed. Even though Naruto wasn't there and the village seemed so calm, he was still troubled by all the recent events that had happened. He wasn't blind all his life and he knew some of what Naruto had been through, but what he couldn't figure out was why. Why did Naruto get beaten as a kid? Why did people hate him? Why did they constantly scowl and whisper when he was doing nothing but walking down the street? Why did he accept such treatment? Why? 
The questions had been flowing through his head ever since he'd heard about Naruto's house being broken into. Thinking back on that event only brought more questions. Why did Sakura openly steal from Naruto? Why did Sasuke want his things so badly? Naruto easily beat Sasuke. Dot how strong is he? Again though he was met with the silence of the field along with the munching of chips. Yes, Choji was here with him after finishing with his own family's training. This was a pattern, something normal in all the recent chaos. Choji, what do you think is up with Naruto? The plump kid sat there munching away for a minute before grinning. Dunno. He's getting training from one of the Sanin while searching for another though, so he must be having a great time. Shikamaru sighed. That's not what I meant. I mean about why this village seems to loathe his very existence. Dunno Shika. I can only remember my dad telling me to be wary of him when I was little a couple times, but after he saw us playing together in the park he didn't seem to care anymore. Of course I didn't see him often back then. That's my point. Why would we even need to be told to watch out for him, even when he was that young? It doesn't make sense. Well maybe he had bad parents. I mean someone had to have known who they were at some point. Maybe they were traitors or something. Choji pondered as he opened up a new bag of chips. The lazy one began to ponder his friend's words, letting them mix in with what he already knew of the blonde. He had to stifle a sardonic laugh at the other boy's thoughts on the parentage pf his friend. Well I know his parents weren't traitors. Anyone with eyes should be able to see the resemblance. I mean really. Blue eyes, blonde hair, face shape and he's an orphan. It's obvious they're covering up his background, but why? Sure he would have enemies in Iowa without doing a thing, but there should have at least been a few trusted shinobi that could have known and protected him. It's as if his birthing was a curse. His eyes suddenly went wide as he thought back a little more. He thought back to what the villagers called him. Demon, monster, fiend, murderer. What they were yelling the first time he'd seen one of his beatings. We'll finish the job for the Yandaimi. Death to all demons. You killed my husband you bastard, die. All the evidence seemed to be right there. Even his birthday. October the 10th, the same day as. Shikamaru suddenly bolted upright, startling his companion slightly. Shikamaru. Sorry Choji. I just realized I have something to do. I'll see you tomorrow maybe. Do you need any help? Nah. It's just some information gathering. I'll be fine on my own. The determination in his friend's eyes surprised Choji enough, but the fact that he wouldn't accept any help was downright scary. Um. If you don't mind I'll tag along anyway. You never know when you might need a hand, right? Shikamaru stopped and seemed to ponder the question for a moment. On one hand it could help to have an extra set of eyes, but on the other could he really trust Choji to keep quiet with such information. Then he gave a small smile. This was Choji, the boy wouldn't try to hurt anyone without a good reason and he would need a very good reason to let this secret out. Sure, but just so you know, what we may find out could change our lives completely along with how we see this village. The Akamichi gulped audibly, but nodded and followed as they made their way back towards the village. He could only speculate as to what could get the Nara into such a mood as to actually want to do something other than watching the clouds roll by. Kakashi stood in the middle of training ground 3, looking at his new, team. It was rather obvious that the first thing they were going to work on was teamwork as both Haku and Kin stood glaring at Kiba. He had to let out a sigh. It was almost the exact opposite of his previous team setup. Here the two girls were protecting each other while the only male ogled them and tried to strut his stuff. A feat that was obviously not working, but at least it seemed a lot more subdued than what he was trying in his first encounters with Haku. Ahem. Welcome to Team 7 Haku, Kin. We'll be working together from now on, so try to get along. He sweat dropped at the glare he was given by the two girls. They really did not want to be a part of this team. Sensei I propose a name change for the team. Haku announced. I for one would rather not be part of the team that's openly despised Naruto for no reason at all. I second that motion. Kin followed with a smirk. Hey. You can't just change the team name. It was given to us when we graduated by the Hokage. While he didn't like the name associated with his former teammates either, it was the name that officially made him a ninja. Yeah well neither of us graduated from your academy 
so we never accepted your team name. Besides who would want to only be known as a number? Kin argued back. Ma. Ma you three. If we want to change our team name later we can. It's just a bit of paperwork, but we'll all have to agree on what we're called. For now we are going to train and do some missions around the village. Kiba flinched slightly. Ah. Uh, you mean D ranks. We were in the Chunin exams and you're going to make us do D ranks. Yes, Kiba. D ranks. We've just been through an invasion if you hadn't noticed and there is a lot of residual damage to be fixed. All Genin teams are helping with the reconstruction in order to get us back in shape. Chunin are helping with the defensive structures and Jonin are patrolling the forests in case someone else decides they want to try to take another shot at us while we're supposedly weakened. He managed to shut the boy up, but Kiba was noticeably fidgeting. Akamaru was busy growling and barking at him though, causing Kiba to flinch more. At least the pup seems to be able to handle his master a little better. Well then should we start with training or a mission? Kin inquired. I say a mission so we can see where we're at. A good plan Haku. We'll start with a mission and go from there. I'm warning you now though, I won't tolerate you three messing around. Like Kiba said, you were all in the Chunin exams so I expect you to act like it. Kakashi gave them all a stern eye, though it hovered a bit more on Kiba. Despite his fading bruises, the Inazuka was still somewhat brash. At least he hasn't tried to force himself on anyone lately. That last week of personal treatment from Sum and Hana must have sobered him up a bit. Clearing his throat to gain their attention again, he held out a scroll. Since I knew we would be doing a mission at some point today, I went ahead and picked out one that should suit our needs. We'll be catching Tora. Quote dot 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 quote. Quote dot 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 quote. Quote dot dot dot. I really should have memorized that schedule. Haku mumbled. Eh, hey, nothing. It's pointless now. Let's just get this over with. At least with Mud Boy here we have a nose to lead us. Finally admitting you need me. Kiba smirked only to have his balloon popped at Haku's response. Not really. We could just take Akamaru and be just as well off. The boy slumped as his head ornament wagged his tail and the girls laughed. Fine, fine. Let's just get this over with. So began the first mission of the reconstructed Team 7. In a hidden bunker near Konoha, a lone figure sat behind his desk reading over various reports. Each page held descriptions of what various ninja were doing around the village and giving him an idea of what opposition he would be up against. All in all the results were, satisfying. As he was about to move on to a new scroll, a slight influx of chakra alerted him to a new presence in the room report. It seems the two were able to find Tsunade and are currently on their way back to the village. They should be arriving within the week provided they keep their current pace. The ninja said without a hint of emotion. Very well. We will begin our plans immediately. Alert the elders. I will need to speak with them if this is to go off without a hitch. Understood. I will have them meet with you as soon as possible. The ninja vanished, leaving the man to muse over his findings once more. My time is closing in, but it has to be perfect. If they suspect anything it will all be for naught. You may have been hailed as the god of Shinobi, Hiruzen, but even gods can fall. Soon enough Konoha will be in its rightful place in the world and people across the land with say my name in awe. Danzo. Allowing himself a rare smile, Danzo continued his work. Some of his plans were already in place, but he would need to go over all new information to make sure they wouldn't be put in any danger. After all, if one teenager was able to usurp the will of the council so easily then he would have to be twice, no, three times as cunning. That's it for this part if you enjoyed it then like, share and subscribe for the next video as it's going to be more interesting and also check out my other playlists hope you would like them too.